Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Good morning, Mr. Glover. Uh, Ms. Hogan Doran first. Sorry, just a short um, matter, mm -hmm. if I may, uh, Chair. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I was updating you on the production uh, status of uh, two notices to produce that have been directed to the Department of Premier and Cabinet in each of the State of Victoria and the State of New South Wales. Um, the response was due by 4 p.m. yesterday. I was in error uh, when I said 12. Um, uh, in any event, we received uh, correspondence from New South Wales just after five, um, indicating, apologising for not complying with the 4 p.m. reply time, uh, but indicating they were continuing to seek instructions about a response to the notice. The, we subsequently received correspondence, the Office of the Royal Commission received correspondence from the State of Victoria. Uh, amongst other matters, um, what is sought by the State of Victoria is that the notice be reissued uh, to the State of Victoria, not just to the Department of Premier and Cabinet, and that the notice be issued under the State Inquiries Act 2014 Victoria. The, each notice had been issued under the Commonwealth Act, uh, Commissioner. Uh, New South Wales has also subsequently written just after five yesterday, uh, and they have indicated um, that the state has concerns about producing the report to the Commission at this stage. Uh, one of the matters they have raised is a potential issue having regard to the principle recognised in Melbourne Corporation and the Commonwealth 1947-74 CLR 31. Um, as I said, the notice was issued under the Commonwealth Act. It's proposed that a further notice be issued, but under the New South Wales Royal Commissions Act. And we'll seek, um, we would propose that the each of those notices be made returnable at 1pm today and an indication being given that the Royal Commission would not publish uh, the reports without prior notice to either state. Uh, that's exactly what we will do. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We'll, we'll progress that in the course of this morning. Thank you. Mr Glover. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, today I appear with Ms Spees. Um, commissioners, as foreshadowed yesterday by Ms Hogan Doran, today we will commence inquiring into responsibility and accountability arrangements for strategic decision making with national consequences. Specifically, we will inquire into national coordination and decision making through the operation of the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee, or COSC, about which we have already heard some evidence. At the outset, I should mention this is a long day with many possible topics to explore. Try as we might, it has been difficult to ascertain just how COSC operates. The arrangements are, at least at present to those assisting you, are opaque. Um, this is not intended to be any criticism, but to set the scene for today's evidence as we hear from representatives of jurisdictions who sit on COSC itself. Just to give a little context, a brief excursus into the history of COSC and how we ended up where we are today is required. In this respect, I would like to particularly mention that the Commission has been assisted by AFAC, which the evidence indicates has been central to the establishment and ongoing functioning of COSC and the National Resource Sharing Centre, or NRSC, to which I will turn shortly. And I'd like to thank AFAC for their cooperation. Appreciate thank, that. Thank you, Chair. In May 2013, the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department attempted to establish a representative group of operational emergency services leaders at a national level. This proposal was rejected by ANZEMC. In December 2013, COSC was established by the AFAC board to provide jurisdictional consideration and representation on behalf of the AFAC council to the federal government. COSC was not designed to replace or represent the AFAC Council or the AFAC Board, but was designed to be a grouping of Chiefs of Uniform Fire and Emergency Services across Australia. It was hoped to be a suitable vehicle to engage with the Federal Government regarding operational issues. The Commission has received evidence as to the background from former 
commissioners who were themselves sometime members of COSC. For example, Mr Mullins, the former Commissioner of New South Wales Fire and Rescue, stated there was no senior officers group as there was in counter-terrorism or policing. So we decided we would have to have a group where senior people came together and we asked if EMA would co-chair that so that we could get some direct input for the federal level and it seemed to work quite well. Mr Gregson, the former Commissioner of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia, said that COSC was created predominantly so the Commissioners and Chief Officers would have a forum where they could share ideas. It was also so they could give each other situational reports on emerging issues in their state, emerging incidents in their state, in near real time. The following features of COSC are relevant to note. The membership of COSC is set out in its terms of reference. The COSC membership represents each Australian Commonwealth, State and Territory jurisdiction, New Zealand, land management agencies, SES agencies, Air Services Australia and AFAC. A representative of the Bureau of Meteorology is an observer and jurisdictions may have other observers attend or participate from time to time at their discretion. That is an issue we will explore today. Each jurisdiction, however, holds one vote, and one vote is held by each of SES, Land Management, and Air Services Australia. AFAC is a non-voting member. The SES representative is to be drawn from ACSES, the Australian Council of State Emergency Services. We will explore the issue of voting at COSC today. The Director General of Emergency Management Australia is the permanent co-chair and a standing member of COSC. The other co-chair is rotated between the jurisdictions. We will explore the involvement of EMA in COSC with today's witnesses and again tomorrow with Mr Cameron. Secretariat functions for COSC are provided by AFAC. COSC meets three times per year to develop, progress and oversee national fire and emergency services operational capability and capacity. During a significant incident, COSC may meet more frequently to share situational awareness and resource sharing requirements and implications. Commissioners, you will hear about the emergency meetings held by COSC during the 2019-2020 bushfire season shortly. The Australian Government's Crisis Coordination Centre, or Triple C, supports COSC by sending out meeting invitations and providing teleconference facilities. AFAC has stated to the Commission that Commissioners and Chief Officers do not sit on COSC as representatives of their governments, but as representatives of the organisations under their command. However, the language of the evidence to date has at times been less than clear as to this capacity. Another issue we will inquire into today is whether COSC has an operational role in the sense that it determines resource sharing or resource movements among jurisdictions. This is another issue that has, some, has been somewhat ambiguous in some of the evidence received by the Commission so far. Most recently, following Mr Cameron's evidence to the Royal Commission and following discussions between Mr Alice, the CEO of AFAC, Mr Cameron and Mr Baxter, the President of AFAC, they had concluded that placing COSC as a subcommittee of ANZEMC would provide greater confidence to the government. The proposed new structure was shown to be as follows. Operator, please show AFC.5 506.001.0544. Um, please blow up the bottom table, please, bottom chart. This is the proposed organisational structure, and you can see COSC is in the top column of organisations to the right. The top right hand red one. Thank you, right. Chair. I'm a forward air controller too. So, yeah. <laughs> um, this proposal um, was discussed at the COSC meeting held recently on the 17th of July 
2020, at which COSC members endorsed developing a narrative to support EMA discussions at the next ANZ-EMC meeting scheduled for 8 September. EMA was to work closely with AFAC and COSC to develop the, the COSC narrative and proposed course of action. I should now mention the National Resource Sharing Centre, or NRSC as it is known. One of the key functions of COSC is to provide direction to the AFAC National Resource Sharing Centre in relation to its function of facilitating the interstate and international sharing of resources by AFAC member agencies apart from cross-border operations. AFAC states that NRSC effectively operationalises the decision of COSC and is an enabler of national capability for fire and emergency services. NRSC was created in 2015. It was originally positioned within NAFC, but COSC resolved that it be repositioned within AFAC in 2017, directly supporting COSC. And if we return to the chart, you will see that under the proposed structure, NRSC sits under AFAC, but with a direct reporting line from COSC down to NRSC. NRSC remains, uh, apologies, NRSC maintains the arrangements for interstate assistance, or AIA. The AIA set out to draw together existing guidelines and documents and codify the basis on which fire and emergency services resources would be shared across Australia and New Zealand. The latest version of COSC, uh, the latest version of the AIA, apologies, was endorsed by COSC at its meeting on the 31st of October 2019. While the NRSC serviced fire services historically, the NRSC has become increasingly utilised for all hazards, including the exchange of SES staff and incident management team personnel. Commissioners, you will also hear from SES leaders from the jurisdictions in today's panels. Another consideration relevant to any discussion of NRSC and its role is its resourcing. A concern raised by AFAC and a number of states and territories is that NRSC's ongoing resourcing and funding needs. Presently, the NRSC has three permanent staff. In addition, member agencies second resource managers to the jurisdiction requesting assistance. One aspect of NRSC's operations we will explore tomorrow with Mr Baxter, the President of AFAC, is the NRSC Deployment Registry, which was launched in 2018 for international deployments and which is now proposed to be extended to interstate deployments. At its most recent meeting on the 17th of July 2020, COSC members endorsed the National Deployment Registry, including its strategic intent and core elements, subject to further development of the detail through consultation with AFAC members and noting the need for a funding source to be identified. AFAC's view is that the current model of the COSC meeting to make resource sharing decisions and the AFAC NRSC as an industry owned body implementing those decisions is the correct one and AFAC thinks that the AFAC NRSC should continue to be owned and given direction by the agencies who ultimately control the resources being shared. We will interrogate, in a non-pejorative sense, whether the current model is an effective one. We will inquire into COSC's operations as an existing mechanism of national situational awareness, coordination and decision making through the lens of last summer's bushfire season. In order to get an appreciation of the seasonal outlook for last summer, at its meeting on the 31st of October in Hobart, members of COSC received a situational outlook from Shane Fitzsimmons, who was at the time the Commissioner of New South Wales Rural Fire Service. We have that seasonal outlook as part of the recording of the COSC meeting that was made by the ABC. And I should mention this meeting was one of COSC's regular meetings and was not an emergency meeting called at short notice. Um, operator, please um, 
commence video one, which is a discussion of seasonal outlook. And I should mention when this is being played that what we have obtained by way of footage are the daily rushes and not edited footage <coughs> by the ABC. Debrief summary. Uh, Luke, uh, Mike's not here, but perhaps Luke and Shane. So, so perhaps I'll just start just by saying um, Mike's had to leave. The Queensland um, observations are here in the report. I think we just take them as given. Yep. We could discuss them um, if we want, but Shane's able to give a verbal report, so we can pass to him now. Okay, Shane. Thank you. Um, Simple presentation up on the um, so obviously <clears throat> what's been dominating us is really the lack of rainfall over over a long period of time and, and particularly over the last 18 months two years uh, but we can see um, across New South Wales and particularly up in northern New South Wales that we've got some of the lowest rainfalls on record uh, that have been dominating and I'm just playing, uh, running a few diagrams here to paint the picture. Uh, similarly with the temperatures, uh, we're seeing uh, the last last uh, period, the last year, uh, we've seen very much the highest on record above average temperatures, principally up around the northeastern areas of New South Wales, and also down in the southeast corner. Um, it's no surprise then that across New South Wales, 99% uh, of the state is still drought affected with some areas um, in intense drought and again you can see right across the northern um, areas of New South Wales there. You add that to the BKDI uh, anomalies or KBDI as I say these days, um, the moisture deficit in the landscape uh, is significant across broad geographic areas of the state. And it's, it should be no surprise then that that's where we tend to see uh, a fair bit of our uh, fire activity. And this is a this is a snapshot only of yesterday, I think it was, um, off our off our screenshot. But effectively, in the last in the last western side of the ranges, adjacent to the ranges, up across the ranges and out to the coast, uh, we've got a landscape. We've got we've got vegetation uh, that's particularly dry. <laughs> Uh, and the flammability levels uh, are at peak. So there's just no, there is no moisture left in the, in the vegetation and their, their fires are starting really easily and spreading very quickly. Um, pretty much most of New South Wales has come in very early for their bushfire danger period this year, uh, with many starting uh, officially back in <coughs> August. But even during June, July, August, our winter months in New South Wales, we've been getting more than a thousand fires a month. Uh, and so far for the reporting period this year, one July, you can see there we're, we're up over 5,000 fires. Um, and again, uh, over a thousand per month. Um, and we're not even into summer yet. Uh, August was particularly busy with new ignitions and October is certainly uh, again uh, busy and those, those numbers will go up because each time we see more dry lightning storms, we're just getting dozens of additional fires uh, out of those dry lightning storms. Interestingly, we've seen just on 500,000 hectares burnt um, as a result of these fires uh, so far to date. Uh, and we've had uh, over a dozen Section 44s across 16 local government areas. And the, and the duration of the activity, the intensity of the activity, with Section 44 declarations alone, uh, we've been running 50 odd consecutive days. Um, uh, and we're, as I say, we're pretty early into the season uh, already. Um, a number of these fires have got to emergency warning level, 23 of them, and 33 have reached the watch and act alert level. Uh, emergency alerts being used um, uh, in the populated areas uh, with messages and, and um, uh, text messages and voice messages being used accordingly. Aircraft and machinery, a uh, heavy plant, are uh, being used across across all the fire grounds, particularly given the, uh, the lack of water in a lot of these rural and regional areas. Um, the large air tanker, the one that we bought 
uh, New South Wales government procured. It arrived uh, in early July, uh, and within a couple of days of getting its CASA clearance, it really hasn't stopped working ever since. Mm -hmm. Along with all the, along with all the other aircraft that we've got, which, which. Um, with the lessons of the last season and working with government about the forecast for this season, um, talking about the availability of these sorts of assets between the northern and southern hemisphere, we actually got we actually got very good support from the New South Wales government to buy and invest in our own dedicated machine. So it was here year round for the early starts and the and the late finishes, not competing with with our northern hemisphere counterparts. Having said that, we also we also brought on board. Uh, earlier, an RJ um, large air tanker as well, uh, and it's been it's been just as busy. Um, if Mike was here, we would have we would have discussed reciprocating arrangements extensively during July, August, September, where we were doing lots of incidental and more substantial cross-border assistance with one another, whether it was men and women on the ground, whether it was trucks, whether it was aircraft, uh, whether it was IMTs, it didn't matter. There's been a lot of that going on for quite a while um, because of the obvious geographic location and connectedness to, to some of these fires and some of the risks. Um, across New South Wales, we've been moving uh, strike teams around um, uh, a fair bit over the last couple of months already. Uh, the firefighters that have been attached to, to those strike teams um, supporting northern New South Wales uh, has resulted in, you can see there, just four and a half thousand people out of other areas on strike teams and another thousand in IMTs just being moved around from different parts of the state and from the, from the four fire agencies in New South Wales. Um, um, and then obviously with that sort of with that sort of sustained effort, we started looking interstate, uh, and we've been very appreciative of the support we've been getting interstate. These figures don't capture um, uh, Queensland, and particularly ACT. David has been doing uh, incidental. Um, just cross-border stuff in that same intervening period, particularly with IMT, remote area firefighters and those other normal arrangements that we have. And those numbers predating the, the institution of the NRSC are not captured in this data. This is largely NRSC uh, figures um, um, to date. And uh, New Zealand liaison uh, has arrived this week uh, and is in our state centre. And we haven't we haven't actually asked for assistance from New Zealand at this stage, but the whole benefit of having a liaison officer there is to look at what's coming, what might be needed, and in concert with the NRSC, uh, what what um, the views of the other jurisdictions and agencies are. And what I would say that's different this year compared to what we've done historically um, is that it's not unusual for us in New South Wales to get the support of interstate assistance, but and typically that's been anywhere from a thousand to 2,000 people uh, at a time, uh, but it's usually for a short burst, it's usually for a week, seven to ten days, generally no more than, no more than a fortnight um, to deal with a particular um, onset of a weather pattern or, or, or a particular elevated risk as a result of activity and, and that weather. Uh, this, is, this is more gradual and more sustained. It's, 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 it's akin to, it's not a sprint, it's more of a marathon. Um, and I suppose for us, the example was was Tasmania last year, where I think Tasmania, uh, we supplied a sustained effort to Tasmania over about a three month period. It goes down for us in New South Wales uh, as the most protracted uh, interstate assistance deployment we've ever, we've ever sponsored in terms of providing resources. And depending on, depending on how this season shapes, uh, I suspect uh, we're looking at uh, some ongoing level of support potentially um, in cross-border assistance. And, and obviously, as the risks and issues prevail, um, uh, we will draw more and more on our own people, but we're just mindful that given, given the circumstances and the forecast, if there are other jurisdictions relatively quiet at the moment, then why not access that? Because already a lot of our people are moving um, into Region North particularly, spending a week at a time going up there to assist. And because of the drought, um, so many of our volunteers are, are rural and regional um, people living in rural and regional areas 
trying to run farms, trying to run business, trying to run families, all those sorts of things. And with so many of them hand feeding and hand watering stock and 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 um, doing it really tough, their ability to spend a lot of time away uh, is pressured this 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 year, particularly with the drought. Um, and the other thing, catching up with a lot of them, is that they know the season is only going to move into their geographic area uh, over coming weeks and months, which means they're going to be particularly busy day after day after day um, um, uh, in, in due course. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it doesn't matter where the interstate assistance um, uh, is. Uh, we've seen everything from uh, troops in the field, on trucks, into IMTs, uh, and working out of our state operations centre, uh, and every bit of it is very much appreciative. And um, I've not, I've bumped into quite a few of the teams and a few of the individuals, uh, and I'm not sensing any any negative repercussions. Um, I think the expectation we are really trying to set it across these fire grounds. You've got everything from really intense, really difficult. Um, uh, fire behaviour and fire suppression activities right through to um, a patrol mop-up uh, on standby and anticipation and those sorts of things. So as long as we keep setting uh, the expectation about what the deployments might entail and a very broad range of, of, of deployment roles, um, then that's, that's the most important thing we can do uh, for teams coming so that when they get there they've got a sense of, of, of what might be expected of them. Um, to give you an idea, this is just a picture of our region north area uh, with some of the fires so far this season. And what's important about this is um, there's over 400,000 hectares, so of the, of the 500,000 hectares that has burned across New South Wales, the vast majority of that is in northeastern New South Wales. And with, with over 400,000 hectares burning in New South Wales already, um, region north in a busy fire season, the entire season um, might get to 200,000 hectares. So we're already double what would be a typically busy season for region north alone, and we've still got a whole lot of this season to come, uh, and indeed, um, traditionally, uh, the worst of the season is still ahead of us. There's some of the larger fires that we've got burning. Um, and, and as you can see, the top one up there, Long Gully and Busby's Flat, uh, that, um, that fire uh, has actually joined together effectively. So it's, it's again up over 100,000 hectares. You're talking about some pretty, pretty mountainous terrain. You're talking about some pretty um, difficult to access terrain. So the, the fire perimeters on these, some of these fires are up over 1,000 kilometres. So to navigate them, to get around them, to deploy resources is proving to be pretty challenging. Um, not to mention the, not to mention the moisture deficit and fire behaviour. Bringing these things under control is proving to be extremely difficult. Um, there has been um, considerable losses already, and even though, even though it's not a, even though it's not a single fire event that's resulted in a, a, a massive uh, loss of infrastructure in a community. If if you go back to like 2013 in New South Wales, where across the Blue Mountains region in one afternoon we lost two, over 200 homes in one event, um, in in one in one local government jurisdiction, uh, these these fires are spread across. Um, lots of rural, um, uh, remote or, or isolated properties through to small villages, uh, through to regional town centres. And already this season, just in those burnt out areas, uh, we've seen more than 100 homes destroyed. Um, having said that, and we don't talk about it enough, the firefighting effort in that same burn scar, uh, there's been over 1,400 homes saved and untouched. And yes, there's been some damaged and, and sadly, a number destroyed, um, and it's cold comfort to those that have lost um, um, homes and other property, but the reality is it could have been a whole lot worse in that burnt out area uh, without the firefighting um, intervention uh, and all that goes with that. Um, uh, we've also seen a number of facilities and outbuildings, and when we're talking about facilities, uh, that's everything from um, um, uh, halls, um, um, uh, timber mills, so, so some pretty significant socio-economic drivers uh, in local areas, and um, agricultural infrastructure, um, over a thousand head of livestock, lots of thousands of kilometres of fencing, etc, etc. Water is the big issue, and we're loading these machines 
out of the worst water affected areas. Um, we're loading the large air tankers out of the Richmond RAF base under our ongoing relationship there or up at places like Coffs Harbour where we are doing smaller um, air bases. We're actually working with local authorities to sink bores and get dedicated water supplies without compromising drinking water and other things. We've got replenishment arrangements in place for, uh, for dams and other things. So dry firefighting, lots of machinery, um, limited use of water is a focus in some of these drought affected areas. Um, replenishing water where we need to. Um, um, again, getting drinking water and stock water back into some areas. Dedicated bores. We've got special permits in place for the destruction of livestock, which negates the normal 24 hour notification periods. Uh, and we've got ongoing liaison with key stakeholders about drought conditions and firefighting operations. Um, unfortunately, the outlook over the, over the next three months is, is no good news. The Bureau were talking to us about potential for February for any meaningful rain. So over the next three, uh, over the next three months, it's pretty difficult. Temperatures are above normal. There's a glimmer of hope over this next seven to eight days um, with some rainfalls extending down through New South Wales. Um, that's the next four days. Uh, that's the subsequent four days. So over the next week, we're hopeful to get this across the fire grounds, lucky to be an inch, but at least it'll be something, which is not what we have. We have not had that uh, for the last couple of months. Um, we have had some serious injuries to civilians uh, and, and burn injuries and other injuries and then being treated in hospital. We've also seen the two fatalities and sadly one of our firefighters uh, remains in Brisbane, um, uh, Royal Brisbane Hospital with serious burns to, to his parts of his body um, but he's, he's doing remarkably well considering uh, and he's back into a general ward with, with, a, with a fair bit of movement and dexterity to, to hands and, and what have you. So uh, my message is thank you uh, and thank you in anticipation for what uh, we might be receiving over the coming weeks and months. Uh, I think um, you know we'd, we'd all wish your injured firefighter well uh, as he continues his recovery. Uh, any questions from Shane uh, on any uh, on any of that that update? Uh, some of the um, Met Bureau uh, presentation on the next agenda item will cover cover the, the longer national term outlook. But any questions to Shane, Chris? <laughs> So I'll just show you that feedback from uh, the people that we've sent up there. They felt uh, really well supported. The briefings have been exceptional. The safety mitigation work has been first class. And yeah, just the general feedback, uh, they're feeling that they've, they've been very, they've been welcomed and they feel safe at work and uh, all looking forward to, to helping. And, you know, we'll support you as long as we can. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, what date was that meeting, please? The 31st of October, 2019. 31st of October, thank you. Um, so, of course, Commissioners, um, what transpired over the course of last summer was tens of thousands of bushfires. Commission staff have prepared a timeline of fires across Australia, uh, along with the various jurisdictions' declarations of states of emergency. The timeline appears across two pages. Uh, operator, please show RCN.900.095.0002. This page of the timeline covers the period from July 2019 to November 2019 and what we see um, in the top part of the um, timeline is the period that Commissioner Fitzsimmons was talking about the fires in um, northern New South Wales and in particular in the middle column we see on 5 September 2019 the Long Gully Road fire. Uh, which Commissioner Fitzsimmons mentioned. If, uh, operator, you scroll down to the bottom half of that page, you will see there in orange uh, the first two declarations of state emergencies, the first by Queensland, closely followed by New South Wales after that. And we can see that. And I'd better clarify why I asked the question of the, the meeting. We'd, we'd had previous evidence about 1920 just looking like 1819 in the in the briefs and the and the like, but clearly by 31 October that was not the case in the, the meeting. So as we go through this timeline, we'll keep that in mind as this builds. 
Again, uh, for the coordination and decision-making process. Uh, yes, indeed, Chair. Um, what this shows is by this stage, indeed, it sort of what has traditionally been the commencement of a fire season um, for the southern states, the southeastern states, there were already a significant fires burning across at least northern New South Wales, as well as the top of Australia. Um, I should just mention the timeline has been developed from evidence provided to the Commission. A list of sources has been provided. Media sources, which are not included on the list, were used to confirm ignition dates and impacted regions. Um, as there were too many fire events to record on two pages, indeed over 11,000 in New South Wales alone, not every fire has been included. The fires were selected for the timeline based on the list of emergency warnings provided to the Royal Commission by EMA. Um, also, common names for the fires have been used, including uh, Woodgate, Kangaroo Island and Bega Valley. Other fires um, uh, or threatened towns and villages have been provided as separate boxes. Every fire that resulted in a fatality has been included in the timetable. Uh, where possible, the date of ignition has been used, so a fire may appear on the timeline before it threatened life or property. This timeline does not include um, the dates when the fires were extinguished or brought under control. Uh, every event, uh, sorry, apologies, every effort has been taken to ensure the timeline is accurate and representative of how the fire events in the 2019-20 bushfire season unfolded. Uh, operator, just for completeness, can you please show the next page, which is the timeline for the period December 2019 to February 2020. We see on this page some of the fires the Commission has heard about already. Uh, if, uh, operator, you... Um, blow up the top of the page, you'll see there on 9 December 2019, the East Gippsland fires. And we see there a reference um, in the towns threatened, uh, references to Malakuta. If we move down a little bit, scroll down, operator, to the uh, box that is cut off on the page, the 20th of December, we see there Kangaroo Island, Cudley Creek, uh, in South Australia, and we see the overlapping nature of the fires. So on that day, by uh, reference to the date of ignition, we see fires igniting in South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. And operator, if you just scroll down a little further, on the 31st of December, we see there the fires that threatened the New South Wales south coast, including at Lake Conjola. Um, of course, thro throughout this period, COSC, along with state and territory emergency management bodies, met several times regarding resource sharing. And what I propose to do now is to play a second video from the COSC meeting on the 31st of October 2019, which is a portion of the COSC meeting at which resource sharing is discussed. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Stuart. So the substantive issue that this paper raises is to define the difference between what that NRSC deployment manager is supposed to be doing and what the receiving jurisdiction is supposed to be doing. And the reason it's brought to COSC in this form is that over the last three years there has been um, some blurring of those lines and there have, as a result on occasion, been mismatched expectations between what that NRSC deployment manager thinks they are deploying to do and what they are subsequently asked to do when they get to the receiving jurisdiction. So having analysed some of those um, lessons from previous deployments, the two papers that are attached to um, this agenda item seek to discriminate or differentiate between the NRSC deployment manager's national role in coordinating and the receiving jurisdiction's interstate liaison unit in managing the deployment, managing the inbound deployment once it gets to that receiving jurisdiction. 
jurisdiction. Uh, and a number of you around the table will have experienced um, an NRSC deployment manager arriving in our jurisdiction, finding that some of these items aren't being covered off on and effectively taking it upon themselves to try to manage that on behalf of the receiving jurisdiction as well. I think what we would um, proposed to COSC is that we should be clear that the NRSC deployment manager deploys to do the national stuff. It is part of their role to ensure that the receiving jurisdiction is doing the interstate liaison stuff and that's stuff like reception and departure, it's stuff like making sure when resources arrive they've actually got somewhere to go and they're actually going to be fed and they actually get a briefing that gives them some direction and meaning to what they're actually doing um, within the jurisdiction but those are, I would say, just quintessentially matters for the receiving jurisdiction, they're not matters for the National Resource Sharing Centre Manager. So the, the, the papers attached in effect draw that distinction and will give a clearer steer, I suppose, for those jurisdictions who are less used to receiving interstate resources, um, that these are the things you just need to make sure you've got in place. And if they're not in place and that receiving jurisdiction can't resource them because they don't have trained staff who are able to do that, then a request can be made to deploy an interstate liaison unit. That can be done, uh, but it just shouldn't be an expectation that the National Resource Sharing Centre manager is suddenly going to start doing all of those things as well. So, clarification of roles and responsibilities. Uh, any comments from around the room? Looks forward to it. Sounds like a, a consensus there. So, um, just uh, confirming the cost. Do you, do you, when you're deploying the manager, do you actually send them like their role sheet? So they, they, they've got it at the time, so it's a refresher for them when they get there. Yep. Perfect. The cost endorses the uh, role description and the functions of the IOU paper. Yep. Thank you. So next up, uh, we're dealing with NRC preparedness, um, strategic directions, and uh, I think we're handing over to Luke and Stuart. Thanks, Chair. So, with this issue here, um, I mean, the, the NRC was originally established for those international deployments. It's now adopted a domestic coordination role. COSC hasn't formally endorsed that, so we. We're putting it to cost just so um, uh, it's clear that that's what the expectation is and um, with what you're wanting us to do. Um, so that's the first recommendation there. The second one is the NRC registry, which we put in place for those international deployments. Victoria is already using it for domestic deployments, which is fine, but again, we, we uh, and you know, that, that's a facility there available. We just want, again, to get cross um, endorsement for that. And finally, what's evolved is this resource managers group, which is um, a group that Luke's coordinated in your agencies, so that once we've had the emergency cost meeting, it's been agreed that we will support a particular event or jurisdiction that ongoing activity can be done by this resource managers group and it doesn't require the Chiefs to come back together and endorse every ongoing deployment. It's just a practical um, continuation. So, clarification, I've got a question. So, so, we're proposing to continue using emergency teleconference of the COSC for those initial resource uh, requirement expressions, Great. and then with this paper, formally commit to using that group to do the doings, uh, and then and then kick all that off. So giving effect to what has evolved, giving full effect to what has evolved Great. in practice. Uh, fine from uh, well, I, I, I'm a co-chair of that, those emergency costs. Uh, fine by my perspective. Um, if we if if those. Um, if we're going to formalise the use of that group, uh, I, I would like EMA to be part of that, which, which it hasn't been to date because it's evolved from the operational agencies or your your your, your shops, uh, and I would like to be part of that. Public resource managers group. Yes. Yes. Sure, well, I just also note that not 
all council members are represented on that group currently because it has been an informal arrangement. So, just well, well uh, I would like my membership to be part of that. <laughs> but it, I think informalising it, it's really just providing a second tier from yourselves who can get on you know, with the day-to-day -day negotiations and adjustments. <laughs> well, I certainly don't want to be having a teleconference with, with principals to kind of on day five to figure out, you know, what's the next what's the next strike team to be deployed from New South Wales to South Australia. Yep. The in principle stuff at the start and then set a set a set a chain in motion. If we need to come back to the principles, it's about major shifts in in, in strategy and, and, and availability of resources between jurisdictions. That's when I think we should reconvene at that at, at this level. There is, there is one implication of that, and the NRC is conducting training for deployment managers shortly. What we are proposing here is that thereafter we would roster those people over the summer. And now, that if, there's no, if there's nothing happening, then they'll just remain in your agency. But if an event occurs and we need that NRC deployment manager to, to deploy, we'll, we will have already rostered and we're proposing two from two different jurisdictions so that um, we've got a degree of depth in that roster. Um, that's just one of the implications of the NRC undertaking this domestic deployment coordination. So we'll be asking for the people that come to this training to go on to uh, a, a roster. It would probably be not more than once a month, it's more likely once every eight weeks. Again, implications? Oh, yes, yes, it yes. would be. And I'm not prepared probably to talk to you on that. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So, in, in, sorry, in principle, yes, that's yeah, yeah. I definitely agree that we need that. that it's a notional roster. It, yes, that's, that's if people are unavailable, they're unavailable. <laughs> Not, it's not um, initiating any special condition other than a comfort level at, at our level that says we've got people notionally rostered with an availability throughout the season who will be the initial lead should should we activate something during this period. And between themselves, if, if their work or their personal circumstances change on that notional roster then they can swap around it's, it's not it's not triggering any entitlement it's not triggering any it's just to give us some comfort that we've got yeah. a coverage so, so, so i agree in principle and maybe the way around this is to say even within victoria when our roster will commit to uh, fulfilling the roster yeah. and we, we know within our agencies who can actually do a jurisdictional level that would that would be very helpful yeah. Yeah. What, what we're trying to avoid is the current arrangement where Luke goes out to individual jurisdictions and says, can you cover the next week? And if we can, at a jurisdictional level, put that in advance, and that would be really helpful. And Stuart, what's the size of the pool that you're envisaging through this train? Currently it's about 25, 25 people. Yeah. And perhaps of a, a, a pragmatic um, nature, are there any implications around the registry of expanding its functions in terms of cost and licensing that will flow back to agencies? Yeah, there would, there would be. Uh, so this is this is why we've, we've put it on the table for on this paper. Because um, currently the, the registry is not endorsed by COSC for use for interstate deployments. It's currently it's designed for use for international, but but it has been trialed trialed in Victoria for and it is supporting the um, you know building teams for interstate teams in, in Victoria. So and you know for for the most part it's working well. It does have its does have its bugs, and then we need to you know we need need to manage that but um, you know going forward if if there is that increased use for interstate interstate deployments on the registry it's going to need 24 7 you know reliability it's going to need um, uh, all agencies going to have access to approve their own people so there's a range of implications and then we have to look look at before we go down that down that road um, but but we probably need to put a more formal proposal Stuart on for the use of the registry for interstate to COSC. So it, we can have any formal use as we're doing now, but we'll come back and formalise this in principle approach. I, 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 I think there's more. I think there's more work that needs to be done between 
some operational and technical people about the scoping uh, and functioning uh, of of the product, and providing we're comfortable that the that the flows and the and the performance are going to be adequate, then moving it into being a tool to use, um, but a tool to use because it's not all, it's not all pre-populated with all available resource for domestic deployment. So we need to be. It might be a tracking tool or it might be a tool once we activate things, but it ought not to be, in the initial stages at least, over the coming years, a tool where we assume what might be available. So we've still got to do some work there to determine what might be available for assistance. So perhaps we're providing in principle support for the use of the NRC registry for interstate deployments, and we'll come back with a more formal um, paper on that. And, and whatever that subgroup is, Paul, and. Um, there might be a body of people, some technical people and some operational people about, about what needs to be um, accommodated uh, in, the, in the tool if we're going to use it for domestic purposes as opposed to the, the more simple interstate, uh, international deployments. And I think that will flow into the more detailed proposal around any requirements for the Correct. application. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Colleagues, I'll just confirm the, uh, the resolution that the uh, cost um, confirms NRC's role in the uh, interstate resource sharing, noting the ongoing workforce planning requirements, which will be coordinated at jurisdictional level. Um, endorse in principle the use of the registry for interstate deployment. Interstate deployments, noting there will be a more detailed proposal to come back in relation to resource implications with regard to that database, and endorse the use of the uh, interstate using the resource managers group. Outstanding. So move to item uh, 4.4, and uh, a number of you and all your senior staff would have been involved. Uh, late last month, or no, earlier this month, in a uh, jurisdictional teleconference regarding resource prioritisation. This issue has been considered at the cost before. Uh, and again, uh, probably hand over to... Do you want to this one? Paul. Paul. Paul first, maybe? Thank you, Chair. And this uh, does, uh, as you say, arise from the discussion at the last cost meeting about the principles we use and the mechanisms we use to prioritise competing resource demands if we start running short. And the paper, I hope, speaks for itself. And uh, as you said, Chair, there was a, a teleconference as recently as, as the end of last week on this, in which uh, jurisdictional representative discussed work that EMA is doing to arrive at those principles. Uh, one of the things that did come up in that um, telephone conversation was that the principles that we apply are of course important, but the mechanisms are going to be important as well because questions of how you allocate competing resource demands, the answers will vary depending on what stage you've got to, so it's important to be clear when responsibility for um, making those decisions uh, might default from from business as usual modes to more um, catastrophic modes. But uh, Rob, I wonder if you'd, if you'd like to expand on that a bit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. So look, we, we've spoken about uh, the lack of a framework for us collectively to make decisions or to advise our governments on decisions uh, to make uh, in the context of the genuinely catastrophic disasters when we have the scenario where, and I think I did this with my hands last time we spoke about this, where you know we have, we have um, uh, you know um, uh, capability here, and we have two otherwise equally meritoriously kind of competing requirements. H how we collectively make decisions to uh, to deploy that asset or to advise governments on. Uh, I, I say it again in the context of this, it's in the genuinely catastrophic. Our, our assessment, and I think this is probably borne out by our conversations with you all as well, is that that is most likely to arise in a series of, uh, and the language is in the paper here, um, uh, concurrent events that compound up to a genuinely national catastrophic um, uh, circumstance with capability deficits. Not just, you know, one big fire, one big flood, but sort of overlapping concurrent and compounding compounding circumstances. The paper goes through a, um, uh, uh, a discussion there of, of an assessment of 
our scan of all of the jurisdictional legislation looking at the principles and things that are either stated or implied around, around the country, there is a great degree of commonality of, as you would expect, of course, we all do, we all do very similar, we all do very similar things. Um, and and the, the, the principles that are in the paper are, are, are written in such a way to kind of imply that prioritisation, kind of make, work down that list. And you'll see, of course, that, for example, protection of life is, is right, at the, right at the top and then sort of cascades down to to lower level priorities. Uh, it's, not, it's not perfect, it's a work in progress. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say, the Chair, is that we are going to give an update on this uh, at MPEM um, in much the same terms uh, on the 20th uh, of next month. Uh, Rob, will that post deliberations, will they consider the use of uh, military army? Just will they group. consider the use? So, so, so this is capability agnostic. Yeah. So this isn't about uh, this isn't about the individual capability pieces. This is about the principles we will apply to assessing for any of those any of those things. And and that's why there's such a broad um, a broad uh, um, sort of theming right right across those principles. But then, if you look at, uh, if you look, I'm looking at page three of the paper that's attached to this. If you look at then the paragraph three, um, the principles in paragraph two, priority decisions will also take account of the following dimensions. The, the acronym there is Possessi. You can see it there in your paper. Political, security, economic, social, infrastructure, information, and environment. Those things that, that encompasses all of those decisions. So not not about individual yeah. bits of capability. Yeah, I, I don't have the paper. We don't, we don't have we don't any attached paper. paper. Yeah. You'd have a special paper. <laughs> must be classified. That must be your notes. It must be classified. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, having having sat on the teleconference, there was a strong sense that uh, finding that context around yeah. circumstances under which there would be prioritisation of resources and appealing to extant decision making infrastructure whether it's through the NCC or through you know, this forum for lower scale events. Ultimately I think there's a level of comfort from your jurisdictional reps um, in that teleconference there's going to be some more work done on oh, the paper. This is work in progress. Uh, yeah. so, th so this is very much an update. Chris, if, just let me finish Darren's point if, if that's all right. Um, this is not about saying, here's how we'll, we'll apply a defence asset or an, an international asset. It's with all of the assets or capabilities rather in mind, how we go through a process to put them in the right place. So all of those circumstances, all of the capabilities need to be considered. So, yeah, I was going to say, in my mind, the decision decision support tool that just helps the deliberations of this group to to make, you know, uh, which child are we going to feed? You know, as simple as that. We, we need to make some choices. We find ourselves within jurisdiction in those circumstances regularly, and, and it may trigger greater international uh, support required or other mechanisms if we find we can't resource uh, the, the immediate need. So that's the whole thing. It's a decision support tool for COSC. There's lots of examples of those already existing and I'm sure you're looking at those, particularly in the US, I've seen a few of those yep. uh, national decision support tools. So yeah, I'm really supportive of it. Yeah, that, 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 that's right. And, and it, it's a decision support tool for us here. But, I'm, but, but, I, but I preface my remarks before by saying that this is about the genuinely catastrophic. So we're not just dealing with which, yeah. and I'll strip this right down, it's not just which fire truck goes to which fire. It's, it's, it could also be about a whole lot of other aspects uh, right across the emergency management spe spectrum and conceivably wider as well. So that's why I said before to help us make decisions and to provide advice to governments. That was, that's quite deliberate language. So I think, I think this has the potential to be quite a useful framework stemming from us here up into government. So, so we'll give this update. Uh, 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 the Minister Little Proud or I will give this update at MacBem. Um, uh, much, much along the same lines. And perhaps through the Secretary we'll get a copy of the uh, oh, latest draft. Yeah, yeah. Paper out to, I, I, to I just assume that um, you'll, you'll have it. Yeah. <coughs> okay.
Okay, so we'll note the update and uh, stay tuned for deliberations at uh, the PEM on the 20th. Yep. So what I'm hearing is uh, we're endorsing the elevation of Pylon to be a, a group within the AFAC collaborative framework for the revised terms of reference and uh, subject to some amendments from the Commonwealth right. in, in minor amendments endorsing the uh, group strategy. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Now to the CEO's report. Stuart. So, four items here. The issue around um, the US and Canada. So, Thank you. That was very informative. So, Commissioners, you will have seen that several of the themes proposed to be inquired into today were mentioned in that clip. Um, Operator, can you please now show document RCN.900.094.0001? Uh, Commissioners, this is a table prepared by Commission staff of meetings of emergency management decision-making bodies um, throughout Australia. This table was prepared on um, the basis of information received by the Royal Commission from the Commonwealth. Uh, and the states and territories. It is a snapshot of the situation across the country from November 2019 to February 2020. Um, for example, the table does not include meetings of the AGCC, which is the Intra-Commonwealth uh, Agency Committee at which representatives of the ADF, Geoscience Australia and other Commonwealth agencies met. Another matter to note is that the table does not include tropical cyclones. Um, what you do see though in red and perhaps operator if you could zoom into for example the columns uh, national non-governmental uh, Queensland and New South Wales Uh, so I'm, I'm being told it's difficult to 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 uh, zoom in. Oh, there we go. So what you see there, uh, commissioners, uh, the various meetings of the COSC, including on the 31st of October, the meeting we just viewed the videos of, but also various emergency meetings of COSC held after that. And when you move across to Queensland, you see there. The um, body in green is the Queensland Disaster Management Committee. That is chaired by the Premier of Queensland. You also see beneath that in yellow the State Disaster Coordination Group, a lower level uh, uh, a whole of Queensland government group. Um, the dates appearing under the Queensland um, column in green show the dates on which the QDMC met um, and you also see in red there the dates of, dates during which bushfires were raging throughout the state and then if you move across to New South Wales you see there the State Emergency Management Committee which is chaired by an independent member, Mr. Andrew Cappy Wood. And you see there its meeting date on the 5th of September. And you see there the dates that fires raged throughout the state of New South Wales. That approach is followed across the table. And we will discuss using this table how information was communicated by each of the jurisdictions up to the national level, including to COSC, and how the information was assessed by COSC, and then how the information from that national picture was communicated back down to each jurisdiction. No, and that's a really good description. And, and just to confirm, this is the formal decision-making bodies as provided in the structures that the states provided us uh, for that. And uh, and COSC, as we've said, have said a national non-governmental, but uh, but obviously a critical part of what's uh, what's happened over the, the season. Commissioner Bennett's got a clarifying question as yes. well. Uh, just want you to explain what national government 
what you're referring to there. Oh, so yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so national government is not there intended to mean the Commonwealth government, but the government at multiple levels. So that's this, national government decision making. Yes. Right? As opposed to Commonwealth government. That's, yeah. Yes, that's correct. So NCC stands for the National Crisis Committee. And um, although it's not clear on the chart, it's ANZEMC underneath that. And you see the meetings of ANZEMC and the two meetings of the NCC that were held on the 11th of November and the 10th of January. One of the <laughs> items to note is that COSC met also on the 11th of November at the same, sort of on the same day that the NCC met, noting that many of the members of COSC are also members of the NCC. Commissioners, um, before I call the first panel, I will tender the relevant documents for today, uh, which includes the timetable and this chart of meetings. Um, so I tender proposed exhibits 28.1 to 28.11 of the amended tender list as notified to the parties with leave to appear. 28.1, 28.11. We will uh, take those exhibits as marked on the amended tender list uh, as exhibits. Thank you. Thank you. I now call the first panel of the day, which comprises representatives of the Northern Territory. I call Chief Fire Officer Mark Spain, Ms Colleen Bremner and Commissioner Jamie Chalker. Ms Bremner, Mr Spain and Mr Chalker, thank you for joining us. Um, ah, we may have lost them. We've still got you. No, we can we can hear your feedback, so uh, we might have just lost. If you can hear us, we will continue. There we go. There they are. Yeah. Uh, so, Associate, I understand uh, Chief Spain will take an oath, Ms Bremner will make an affirmation, and Commissioner Chalker will affirm. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Mr Spain, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Ms Bremner, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you. Mr Chalker, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. And we'll work to try and sync the, uh, the audio and the video here. It, it, is this suitable for you in Northern Territory? Is it working or is it difficult to hear us? We're getting a significant amount of feedback at the moment. Yeah, we're getting that back through your system as well. We might have to, to work this just as we start to go. We'll, we'll work it as we uh, start with the, the questioning. If any point it starts to get too confusing, please let us know. Will do. So thank you for your time this morning. Um, Ms Bremner, I know this is your second appearance at the Royal Commission, uh, but welcome Commissioner Chalker and Chief Spain. Um, Commissioner Chalker, can I start with you? You're the Commissioner of Police and Chief Executive Officer of Fire and Emergency Services in the Northern Territory, and you're also the Territory Controller. Can you just explain what role that involves? So under the Northern Territory Emergency Management Act, there's a specific title of the Territory Controller. What that act in essence provides is the Northern Territory response to any emergency. And within that, there's a number of declarations that we can make, ranging from an emergency situation to a state of emergency, state of disaster. 
uh, but there are other mechanisms in which an emergency can be declared, which we're currently also seeing through the COVID-19 response. But within the Act itself, it actually establishes the emergency management structure that's followed and introduces the Territory Emergency Management Council, which I sit as a chair, and the territory control role is specifically for the response element of any emergency that is occurring in the Northern Territory. In terms of Northern Territory Police, does it have responsibility for particular types of natural disasters? So our Emergency Management Act provides then for the creation of the Territory Emergency Plan. Within that plan, all hazards is the approach that's adopted by the Northern Territory. And each uh, hazard actually has an identified combat agency, which becomes the Hazard Management Authority under our Act, as well as then the Controlling <coughs> Authority so we'll certainly have response um, in respects of combat for cyclones and those types of natural disasters, uh, whereas, say, for a pandemic, health have the lead on that. Uh, for bushfires, bushfires NT has the lead on that, so it's broken down across multiple categories. I also have the emergency services that sits under my tri-service, so they also have a number of responses uh, that they lead as the Hazard Management Authority. And as a general rule, once it starts to be coming to a point where it needs a multi-agency approach across government, the Police Fire and Emergency Services tends to be the controlling authority, uh, which then sits over the top of our Emergency Operations Centre. Thank you. And just in that role as Territory Controller or as the Commissioner with responsibility for natural disasters such as cyclones and floods, um, what is your... Um, involvement with COSC. Do you have any involvement? Uh, so we we get to understand obviously what the broader environment is, but through the TEMSI model, uh, we've moved pretty well immediately to setting up a specific cost code that is related to the event, and then all the ultimate uh, expenditure that's undertaken is consolidated, and then depending on how that's ultimately all allocated and what agency is relevant. And the reason I'll explain that is that under our definition of our Territory Emergency Plan, we have agencies that sit as heads of functional groups. So Territory Families, for example, will sit over the top of our welfare group, and welfare will tend to look after our evacuation centres and the like. So we will have uh, cost lines identified by cost codes within it, all of those, and we ultimately consolidate. Thank you. So I was just making sure... Um, you understood the question. Um, I was asking I you about the chief uh, officers, uh, commissioners, and chief officers strategic committee of AFAC. Do you have any involvement with that committee? Uh, no, now that I understand that definition, no. Sorry, I thought you said cost, <laughs> Mr. Glover. <laughs> no, uh, thank no you. the chief officer is in, invariably our representative on that. Yes. So if the Territory requires, for example, additional policing or SES resources, I might take this question in part. How does the Territory make that assessment? So invariably that will be from uh, Commissioner level to other heads of relevant agencies. We've done that quite frequently uh, as a jurisdiction. You'll appreciate that whilst we cover 1.3 million square kilometres of land, we have a relatively small population, only about 240,000 in total across the whole of the Northern Territory. However, our land mass is such that it is impacted probably a little too regularly for our liking uh, by natural disasters and bushfires in particular. And so with that, we have a relatively small number of actual employed people in our specific services. So it's not uncommon for us to go and seek additional resourcing. The most recent event is obviously the COVID-19 response, and I was able to gain uh, the provision of 102 Australian Federal Police Officers uh, over a four-month period to assist us in our initial response. Thank you. And how does... So once that um, assessment is made that the Northern Territory requires additional police resources, how does that arrangement work at a national level? How do you communicate that... Um, request for assistance? So there's no formal mechanism which I need to follow in that respect. So I think under the 
uh, response of each jurisdiction tending to have the lead on the relevant emergencies that occur in their jurisdiction, uh, then the relevant controller in this case, uh, it's invariably always my role, has the ability to make contact um, with other agencies and seek that assistance. Other mechanisms can always be from asking your Chief Minister to make contact with a relevant Premier, uh, as equally as also making contact with the Prime Minister, which I think was the mechanism they tried to utilise with the establishment of the National Cabinet over the preceding COAG environment. But it's a pretty tried and true method. We share resourcing quite regularly, uh, not just in response of natural disasters, but more particularly when there's a significant event as occurred with the bushfires and then also with COVID, the uh, police commissioners move into a fairly regular period of catching up um, via a teleconference mechanism just to check in on how everyone's tracking to see if there is any additional resources. That also goes to equipment. So we had similar meetings around the provision of PPE, for example, to ensure our frontline workers were able to be supplied. Um, thank you. That that's a useful answer to contrast um, or compare the situation in relation to the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee. Uh, so I may now turn to Chief Spain and Ms Bremner. Uh, you are both uh, members of COSC, is that right? Uh, no, I'm a member of COSC. Um, I'm a member of COSC by default in the respect that We've just gone, gone under a structural realignment and formerly the Executive Director for Fire Rescue and Emergency Services attended COSC. I, t I did attend the last meeting by teleconference. Thank you. And Ms Bremner, you also attend COSC meetings. Do you attend in the capacity of a member or are you a guest? Uh, I attend as a guest. Thank you. Um, so do I understand from that answer, uh, Chief Spain, you have the Territory's vote on COSC, is that right? Uh, I do. And I should uh, probably go back a step to ask you then, and I'll ask you, Chief Spain, um, first, um, does COSC make decisions? I'll have to uh, probably put a bit of context to that. I've only been recently appointed to the COSC. Uh, the COSC will have meetings and they will come out under the terms of reference a consensus decision approach. Um, I have not had a lot of experience in that, in that uh, space. Okay, thank you. I might then ask Ms Bremner, even though you only attend COSC meetings as a guest, what's your experience been of... Um, of COSC, does it make decisions? Uh, from my experience, COSC provides um, a national situational awareness, um, gives you the you know the operating picture of what's happening across the jurisdictions. So if it um, and in those in those meetings, each of the members of COSC or the jurisdictions will provide an update on what's occurring in their jurisdiction. And then um, if there are jurisdictions that are requesting extra assistance, they're obviously, um, that's the opportunity where the, the jurisdictional members can put forward what they've got available. Uh, thank you. And I should say, so that, that decision making um, takes place in the emergency manage, uh, the emergency meetings of COSC that are usually called at short notice when there is a need to for there to be some interjurisdictional resource sharing. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. And so, Ms Bremner, I'll stay with you. You attended the um, uh, meeting on the 31st of October that we saw um, uh, snippets of played um, this morning, um, that obviously isn't an emergency meeting of COSC, that's one of its regular three times a year meeting. What matters are discussed at that meeting and what, if any, decisions are made at those meetings? So my, my recollection of those meetings are, um, so there are there's items of work that um, perhaps AFAC are developing um, so under the under the subgroup, some of those projects are presented to COSC. 
Um, that meeting in October, if I recall, was in um, Tasmania. We also have presentations from, um, um, hopefully I'm not getting confused between my COSC and the AFAC meeting, but um, some of the challenges that um, came up with the Tasmanian fires. And um, there was also, obviously, there was also a presentation around um, one of the major projects is around public warnings. Um, and so I'll just um, pick up your um, membership of AFAC. Is it right that sort of Bushfires NT is a member of AFAC and you are a member of the AFAC Council? Um, that's correct. We pay a membership fee and I um, have a meetings when I'm able to, otherwise I um, phone in. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Chief Spain, I might come back to you now um, because um, I have it recorded that you attended the most recent meeting of COSC, which was on the 17th of July this year. And it's at that meeting that it was proposed to reposition COSC um, from AFAC to sit under ANZEMC. Um, do you have any views about that repositioning and what it means? Uh, to be upfront, no, I don't have any views on, on that process. Purely, that was probably my first uh, meeting, to, and it was via teleconference as well, uh, which makes it difficult from this point of view. Mm, no, thank you. I understand that. And I also should now turn to a bit of context because obviously the Northern Territory, as I discussed with um, uh, Ms Bremner um, on the previous occasion, is a net exporter of firefighting resources. So I just wanted to ask you um, both, and I might, I'll might start with you, Chief Spain, but if you don't have the knowledge, I will throw to Ms Bremner. Um, how are decisions made at COSC about sending Northern Territory personnel interstate? Um, uh, are they accountable in any way? Are they accountable to the Territory? Uh, I'd say no. This is my own opinion. Uh, no. What will happen is we'll have an emergency COSC meeting, uh, short notice, as you've indicated. Um, we'll do a state of the play around all the states and territories um, and with that advice provided by each individual state, we will determine where the resources, if available, would be best suited. Uh, once that meeting is uh, hung up, we go through the National Resource Sharing Committee uh, to indicate what resources we can uh, make available should it be required. So do you indicate when there's an emergency meeting of COSC that, so yes, the Territory can provide 50 firefighters? No, not necessarily at the emergency. We'll get a point of contact. Uh, what I'll do first is liaise with Bushfires NT, Colleen, uh, to see their availability. Usually it's a co-shared environment. However, uh, as we've provided evidence before, we're usually coming off the back of our busy fire season and we have to be very conscious of the fatigue factors of our small workforce. I'll speak uh, in relation to both bushfires and team ourselves, the Northern Church Fire and Rescue Service, uh, and that's what the decision process has made, their availability. Thank you. And so um, when COSC is debating um, where to send resources, um, can you... Uh, assist the Commission by explaining how that process occurs? The, the, to my understanding, it's broken into two, phase, two parts. Uh, I think New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania work in one group, Queensland, Northern Territory, uh, Western Australia work in another group. So it determines where the resources will go to those two uh, sectors, so to speak, uh, in my words. Uh, and that's where we'll focus. So if we need deployment into Queensland, that's where we'll cover and we'll assist directly with Queensland. And they will send a, a letter of request of which we'll address. 
And, and so when that request is made, is that a request made by, for example, Queensland to COSC or is it a request made to the Northern Territory? Uh, after the, the decision has been made of what resources we can have available, the request comes from Queensland, for example, to the Northern Territory. However, the National Resource Sharing Centre are involved in that process, hmm. the best of my knowledge. And I was just going to ask you, so how is the NRSC involved in that process? Yeah. Best of my knowledge, it comes through that system so they keep account of what resources are going where into which state as well. Mr Glover, can I just clarify the answer there? The letter from Queensland to the Northern Territory it comes state to state, but who in Queensland would send the letter to who in the Northern Territory, please? What position? So is that chief to chief? Um, commissioner to commissioner? Uh, what level is it? Yes, uh, the letters... Sorry, Commissioner. Um, the ones I have received has come from, um, say, was uh, Commissioner Fitzsimmons to myself. That was post um, the post cost meeting and where we had um, um, volunteered some resources. Then it was followed up with a letter. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. So once that decision is made by the Territory or there's an indication you can export firefighters, um, how is that decision reported back through your Territory Emergency Management Framework? Uh, I go directly to the CEO, who is the Commissioner of Police uh, and the CEO of Fire Emergency Services. On that point, it's a briefing note. Thank you. And Chief Spain, do you find that the co emergency COSC meetings give the Territory a, um, a situational awareness of what is happening nationally with respect to firefighting? Yes, I do. Uh, they go state by state, Territory by Territory, uh, getting a a uh, feel for what is happening and then they will refocus on the main priority areas. Um, I want to um, talk a little more now about prioritisation um, of resources, especially in a circumstance where there are scarce resources, and I appreciate this might be a hypothetical. So imagine that the Territory um, has 50 firefighters available to deploy to assist another jurisdiction. Um, no other state and Territory has any firefighters, so please assume that, available to assist. And then I'd like you to also assume at an emergency COSC meeting, two jurisdictions both put their hand up and say, I want the Territory's 50 firefighters. How does COSC go about making that decision? I would leave that for COSC once again. I would say I have limited experience and I've not uh, been involved in that scenario. Mm. And, and yeah, so I wasn't um, suggesting it happened. Uh, Miss Bremner, please. Yeah, so some of my recollections of the um, previous cost meetings. So if you um, think about South Australia sent firefighters to um, assist in New South Wales and then their fire weather conditions sort of increased. So there was, um, a, so what happens is they, the jurisdictions talk about the risk that they're facing. So obviously there are risk assessments and it's discussed at the COSC meeting. And, um, and so obviously then um, it's about where the best use of those resources might go. So it's quite a collegial meeting in relation to um, what's being faced. And then obviously you need to overlay what type of um, skills that your firefighters may or may not have when you're sending them. So there's a, some balance there. And so, Ms Bremner, um, 
is it the case that when a decision like that needs to be made, the expectation would be that COSC has a, has a vote on where to send the firefighters? No, uh, there are actually, a, they haven't actually voted from my recollection. It's sort of been a, a consensus. Okay, thank you. Um, um, operator, can you please bring up the NRSC Bushfire Strategic Planning Report? It's AFC.607.001.04-2. And I should say at page 0522, uh, Chief Spain, um, what is going to be brought up is the NRSC's Bushfire Strategic Planning Report. And you were interviewed as part of um, the compilation of this document with respect to Northern Territory operations. Uh, correct. Yeah. And it's just coming up now. Um, but I'm, perhaps, like, if you're familiar with the document, I just might ask you sort of, and I'll ask you first, but if you can't answer, Ms Bremner, please feel free to do so. Um, does the NRSC contribute to national situational awareness and planning in a forward looking sense? Is that, essentially, is that the intention behind this document? Uh, just to give you some context around that as well, at that point of time, Dave, David Willing was Executive Director for Fire Risk and Emergency Services. Dave was the lead member on that. I did sit in the office uh, with Mr Willing in relation to that uh, interview, as it's reported. The idea is, yes, forward planning uh, and situational awareness of what the each state territory has available. You. Does um, this might be a com uh, comment for Ms. Um, Bremner or a question for Ms. Bremner? Um, from your experience as a guest of COSC, does COSC um, play any role in relation to exercises or stress testing the response to natural disasters? Um, Cosc as, as an entity, um, not that not that I'm aware of. Um, is, is that more? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Is that more a matter for AFAC? Uh, yes. And so does AFAC do that? Um, it might be uh, they might facilitate, and jurisdictions who've got an ability put forward would volunteer to participate in in that. So. Um, or individual jurisdictions, but it's not something that we do really nationally. Mm. On the last occasion, you gave some evidence of sending some of your staff down to South Australia for training. Was that something that was arranged through AFAC or was that something you did bilaterally with South Australia? Uh, so are we are we talking about the um, aviation training? Yes. Sorry, I'm missing... Yeah. Um, that's correct. So part of the, um, the advantages of organisations such as AFAC or the COSC, even though I'm a guest on the COSC, is the relationships you form with um, other other jurisdictions. So, And um, South Australia, um, we've been able to negotiate with South Australia to bring their training, their trainers down to um, up to the Territory to provide air observer um, training for my staff and they've also provided me with a position um, for one of my staff to go and do the air attack supervisor training. So it's um, a majority of the training for that type of thing occurs in the um, eastern states and it's generally when we're in the middle of our fire season. So it's it's quite challenging for us otherwise. So um, having that um, meeting the, I suppose, face-to-face, -face, those other commissioners, is um, a real advantage for us. And, and so just to just so I understand your answer, that is that um, you were able to arrange that training with South Australia on a bilateral basis, but through the relationship that AFAC gave you with 
your South Australian counterpart. Exactly, and my officers are on, my staff are on subgroups with um, some of the groups, so they have officer to officer. So it's not just from the, the commissioner to executive director level, it's also um, staff underneath have reciprocal arrangements through those national groups. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, those were my questions for Northern Territory. Um, no, I think it was good background and noting uh, the limited participation uh, of some of the, the key witnesses. I think we've got a good background uh, from the Northern Territory to be able to progress through to other other states. Less Commissioner Bennett. Uh, the only question I do have, though, is, uh, Ms Bremner, you talked about the public warnings uh, d discussion. Um, and I know we talked about this, this previously. The... The discussions at COSC that have stepped forward or within AFAC for the public warnings, how has that how has that discussion gone about in the in the COSC meetings? Has it been a fairly collegiate approach or has there been some robust discussion or how does that how has that progressed? Um, uh, at the COSC meeting there, there was some um, from my recollection some quite robust discussion because obviously um, the eastern states were going into the fire season and the item that has come up was is the um, Watching Act mm -hmm. um, and the confusion that term has for the general public. Um, and so there was quite a bit of research obviously done in relation to changing that. And I think um, from the cost discussion was how would that, was that was the bigger picture, how would we roll it out um, because it is a fairly um, major piece of work to change warning systems, especially when you're um, facing some fairly catastrophic fire weather conditions coming ahead. So that that was a bit about timing, and have we got the, the words the words right? Yeah, and so watch and act from what we get, and we, I think we had this discussion with previously. Seems to be the core issue uh, and a sticking point in in the discussions. Is that that right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's confusion. I would say even in the territory in relation to what does what does the term "watch and act" mean for me as a member of the public? Uh, yeah, I can understand that, and and so the, I, I think there's a discussion, if I understand, around do you change the term or do you better explain the the the, the term, or was there more discussion than than just that? Um, there's people a lot more qualified, I think, in relation to... Um, no, I appreciate that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just keen that whatever we have, it's a national system. Yeah. Um, um, certainly we don't want to be making up terms separate in the Territory to anywhere else, so hopefully we'll get some um, some wisdom from what that what act might end up becoming. We hope for the wisdom as well. Commissioner Bennett. Yes. Thank you. I was just going to ask, I mean, so far, because AFAC is, is looking at this, I mean, it's taken a long time and they've been, you know, I mean, we've seen the surveys and, I mean, have, have the surveys progressed anything or is it still, um, is it still a question of the states that use Watch and Act wanting to um, hold on to that? I mean, can you give me a sense of, of exactly what the problem is? Really, I mean, doing more surveys doesn't seem to be the answer, and yet the votes seem to be let's do another survey. And it seemed to, I mean, on re looking at some of the survey results, I mean, some of them seem self-evident to me, if I may say so, and others seem to say, well, you've got almost equal numbers of people liking one expression and the other. So um, the, the response, the logical response, with, is that someone has to just simply make a decision. So, I mean, it's been years. Yeah. So I'm not sure that AFAC is the decision-making process to do it. it would probably need to go to um, um, the Ministerial Council. If I may, Commissioner, um, I think that's probably the missing point in all of this, is that ultimately the national mechanism of which you would have been able to get jurisdictional support was through the Ministerial uh, representation on the um, Ministerial Emergency Management Council, uh, which there's currently, obviously, with the change out of the COAG model into the National Cabinet model, uh, there's work currently being undertaken to consider what um, that future body will look like and the frequency of the meetings um, 
nothing seems too certain in 2020, uh, given all the experiences we had before us. But um, that type of conversation, I think, um, does need to be escalated up to that point because ultimately it's the, the governments of the day that have got to be comfortable as to what they're prepared to acknowledge and operate under, uh, certainly as it relates to then the national consistency, which um, invariably seems to be the missing piece. Yes, I can understand that. Um it does seem that at some stage there has to be a break in the discussions and a decision has to be made um, to have you know a national a national warning system that's consist consistent and everyone agrees to it or if those that don't agree at least some decision is made that it has to happen but I'm interested to know why then AFAC hasn't referred this up earlier when it was quite when it seems over the years I would have thought it's quite clear that no decision was going to be made at that level. Yeah, I don't know that I could give you a, a, a clean answer on that to be upfront. It's just a case that it seems to have continued in that churn in, in that environment and for whatever reason hasn't been able to pick up a champion uh, or a sponsor, for want of a better descriptor, uh, to bring forward into the Emergency Management Council. You know, I know there's frequent conversations around warnings, but for whatever reason it hasn't seemed to be able to get into uh, an outcome for a discussion to settle on a consistent determination. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Ms. Bremley, because again, it seems that, that AFAC still seems to think that it's going to have something done by 2022. Um, but it would seem to me that um, just from looking at it, is I can't see any evidence as to why it would change um, between the last five years now and in the next couple of years. Or do you have some insights there that you can share? Um, they were aligning or attempting to align the um, my recollection is the public warning, the, the new iteration of the public warning system and the um, the review they're doing on the fire danger rating system. So um, at the moment, the research is not quite finished in relation to um, the grass fire danger rating system. So the Northern Territory has been inputting into, into some of that. And my understanding is when that, that was work was completed, that it would match up with the, uh, the warnings. But... <coughs> It may have been wishful thinking. Yes, <laughs> yes. I was just saying it may, may have just been wishful thinking or, or putting it off. But I, but I appreciate the observation that it might be time that you know even from for those within the the system to to see that the time may have come when at some stage further research is not going to help and a decision has to be made. So I appreciate very much that insight. Thank you very much. No, we appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner McIntosh. Nothing for me. No, I think. Uh, so, Chief Spain, uh, Ms Bremer and uh, Commissioner Chalker, we appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may the witnesses be released from their summonses? The witnesses may be released from their summons. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, the next panel for this morning is Western Australia, but it's not in fact a panel. Uh, we have one witness, Acting Commissioner Craig Waters from uh, Western Australia's Department of Fire and Emergency Services. So I call Acting Commissioner Waters. Commissioner Waters, thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Uh, Associate Acting Commissioner Waters will take an oath. Mr Waters, do you swear by almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Acting Commissioner Waters, thank you for your time this morning. Um, I, uh, we are aware that Commissioner Clem uh, gave evidence previously, but uh, at this point in time, you're the Acting Commissioner of the Department of Fire and Emergency Services, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Commissioner Clem underwent a, a medical procedure and is, re is recuperating. Thank you. Um, I understand um, even though you are um, just acting for the time being, you nevertheless attend COSC meetings, is that right? Yes, that's correct. I um, 
in, in the absence of, the, of Commissioner Clem, I attend on his behalf and also uh, for the emergency cost meetings in relation to uh, major events or major incidents or, or adverse, adverse weather conditions that are forecast. Um, uh, obviously, cost uh, establish the emergency cost meetings and uh, we sit on that and give a basically a, a state situational briefing and awareness uh, for the other jurisdictions. Uh, yeah, thank you. I wanted to ask you about how Western Australia um, forms its assessment of its situational awareness. Uh, and so I might do it by reference to the table we saw before. Operator, can you please go to rcn.900.094.0001 and um, uh, uh, enlarge the portion of the table that um, has Western Australia's arrangements. Thank you. So uh, if we just look there, um, Acting Commissioner Waters, what we see there is WA and we see two references, one to SECG. Uh, apologies, I can only see your your vision there. I can't see any anything else, sorry. Okay, I think you need to swipe. Sorry. What many people are whispering to me. Why? <laughs> We will just, just uh, hold on, we'll just get you some direction on how to get that up on your screen from the technicians. There should be a slider tool um, on your screen that if you swipe, um, you'll then pull up the table. Yeah, it's not coming across. When we did the pre uh, pre one, it was it was shared and it came across, but it's not not actually coming up at all now. Okay, it should be on the bottom left corner if you can see something there. Absolutely nothing. Sorry. No. Okay, that's that, it's a line with a circle. It's a line with a circle. Um, but look, let's proceed. I've got it now. Yeah, it's You've got now. it. It's come up there by itself. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> without, without doing anything. Uh, we were going to give Commissioner McIntosh credit for that. <laughs> but we'll give it to the technicians. Um, so Acting Commissioner Waters, hopefully you can see now a column with Western Australia and then uh, references to a green box, SECG, and then a yellow box, SEMC. So they, those are groups within Western Australia of high-level decision makers. Um, I understand yes. SECG is the State Emergency Coordination Group. It's chaired by the State Emergency Services Coordinator. And yes. um, what we see is that um, you can see various fires in Western Australia there and that the other group, the State Emergency Management Committee, uh, met on the 4th of October, the 8th of November, and then in the portion that's extracted or enlarged, the 21st of November. Yep. Um, and so do, yes. do those bodies have import into the state's uh, risk assessment and situational awareness with respect to natural disaster risk? Um, they have input. Obviously, the State Emergency Coordination Group come together for uh, for major events, generally level three incidents, uh, which are obviously significant major incidents, um, and basically brings together all the, the various government, government and non-government agencies uh, to provide them with situational reports uh, and get some feedback and information from the various uh, from the various agencies that may be impacted or or be affected by the by the event. Thank you. And so I understand that so for at least last fire season, compared to the southeastern states, Western Australia's bushfire season was not as catastrophic. But um, when you attended emergency COSC meetings, um, 
were you provided with information from those groups or based on your own knowledge that then you then reported to COSC to give it an update of the position in Western Australia? Yeah, a bit of both. We gave a, a basically a jurisdictional size so state level briefing on, on what fires were occurring in, in our own landscape. Uh, and also what was happening on the a briefing of what was happening on the eastern seaboard, in particular New South Wales and Queensland. Um, and then also discussing what resource commitment we provided to those other jurisdictions in support of their major events. Uh, thank you. So just sticking with the situational awareness picture for a minute, so from a national situational awareness perspective, after the COSC meeting, do you then um, take that national picture away and report it back up through your state emergency management framework? Yes, it would be briefed up to the SECG uh, and also if, if, um, the, S if the State Emergency Management Committee also made it, the met, there would also be a briefing provided in that forum as well. Um, but also, probably prior to that, we do a lot of uh, intelligence and, and sort of uh, horizon scanning. We, we obviously use the seasonal outlook both from the national perspective and develop our own, own, um, own seasonal outlook for WA. Um, we will obviously have an, a, a lot of pre-season briefings and um, when we have major events on, we also have internal heightened risk actions and forecast risk and readiness reviews that we do internally to that. So do those risk reviews consider um, uh, a perspective broader than just the state? Um, absolutely. Um, we look at what's happening in, in the other jurisdictions and obviously COSC is, a, is the forum that we, we basically get the briefings from the other jurisdictions um, to inform what the likelihood is of the requirement to share resources or other jurisdictions requesting resources from WA. So I'll turn to uh, resource sharing now. Um, obviously, in the yep. last fire season, we've heard from Deputy Commissioner Clem um, that um, resources weren't required in Western Australia from the other jurisdictions, but that Western Australia sent resources interstate. So when you attend COSC meetings, how are those resource sharing decisions, um, oh, I should say, are resource sharing decisions made at COSC? Um, absolutely. I think that's the, the main forum for um, approval. I think if you look at the, the, the makeup of the cost members, they're all the, the key uh, the key drivers of all the jurisdictions and they're the ones that can make the critical decisions on uh, approving the release of resources across to assist other people or other jurisdictions. Um, and I, I think what we also need to consider in relation to the prioritisation of resources, it's, it's pretty much business as usual for us in the emergency management sector that um, whether it's local, district or state level, the prioritisation of resources follows the same framework. Obviously, the, you know, the, the preservation of life, um, the protection of critical infrastructure, um, uh, other properties and livelihoods, and also the environment and heritage values. And I think um, from a business as usual perspective, uh, and if you look at the makeup again of the of the cost members, um, these are all experienced, very experienced senior officers that have that have uh, gone through the ranks and um, been exposed to prioritising both at local, district, state, and also national level. So, um, and I think the cost members uh, basically come to a consensus because they all understand the the basic strategic control priorities that are put in place. Um, and if one jurisdiction has a greater need for for resources for the pre preservation of life initially, uh, then the other members of COSC clearly understand that. And um, I think there's always, or well, I can't recall any decision at COSC where there hasn't been a consensus drawn because each of the members understand the, the priorities of the other jurisdictions. And so I was going to ask you, um, wh what does a vote mean at COSC? So when you attend <coughs> COSC, in your role as a member, as proxy for the commissioner, um, do you ever take votes in those emergency meetings? 
Um, no, not necessarily. It's just a consensus. There's, a, there's obviously um, discussion, and on occasions there's robust discussion, uh, and on other occasions um, some jurisdictions want to go away and get some further information for their own department or agency uh, and come back. So, um, and that's I think COSC is, is just an extension of the other of the other AFAC collaboration network and technical groups. In it, um, it, it, it establishes a forum that enables um, the critical decision makers to to discuss not only resource sharing but other sector wide issues that that all the jurisdictions are dealing with. So, it's it's built on that collaboration and it's also built on on a, a consensus being being applied. And just to um, explore that a little more, um, if Western Australia were sending, uh, or had firefighters available to send into state, and there was discussion at COSC between, say, two jurisdictions, and it was decided by COSC that one jurisdiction and not the other should get them, um, for whatever reason, um, it does Western Australia follow that COSC decision or does it remain a matter for Western Australia? Um, we, we will follow that consensus decision, but obviously at the end of the day, there's they're state resources and ultimately the Commissioner has the final say in approving the release of those resources um, and also the time frame that the resources will be sent. There was a period of, of last year when we uh, we were sending both uh, resources to both Queensland and New South Wales, um, and then we had obviously some significant incidents in our own landscape um, and some adverse weather conditions forecast. So we we stopped we stopped sending resources to both Queensland and New South Wales for around about a three week period in late December to early January, um, and then when things conditions improve in in our jurisdiction. Um, we started recommencing the deployment of resources back to um, predominantly New South Wales because of the threat in Queensland at the time had reduced as well. So, and again, it gets back to the prioritisation and having that conversation at cost. And so I should ask, when you attend COSC or when the Commissioner of DFES attends COSC, um, are you or he attending in your capacity as Commissioner of DFAS, or are you attending in your capacity as a representative of Western Australia? Um, probably both. Obviously representing the department, but on a broader spectrum, the, the um, approval to release resources from other agencies is also approved by the FES Commissioner. Um, so our Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions um, send significant resources across with our resources across to both New South Wales and Queensland. Um, so the Commissioner would be acting also on behalf of or approving DBCA resources in consultation with obviously their Director General. Um, in terms of decisions made by COSC, um, to whom is COSC accountable in making those decisions? Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, the, the decision to release resources falls back to the individual jurisdictions. Um, but obviously, it's co-chaired by EMA and also reporting up to ANSMC. So um, there's a level of... of um, governance over the top and obviously to the Ministerial Council for Police and Emergency Management as well at the higher, higher level. Um, yeah, so I, I think the input of <coughs> or having uh, EMA co-chair OSC um, probably provides that little bit of um, independence from, from, from government. And um, just because you mentioned um, ANZEMC then, uh, I wanted to ask you, how does COSC report up to ANZEMC? Um, through EMA. So, um, so COSC, COSC being uh, co-chaired by EMA, that any decision that um, needs progressing through to ANZEMC is generally done through... Um, Rob Cameron and EMA. Uh, thank you. And I wanted to ask you now about the proposal um, that was, I think, discussed at the most recent COSC meeting. And that was, I think, one you attended because Deputy 
uh, because Commissioner Clem was actually giving evidence in the Royal Commission at the yeah. time. <laughs> so yes. that was the, uh, uh, the meeting on the 17th of July. Um, a proposal was uh, discussed there regarding positioning COSC as a subcommittee of ANZEMC. Um, what, is the, what is your understanding of the intention behind that repositioning? <laughs> Uh, my understanding is that I th AFAC we're going to consult with all the, the jurisdictions and all the AFAC members um, and then report back through EMA to ANZEMC uh, for discussion. Um, my take, uh, personally, um, I think the current arrangement works extremely well. Um, I think the collaboration between the key decision makers of, of all the jurisdictions um, is, is working uh, really well. I think being co-chaired by EMA uh, applies that uh, additional level of governance um, and also obviously through uh, the Ministerial Council for Police and Emergency Management at the, at the higher end, as I previously discussed. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think... I'm not sure what you're going to achieve or what's going to be achieved by just aligning it under ANS MC. Um, I suppose the, what we wouldn't want to see is a, an additional layer of bureaucracy which would impede uh, timely decision making or the, the, the sharing of resources. Um, and I think the offshoot of that is obviously the linkage between COSC and the National Resource Sharing Centre, um, which also is co-funded uh, and co-resourced by the various jurisdictions as well. Um, and I think that arrangement where cost make the decisions and then task the NRSC to deploy um, the resources from the various jurisdictions in support of um, a state that's having uh, significant incidents is, is one that works really well. And the benefit of the NRSC from our perspective is we actually have liaison officers um, embedded within the state operations centre of the, of, the, of the state that's having the major event, which basically gives us a direct conduit into uh, into their state operations centre for um, timely feedback. Uh, we also have uh, a cadre of national deployment uh, managers which we send across to the NRSC as well. So I think the current system works extremely well so I think further discussion will need to take place on are we adding an, an, an additional level of bureaucracy uh, and what's going to be achieved by realigning it. And so that's the, just to be clear, that's the current proposal by AFAC to shift COSC out of AFAC and underneath ANZ EMC, that's what you're talking about? Yes. Hmm. And, and um, uh, thank you for mentioning NRSC in your answer because that's the next topic I wanted to turn to. Um, can you just explain how COSC tasks... Uh, NRSC to deploy the resources that COSC agrees to send into state? Um, so the approval would be obviously done at COSC, the COSC meeting, and then the NRSC will liaise with, um, so they'll, they'll establish the interstate liaison unit, their own interstate liaison unit in the State Operations Centre. Uh, and they'll contact the various jurisdictions uh, with requests uh, on what what's required to uh, to be deployed to other jurisdictions. Um, we then embed our own liaison officer within the state operations centre, um, and they're the direct line, direct um, conduit back to our. We we also establish a liaison unit um, in in our own state operations centre. So that's the linkage back between the state and um, the jurisdiction that's having their um, the major event, and it's all in line with the um, the assistance in interstate um, arrangements that are put in place. What's the role of the NRSC liaison officer in the receiving jurisdiction? If you also, as a sending jurisdiction, have a liaison officer there. Um, they basically liaise with all the various liaison officers, or sorry, the deployment manager liaises with all the liaison officers, uh, and there uh, the receiving liaison officer basically sets up all the resourcing and requirements for for receiving them, and 
ours, just our liaison officer embedded in their state operations centre, um, is just there purely to look after our own resources that we've deployed uh, and then be obviously the linkage back into our own uh, state operations centre in Western Australia. What's your view of the um, current level of resourcing of the NRSC and is it sustainable into the future? Uh, I think at the last cost meeting we agreed to um, further fund the, um, the NRSC and also resource the NRSC for an additional 12 to 18 months to get us through the next fire season. Um, obviously um, funding is always an issue and um, if we could se secure some federal funding to sort of bolster the NRSC that would be a fantastic achievement I would expect and take some of the, the, the pressures off of the jurisdictions. Um, additionally I think um, there, there's probably improvements in relation to uh, physically resourcing uh, and also some, some technology that could be improved on uh, in relation to how we deploy our resources across and, and basically streamline it so it could be more timely uh, going forward. Um, and additionally to that, the potential to have other, other agencies, in particular defence, um, embedded both within, I think, personally, within COSC and also the NRSC as well, um, to streamline and, and get um, on the wall some, some of the defence resources um, in, a, in a more timely fashion. So can I just take a couple of parts of your answer then and explore them a little more? You said um, there's some technology that could be improved on in relation to how we deploy our, re our resources across and basically streamline it so it could be more timely going forward. Are you able to just elaborate on that and what you had in mind by way of technology? Um, probably both from a... From a National Deployment Register, I know that was one of the questions um, put up by the Commission as well, but also uh, potentially the use of WebEOC. So we have a we have a WebEOC platform that's pretty much our, our go-to, um, our single uh, single source of truth for both incident management and resource management. Um, so there's platforms out there that could be embedded. Um, some of the issues around probably a, a National Deployment Register would be that um, we deploy a lot of a lot of volunteers to other jurisdictions. Um, so the a national register would only be uh, a point accurate for a point in time, um, because um, we can't impose volunteer or, or volunteers obviously have a life outside of uh, volunteering. They also have work commitments and, the, and their own personal commitments. So. Um, that would need to be considered in, in, in establishing a, a national deployment register as well. Um, would you be able just to explain for the assistance of the commissioners what your understanding is of the national deployment register and how that would assist interstate deployments? Each jurisdiction, I know for Western Australia, we have a, a deployment register for both career and volunteer personnel to, uh, to be to be deployed uh, intrastate, interstate uh, and internationally. Um, and obviously the National Deployment Register would just be a, a composite of that. So it would bring all the, the jurisdictions together with a, with a national uh, arrangement or a national register of all the people, uh, volunteers and career personnel um, and from other, other agencies that could be deployed to um, <coughs> either internationally to another jurisdiction um, or internally to, to another state. Thank you. And I understand that's been um, used um, quite successfully internationally. Um, wh when is it proposed that it will be available for use domestically? Uh, I think it's still in the discussion. I think um, the at the last cost meeting, they agreed to... Um, to consult further and review and the, uh, the likelihood of bringing uh, or, or establishing a register. Um, one of the issues was around um, funding. Where would the funding come from to establish the National Deployment Register? Uh, and also the issues around that, um, the volunteers and, and it only being accurate um, for the current point in time. 
So it, the onus would still be on, I, I would think, the onus would still be on the individual jurisdictions um, to maintain it and keep it contemporary with um, the availability of volunteers and even career staff. Um, I mean, we generally uh, release career staff that are off shift, so um, it'd still be, um, it'd be a living live document all the time and, and it'd need comp uh, constant updating. Uh, and that's what we probably want to uh, get away from is the duplicating of or the duplication of effort from both the state and a national level on maintaining um, the National Deployment Register's accuracy. Yeah, because obviously Western Australia maintains its registers at the moment. You need that to be interoperable with any national uh, deployment register. Yeah, so any any technology or ICT that's uh, that's developed or utilised would need to be integrated with all the jurisdictions, um, and that's what we're saying. WebEOC is a is a common platform that um, I know in WA uh, multi multiple emergency management agencies use. So police use it, uh, obviously here in Western Australia. Um, so that, that's a common platform that's used, but it's still onerous. And even when we deploy resources. Um, when we deployed resources during the last last uh, fire season, um, we still have to confirm with the volunteers that they're still available, um, and even with career staff that they're still available and still um, in a position that they can actually respond and deploy to another jurisdiction as well. Uh, thank you. Just in relation to WebEOC, is the issue with that platform, the fact that Western Australia uses it, um, do you use it when you deploy your firefighters to, for example, New South Wales? Yes, we, we keep a, a deployment register on on WebEOC as well. So it, it has our, our obviously our resources that we've deployed to incidents within the state, but also we keep a, a um, an accurate record of, of who's been deployed interstate, intrastate, and also uh, internationally, and um, and that's updated and kept up kept update when they return to uh, Western Australia. And is the position that so that's what Western Australia uses? But from your understanding, there other jurisdictions don't necessarily use that platform. No, and and, and I, I use WebEOC as, as a potential example or to to move forward, but. Obviously, and again through the collaboration and cooperation through COS, um, those those options will be discussed further. And I think the current position is that um, they're going to do a formal paper uh, with with COS's position and uh, put that up to the um, ANZMC in in October for further discussion. And just for the commission's assistance, what is the difference between COS? and ANZEMC from your point of view? Um, I think the ANZMC is basically the linkage between COSC um, and, and going further up through the Ministerial Council um, for Police and Emergency Management. That's that's what I think the linkage is in, in getting endorsement and approval from, from COSC and COSC and EMA recommendations to go further to ANZMC and and higher if it needs ministerial approval. Mm. And when we're talking about uh, those decisions that COSC makes that are pushed up to ANZEMC level, we're talking about those policy type decisions, not the operational resource sharing decisions that COSC takes at its emergency meetings. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And I think with, with cost, the, the, the sharing of resources, it will always remain with the jurisdictions ultimately to make that decision to approve and, and uh, deploy. Um, it, it, from my understanding, at least, um, ANZEMC is really a, a policy-based committee um, related yeah. to emergency management. Is that how you understand it as well? Um, yeah, but it, it, yeah, it policies, but it also approves other other recommendations and other uh, initiatives that both EMA and COSC come up with, and then and, and then, then report up. And then COSC seems to have at least this 
uh, dual function. The, on the one hand, there are the matters that relate to those matters of policy, such as resource prioritisation that are discussed at the regular three times a year meetings, but also this other function, which is the operational resource sharing function. Um, yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, thank you. I might just take you back to the table at uh, RCN 900.094.0001. If we just stay with the WA uh, uh, column and we go down to the bottom half of the, the column. And uh, <laughs> Acting Commissioner, I hope you can see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Just testing my glasses a little bit. <laughs> that's good. Uh, um, uh I just thought I would bring up for completeness, you mentioned earlier in your evidence that uh, uh, the SECG met as fires got more significant from about December, from about mid-December onwards. And is that what we basically see there with the three dates in green, 14 December, 3 January and 6 January? Yeah, so they'd, they'd be aligned to the level three incidents in both the Stirling Ranges, um, obviously out at Norseman and also further down in Esperance. Thank you. And so, Operator, can we just go across to the COSC column, please? And I know this will be difficult to um, perhaps see. Uh, yeah, down the bottom, please, for the same dates. Thank you. Uh, so, Acting Commissioner, if we see that there and compare it to the meetings of Western Australia's um, State Emergency Coordination Group, we see that there's a meeting of COSC on the 3rd of January uh, there's also a meeting of the State Emergency Coordination Group. Then we see a further meeting of the State Emergency Coordination Group on the 6th, but no corresponding uh, meeting of COSC. That's, is that because it wasn't necessary for Western Australia to call a meeting of COSC because it wasn't requiring any resources from interstate or requesting any resources? No, we wouldn't have been requesting any resources from the state and also um, it probably didn't warrant uh, an additional POSC meeting um, because at that stage purely we were providing resources and I think that period there um, probably between mid-December and um, probably mid late December to mid-January was a period where we stopped deploying resources to both New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, we did have a number of fires in it, but um, the conditions had improved. And I think uh, post that, we started redeploying uh, those resources back to New South Wales. Thank you. And I think, um, and this is not a memory test for you, but I think you attended the COSC meeting on the 3rd of January. I'm not sure if you can recall that. Um, <laughs> Not off the top of my head, there was a, there was a whole string of them for a, for a while, but um, generally, yes, um, both myself, the emergency, um, the emergency meetings of COSC, uh, I, I generally attend with the with the with Commissioner Clem and and provide a situational briefing from a WA perspective. And so, just in terms of timing, there we see a COSC meeting and then an SECG meeting on the same day. Is there any? Um, uh, 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 sequence in which that would have occurred or, no. or is it just depends on what happens? So the COSC meeting could have been before the SECG meeting or vice versa. It just depends on how it falls on the day. Yeah, yeah there's no linkage at all. I think um, the SECG meetings are, are independent um, and, and the COSC meetings are... are are produced when when um, a jurisdiction requested, especially well, they obviously have three three planned cost meetings throughout the year, and the other ones are as the jurisdiction requires them. Yes, yeah, thank you. We see that, and, and, and obviously the the SECG when uh, the State Disaster Council is um, is formed, um, their their meetings are obviously linked to the National um, Disaster Council meetings. Uh, 
right, yes, thank you. And we see there, just in that COSC table, we've been talking about the 31st of October 2019 meeting, and that's obviously one of the regular meetings, not an emergency meeting. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, commissioners, just noting the time, those are my questions. No, that, that, that's been really helpful. In fact, if we leave that up, I've just got a couple, couple of questions on understanding the, the state process. So, um, through well, what would be the process for Western Australia identifying that it's resource constrained and it needs to access either interstate, sorry, not either, both interstate and Commonwealth assistance? What's the formal process for, for that? Um, so obviously we do a fair bit of analysis and intelligence review of what's happening in our landscape. Obviously our seasonal outlook in, in both. And, and WA is fairly unique in that we have uh, two fire seasons, one in the northern north of the state and one in the, in the southern state. And last year was the first, what, first time it sort of overlapped uh, for a period. <coughs> also, the southern bushfire season also... Um, coincides with the northern cyclone season, which we also the has a management agency for and have responsibility for. So we do a fair bit of um, a horizon scanning and intelligence briefings. Obviously, when uh, we get forecasts, either from a national hazards perspective, uh, cyclones, uh, we do a lot of heightened risk actions. Um, we'll do forecast and risk readiness for all of our regions. So we have operational preparedness briefings uh, on a Monday and Thursday meetings all year round. Uh, where all the regions give us uh, an understanding of what their forecast risk is for that period uh, and also what their readiness uh, levels are uh, to respond to those risks. Uh, and then if it's appropriate, we put in heightened risk actions from both a regional perspective, uh, but also from a state perspective in our state operations centre. Um, we obviously do a fair bit in relation to our preform teams. We have an, uh, four uh, level three um, multi-agency preform teams that we put on standby for, during that heightened risk action period. Uh, we also bring a, together a group, which we call the All Hazards Liaison Group, which are, are, are key agencies that um, have input into emergencies or may be affected by emergencies so that um, they can give us their situational awareness. Um, and we also have a Bureau of Meteorology um, uh, person embedded within our state operations centre um, and they're always obviously keeping us up to date with forecast weather conditions and changes uh, specifically around fire danger ratings and also um, for forecast cyclones which as I said before coincide with our southern bushfire season. Okay so that's good situational awareness. Now that situational awareness system that you have tells you yep. that you're going to reach capacity and so therefore you need yep. interstate and or Commonwealth assistance. How is that process then, so state, so you decide, I'm assuming, that that's the, the, the case, or however that's decided, how is that processed then? So, yeah, and again, we're pretty resilient in WA that given No, 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 no. let's, let's say you're not group. resilient. Let's say it's all happening. Yep. I understand you're resilient. Yep. What's the process? Yep. Uh, well, obviously... I've uh, lived there for a little while, you're pretty resilient. Meeting. Yep. Yep. Right. So we'll put in a request for a cost meeting yep. um, and we'll discuss with the other jurisdictions the requirement that WA is considering the request of additional resources from other states. <coughs> Federally, we'll put in a, a either for, uh, if we're looking for defence request, we'll put in a, a DAC request, Defence Aid for Civil Communities, um, or put a, in a request through EMA for uh, Commonwealth resources okay. through the comm display. Appreciate Appreciate that. If I look at your committee structure, then if I can go to, I'm actually interested in the SECG. So there were a couple of meetings, 14 December, there were some fires, Stirling Range, but then 3 Jan to 6 Jan. I'm just interested, you know what triggered those two meetings so close together uh, there? Um, I'd have to look at the days of what, the, it might be a Friday and then we had another one on the Monday, given... Okay. Uh, and it might have been just the tempo of the fires that were occurring in WA. So in WA, not necessarily what might have been occurring nationally. Um, um, no, no. No. Okay. Now, a look at those meetings. I'm assuming from the membership of those meetings, you've got, uh, of which you're a member, um, yep. Premier, Cabinet, Health, 
local governments, biodiversity, energy, Defence Force Liaison, Weather, Education, Primary Industry, Water Corporation. I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong please, SECG sort of takes a whole of risk approach to the state uh, in assessing the emergency that's running at, at the time. Would that be a, an assessment? Yes, yep. Yep. And so that, they take into account all the risks. So you identify risks other than direct combat forces that you're looking at, or you know, so now you're looking at recovery and all those other aspects, who coordinates that and pulls that together to look at interstate or Commonwealth assistance? Um, the State Recovery Coordinator, which is embedded within DFIS, mm -hmm. within the Department of Foreign Emergency Services. So they're a member of that meeting, that committee? They are, yes. yes. Okay. And so it's then their responsibility to look at providing those requests. And do they have a similar process, like a cost score? How do they do it? Uh, I'm not sure from the recovery element. I know they appoint a state recovery coordinator, um, but um, I'd have to take that on notice and just okay. check back with the commissioner. All right. And, and then I'm just looking at the process here. Who makes the decision to go for additional resources. So if it's combat forces that you're after, is that your yes. position that makes the decision to ask or is it a state yes. decision? No, the first commissioner. Okay, independent of the, the state. So you'll do that through COSC? Yes. Okay. All right, Commissioner Bennett. Yes, I've just got a couple of questions if I may. Um, I know that this hasn't happened from your perspective, perhaps, but um, with with the question of the likelihood of exhausting a jurisdiction's capacity, have you experienced any discussion about that sort of topic at a COSC meeting and or would you expect it to be discussed at a COSC meeting? Um, yes, it has been discussed, obviously, throughout uh, the last five season, obviously, with uh, New South Wales and Queensland. And I think for a period of time, uh, Victoria were, were looking at... Um, uh, putting in requests as well. Okay. Um, did, how far did the discussion go, do you recall? I mean, was it actually where um, the the uh, information was given that the a bit, that the commissioner was saying that, well, we, have we are about to exhaust our, our capacity and we're going to put in a DAC request or a co activate Comdis plan or...? Yeah, it was more around what the states had actually already deployed to other jurisdictions to assist other jurisdictions and their capacity to maintain that. Uh, and also the likelihood, given uh, what incidents they had in their own jurisdiction, of the likelihood of them requiring uh, interstate assistance. Uh, and we fairly much knew that, given the given what was happening on the eastern seaboard, that um, WA um, would be struggling to get resources from the eastern states uh, in the event that we had significant fires, given that most of the resources in New South Wales were in the uh, preservation and protection of life phase, which is probably the highest priority to uh, assign uh, resources to another jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. Um, you earlier in your evidence, you you gave an analogy um, about the sort of decisions that are made for local resources throughout the state, and then the, you drew that as an analogy with the same sort. Of, you said it's the same sort of thing when you're looking, you know, at, at resources to be deployed from one st one jurisdiction to another. But just going back yep. for a second to the decision making within the state. Um, so, you know, when you're trying to decide where to deploy resources around the state and you make those decisions, do you, um, before the decision is implemented or at, or at any stage, do you report up to SEMC or SECG about those decisions? And, or, and do you have to get approval for them or do you just do it yourself? No, no, it's a jurisdictional um, thing. So we have our straight... So obviously, our State Emergency Management Committee have a whole heap of policies and we obviously have our state hazard plans that we, we adhere to. And within those state hazard plans, we have our strategic control priorities, which basically uh, drive where we um, position our resources. And obviously, protection and preservation of life is is the, the key driver. Uh, critical infrastructure, uh, 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 livelihoods and other residential property, and then the uh, environment and heritage values are the key the key priorities that we look at at prioritising. And that's where I drew that analogy of, it doesn't matter whether it's local, district, state or national level, those same priorities applied. And the EMA guidance note that was brought out on national prioritisation 
basically conforms to those um, those hierarchy of control. I, I understand that. I'm just trying to work out. I'm just trying to work out when you're making those decisions. For example, let's go first within the state. Yep. Whether before you make a decision to move all your resources from the south of the state to the north of the state, for example, do you have do yep. you make that decision absolutely on your own, or do you have to go up to SEMC or SECG before you implement that decision? No, we we would make that independently. Thank you. And when you um, when you um, send resources um, from from Western Australia interstate, you may have said this. I just want to clarify it. Do you have to? Um, is there any involvement of SEMC or SECG in that decision for sending Western Australian resources to another jurisdiction? No, they would just be advised during the meeting, uh, during during a briefing at the uh, SEMC or SECG. Would you would you brief those committees before you actually sent the um, the resources out of the state? Um, no, not not necessarily. Depending on the timing of the meeting, if the, if they were going to be deployed um, post meeting, we probably we'd, we'd highlight it and, and advise them. Otherwise, it'd be um, it'd be in the briefing the next uh, SCCG meeting. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. No, that was good. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr Waters. Um, I just want to pick up the response you just gave then to Commissioner Bennett. You said that uh, when you're applying that prioritisation lens over decisions, you do it irrespective of whether you're applying at the national level, the state level, the regional level, you simply apply them. So that would mean when you go to COSC and there's discussions about resource sharing and resource prioritisation that you take a national approach and you are blind to the needs of the state. Is that what you're saying? No, not necessarily. I, probably in the context, if we have available resources to deploy, they will be deployed um, under that priorities. But obviously, if we have major events um, occurring in Western Australia, uh, we'll, we'll be dealing with those fires in the first instance. So to paraphrase, you, you effectively ap apply the, the prioritisation criteria to the state first, then if you've got a surplus, then you offer them up to, to COSC and for sharing to other jurisdictions in accordance with that, with that criteria? Absolutely, yes. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Waters. That, that was uh, good, and we appreciate the high-level insight uh, of what happens in that SECG and uh, and the linkages there and the, the thought processes. That's uh, been very helpful. Uh, Chair, Mr. I just had one further question yep. while we have uh, Acting Commissioner Waters here. Um, Acting Commissioner Waters, you did mention the State Disaster Council, and obviously it does not appear in that list of... Um, meetings or this timeline column, but um, my understanding is that the SDCs only stood up when a state of declaration of emergency is declared, so there were no meetings of the SDC last year noting Western Australia's bushfire season was um, less extreme yeah, than others. Yeah. yeah, I have had a couple with obviously COVID Thank you. No, thank you. And in fact, for thank completeness, you. we actually should update our chart. No, just to indicate that it's not. No, uh, yeah, I think that's important to, to clarify that SECG is not the highest. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, may Acting Commissioner Waters be uh, excused, uh, released from his summons? Commissioner Waters, you may be uh, released from his summons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair, it's uh, now time for the morning tea adjournment. The next witness is scheduled for 11.45. Uh, we'll take an adjournment till 11.45. Thank you.
The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr Glover, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is our third panel of the day, and it's a panel from South Australia. I call Mr Chris Beatty, uh, Chief Officer Michael Morgan, and Chief Officer Mark Jones. So, Chief, Chief Executive Beatty, Chief Officer Morgan, and Chief Officer Jones, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr Beatty will affirm Chief Officer uh, Morgan will take an oath, as will Chief Jones. Mr Beatty, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Morgan, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Mr Jones, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr Beattie, uh, I might just start with you um, uh, because you're the CEO of the... Uh, SES. Um, can you just describe what um, role the State Emergency Service from South Australia has within COSC specifically and AFAC more generally? Uh, so the uh, South Australian State Emergency Service is a, a member of AFAC Council. So I sit on AFAC Council. And as the uh, Chief Officer of the State Emergency Service uh, within South Australia, I'm also a member of the COSC. Uh, thank you. So, Chief Jones, you are also a member of COSC? Yes. Yes, my post is, yeah. Thank you. And Chief Morgan, are you also a member of COSC? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. And so, just by reason of the three of you being members of COSC, um, how does South Australia exercise its vote if it's necessary to do so? Well, my understanding is, from the terms of reference, we have uh, one vote each. Oh, not a single vote for South Australia? I don't think so. But my understanding was a little different, that there was, at one stage, one vote for South Australia that, that may have been changed. Mm. Uh, thank you. So, Chief Jones, can I ask you, um, from your experience, does um, COSC undertake votes when it's making decisions, and I'll break it into two classes of decisions. Decisions in relation, first, decisions in relation to the broader policy aspects of its work. In the period that I've been in Australia, which is less than one year, I've not been aware of any votes in the cost process. Thank you. Um, so, Chief Morgan, I'll just ask you, um, in relation to the emergency type meetings of COSC, are you aware of any votes that have been taken by COSC at those meetings? Um, in my experience, um, I've been involved with COSC for the past two years. Uh, I haven't been um, involved in any of the uh, that decision making at a COSC emergency teleconference. Thank you. So what we've heard um, from the other jurisdictions that have already given evidence today is that essentially those meetings of COSC take place on a consensus basis. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, so, gentlemen, you're all nodding, but can you perhaps, or starting with Chief Morgan, then going to the middle to Mr Beatty and then Chief Jones, can you just please all indicate your assent to that question? Uh, yes, yes, that's correct, by consensus. Uh, thank you. And, and certainly my, my experience uh, with COSC, the uh, decisions have all been by consensus, both um, for the more strategic um, planned issues and also the emergency teleconferences. I can confirm that in my experience, of course, the decisions have been generally consensual and uh, almost with no dissent. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I just might stay with. I just might go back to Mr. Beatty for the time being, and just um, ask you, based on your experience, how or whether you've been involved in any interstate resource sharing of SES personnel through COSC. Um, in terms of uh, SES personnel, uh, we've had a long history of um, supplying resources to other jurisdictions. Uh, I've been in my role for 10 years in South Australia and in that time we'd have undertaken in excess of 30 deployments um, to other jurisdictions. Um, not all of those have been under the auspices of COSC or the NRSC, which are more recent uh, coordinating mechanisms. Um, but certainly uh, with the more recent deployments, um, SES has experienced sending uh, personnel interstate as part of combined South Australian um, task forces to uh, New South Wales most recently, um, but also to other jurisdictions. Thank you. Um, can I just stay with you for a moment and track through a bit of the history? Um, and obviously, as an AFAC council member, uh, of long standing, would you or were you involved in the decision to establish COSC? Uh, look, I was uh, aware of the uh, establishment of COSC. It, um, it was a decision that was made through AFAC um, on the back of a, a post seasonal, um, it might have been, well, whether it was post seasonal or pre seasonal, but it was certainly a meeting of commissioners and chiefs. Uh, with Commonwealth officials, and uh, you know, following that, it was determined that it would be um, prudent to establish a forum on a more formal basis with the terms of reference, where the operational uh, chiefs and commissioners uh, could collectively consider strategic issues and um, provide advice to uh, AFAC and indeed to the Commonwealth. And so, initially, was COSC meant for? Um, solely sort of fire combat agencies or did it incorporate agencies like yours, the SES, as well? Uh, COSC has always incorporated uh, the broader um, suite of agencies that are represented on AFAC. Um, the, uh, the land management agencies um, have traditionally been represented through an FFMG representative uh, on COSC. But uh, the SES agencies have historically been uh, represented represented by um, one of the COSC uh, members, um, who's also an SES chief or commissioner. But uh, yeah, largely the representation in terms of which SES sits on COSC has been driven by jurisdictional arrangements rather than uh, COSC per se. Can you just explain what you mean by that? So, uh, for example, in South Australia, uh, the Fire and Emergency Service Act establishes the uh, Country Fire Service, the Metropolitan Fire Service and the State Emergency Service. Uh, each chief officer has statutory um, accountabilities for um, his or her agency and uh, is responsible for the, uh, the ultimately responsible for the uh, operational <laughs> deployment of those resources. So in that context, um, the South Australian agencies all have a, a seat at COSC. In other jurisdictions where there may be, for example, a overarching department where there's a single commissioner who has responsibility for the fire services and the SES, then generally that commissioner will represent those agencies at the COSC. Uh, thank you. So just in terms of when COSC was set up, um, at least my understanding is it didn't have, at the time of its creation, a role in resource sharing, but that that developed over time. Is that your um, recollection as well? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a fair summation. Before... COSC was involved in resource sharing uh, between jurisdictions. How did resource sharing take place? I think you said in your answer previously, before COSC was established, you, or indeed took on this resource sharing role, you were involved in sharing your personnel 
with other SES organisations around the country. So the, um, the, the relevant agencies uh, had um, arrangements for uh, sharing of resources. Probably the most uh, long-standing of those would have been through the uh, forest fire managers. But uh, uh, certainly the SES agencies have had, uh, up until the more recent arrangements for interstate assistance, uh, protocols for resource sharing. Um, the SES protocols for resource sharing, the, the providence of those really dropped out of some work that was done through CAF, which is Council of the Federation, where there was a, a desire to look at transportability of qualifications with respect to uh, volunteer personnel um, following and during uh, major disasters. So in terms of SES resources, um, the uh, pre previous experience would be bilateral um, a negotiation of a request and supply of uh, personnel um, and or equipment. Um, and as I said, uh, South Australia has had a pretty long history of providing uh, SES personnel to um, just about all jurisdictions uh, during times of crisis. Uh, thank you. I just want to ask you one more question, then I'll move to the Chiefs. Um, but just because we haven't heard much so far from SES leaders. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the transferability of qualifications. Um, how transferable are SES qualifications between jurisdictions in Australia? Uh, well, all SES agencies uh, in states and territories uh, will train their personnel pursuant to the um, national training package um, and that we, ad we adopt for emergency services. Um, the extent to which each jurisdiction will uh, qualify individuals um, in various units of competencies may vary, um, as it does within, agent, uh, within jurisdictions. But uh, uh, by and large, um, the, uh, the qualifications are, are transferable, and uh, we've had um, seamless integration of uh, SES personnel into South Australia uh, when we've requested resources from other states um, and likewise when we've sent resources to other jurisdictions we've had seamless integration into their emergency service arrangements. Uh, thank you um, for that answer. Uh, I'll give you a break for a while and uh, turn um, now to the Chief. So, Operator, can you please um, bring up RCN.900.094.00 Zero one, and um, enlarge the columns of the COSC meetings and South Australia. Um, so, gentlemen, this is a table of uh, national meetings as well as South Australian meetings. I just wanted to ask you when it's when it's able to be enlarged. Um, just about how your how your jurisdiction, South Australia, um, forms a strategic picture of the risk and how that's communicated at a national level to give a perspective of South Australia's situational awareness outlook. So I might start with Chief Morgan. Uh, thank you. Um, we are having some trouble seeing the, uh, the, the overhead. It hasn't enlarged greatly, but um, the, we uh, partake in the cost teleconferences, the emergency teleconferences, uh, and then the alignment to our uh, other strategic meetings and uh, State Emergency Management Council uh, in South Australia, then the, uh, the Chiefs sit on um, SEMC and then we brief into SEMC on any matters. And so as I understand it, just for the Commission's assistance, SEMC is chaired by the Chief Executive of the South Australian Department of Premier and Cabinet, and then the committee above that is EMC. That's a reference to the Emergency Management Council Committee of Cabinet, and that's chaired by the Premier. Is that right? Correct, yes. So when you're forming a, a, 
view about the risk to South Australia, does SEMC or the EMC provide input or oversight into those assessments of risk? Um, not, not necessarily input, but we, we brief into uh, both um, committees um, and uh, with an assurance that um, uh, we have, our responsibilities are being met as chiefs within our, um, within our, within our legislative responsibilities. Uh, and so we are briefing in uh, regarding the state risk that we have, and then if there's a national risk, and uh, uh, we will be deploying and we brief into, um, in, certainly into CMC. A state emergency management committee. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate you can't see the dates of the COSC meetings very well, but once you get uh, a picture of the need for risk, um, do you provide an update to COSC members at emergency meetings of COSC that are called? Yeah, yes. Uh, each jurisdiction during those discussions would give the, the state of the state, as it were, in terms of fire risk from my experience of those meetings over the last season. Uh, thank you. And so just staying with you, Chief Jones, um, once you give that outlook, and I assume the other jurisdictions give their outlook, how is that, or is that national picture communicated back through South Australia's emergency management framework? Uh, not directly, unless it has implications for South Australia. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I want to just ask you, a, um, and I might ask for the three of you, I'm happy for either any of you to answer, um, and I'll take it in parts. Um, when you attend the usual meetings of COSC, and by that I mean the three times a year meeting, like the one that was held on the 31st of October, uh, do you attend as representatives of your respective agencies or do you attend representing the state of South Australia? We so, attend representing our agencies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So that's the response from all three of you, just to confirm. Uh, yes, from a, a Metropolitan Fire Service perspective, yes, that's correct. And same yes, for also you. from the country first. And same for you, Mr Beattie. Uh, yeah, that's correct, Mr Glover. Uh, thank you. Um, and so then turning to the uh, other type of meeting that cost COSC holds, which is the emergency meetings. Um, when you attend those, I assume you're also attending as representatives of your agencies and not as a representative of the state. And I'll, and I'll do it in a bit more of a structured way. So, Chief Jones, is that your understanding? Yes, it is my understanding, but these meetings tend to be less formal than the structured COSC ones. Thank you. Mr Beattie, is that also your understanding? That's correct. Yes. And Chief Morgan? Yes, that's correct. And so, Chief Jones, can I just go back to you for a moment and pick up uh, that uh, answer you just gave about they tend to be less formal. Can you just describe for the assistance of the Commission how those meetings come to be called and what is discussed at those meetings? I, I can't say how they come to be called, except uh, I was immediately immersed in them upon taking up the rule last October. And it seemed to me in my early tenure that they were directly tracking the risk in Australia. As the seasonal uh, forecast got worse, then we would convene to discuss risk in each state, uh, often with the, for with the focus being strongly on what resource and assistance each other might need from each other. Thank you. So when... Um, uh South Australia needs assistance. And Chief Jones, I might stay with you for the moment. Um, did South Australia make a request for interstate assistance last bushfire season? We requested uh, support through large aerial tankers uh, several times. 
And also internationally, we got support from North American air attack specialists who came and assisted us. And was those decisions about or requests for aerial assets, were they discussed in an emergency COSC meeting? I'd recollect that at least one of them was, yes. And was the request for international assistance also discussed in an emergency COSC meeting? I cannot answer that question. I suspect it would have gone directly to the National Resource Sharing Centre. And so I just wanted to ask then, what um, role... Um, Oh, no, sorry, I'll go back a step. So just when the matters are discussed, like requests for assistance at a COSC meeting, does COSC make a decision about whether that request is to be uh, accepted, and if so, by which jurisdiction? To my impression, not necessarily... It wasn't necessarily that the decision was being made within the COSC emergency meeting. Uh, thank you. And so do I take from that that there's still another process that has to happen um, after the COSC meeting? Uh, for example, there's occasionally direct conversation between ju two jurisdictions, uh, for example, to establish the availability of one of the large aerial tankers, whether it would be available to come over to South Australia in the following days. So that discussion has to take place to establish the ability of assets. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I want to show you some documents now, Chief Jones, to, to um, give the Commission um, an idea of how resource requests are made. Um, but I appreciate you weren't in the the job at the time of these particular documents. There are documents from uh, uh, Deputy Chief Stark, who was at the time the acting chief. Uh, so, uh, Operator, can you please bring up um, SAF.314.001.1 Uh, so, um, hopefully, gentlemen, you can see this, but perhaps not particularly well. Um, there's an email from NRSC deployments from the 10th of September 2019 um, regarding resource request for assistance, Queensland fires. Uh, operator, if we go down a little bit through the uh, question, you see there... Um, there's an email sent from NRSC deployments essentially seeking a or making a request from Queensland for tanker-based firefighters, no vehicles. Um, operator, if you go over to saf.314.002.0017, Zero zero six five. Uh, there we see uh, a document, Chief Jones. I was referring to. So that's a letter from South Australia's CFS, signed by uh, Deputy Chief Stark in his role as Acting Chief. Um, acknowledging receipt and advising that South Australia can um, provide assistance. Um, Chief Jones, have you been involved in any um, resource sharing requests like this one? No, because they were underway before my tenure. No, thank you. But, but we did, in, upon taking up the post in mid-October last year, we were already deployed to Queensland and to New South Wales, and that continued for the following two months in my early tenure. 
And so just to get an idea um, to the extent you're able to assist us, um, would this request for assistance have followed a COSC meeting? I can take that question on notice and get back to you. Thank you. Um, I might just go to Chief Morgan. Uh, have you had any experience in the sharing of resources in this way by letter between the jurisdictions? Um, from an MFS perspective, not directly. The requests that have come through cost um, in my um, uh, time as chief have come through for bushfire. And so in South Australia, um, CFS will lead the coordination of um, the requests and the MFS uh, post a cost um, meeting or emergency meeting will liaise with the country fire service and I, uh, once the, uh, the resource request is identified then we will um, ascertain the availability of our staff and then put those staff members forward to the CFS for a South Australian um, combined uh, response. Thank you. Um, when you make that decision to provide personnel to the CFS, uh, do you report that back up through the state emergency management framework? So do you, pr do you report it up to uh, SEMEC? Um, we, we will at a, uh, at a SEMC meeting but we don't report that back um, to SEMC on an on a every deployment basis, no. Thank you. And just turning to you, Mr Beatty, is this the way that requests for assistance also take place uh, within um, or bet between state emergency services agencies? Well, all state emergency service agencies have now um, adopted a, a resource sharing model through the NRSC. Um, prior to that, uh, there was uh, a similar exchange of letters between uh, parties in terms of the uh, sending participant and the receiving participant. Um, it has been my experience that uh, sometimes the correspondence is uh, often playing catch up to the actual servicing um, of the request in terms of uh, identifying the resources and preparing them for deployment. But nonetheless, there's uh, a formal exchange of letters around, around those resources uh, crossing borders. And do those exchanges of letters generally take place after a COSC emergency meeting? Uh, no, not always. So when are the other circumstances in which the exchange of letters will happen? So uh, f from my experience, um, the exchange of letters will happen once um, there has been uh, an agreement on the uh, resources that uh, can be provided and that will be sent from ascending jurisdiction and the um, receiving jurisdiction has accepted them. So that's essentially a bilateral arrangement you're talking about there? Correct. Thank you. Uh, now, gentlemen, I understand all three of you were present at the COSC meeting on the 31st of October uh, 2019, uh, which was played um, earlier. Um, and for completeness, you were also present at the most recent COSC meeting on the 17th of July 2020. Uh, that's the meeting at which we understand there was a proposal um, to reposition COSC from underneath AFAC to um, a subcommittee of ANZEMC. Uh, Chief Morgan, can I just uh, can I just start with you? What's your understanding of the intention behind that repositioning? Um, the intention uh, from the meetings that I attended was that um, that reporting line back into the Commonwealth and a. a greater understanding of the resources or the requirements for uh, deployment. Uh, thank you. Um, and this is perhaps a question for all three of you, so I might ask you each in turn, to whom is COSC accountable now? 
So, Chief Morgan, can I start with you? Uh, to uh, my incentives, to the APAC board. And uh, Mr Beatty? Yeah, certainly the, the AFAC board um, established the cost, so it sits within that, that framework. Um, as to whether it's uh, formally uh, accountable to it, um, I'd, I'd like to take that on notice. Um, now from my perspective, uh, each of the representatives um, in that forum uh, attends uh, COSC with their own uh, jurisdictional um, roles, responsibilities, uh, powers and functions. Um, but uh, yeah, whether it's actually accountable to the board, uh, yeah, I think I'd just uh, reserve uh, my comments there for now. Mm, thank you. And Chief Jones, I'll ask you as well. To, from your point of view, who is COSC accountable to? Thanks, Mr Glover. Uh, my understanding is that COSC is accountable to the AFAC board. Uh, just for uh, correction, I didn't attend the COSC meeting on 30, 31st October in Tasmania. The minutes show my attendance, mm. but I didn't actually attend. Oh, OK, thank you. Apologies. Um, and I'll ask Mr Beatty shortly, but um, I think, uh, Mr Beatty, you chaired that meeting of uh, COSC, didn't you? Uh, co chaired it, Mr. Clever? Yes, with um, the Director General of EMA. Correct. Thank you. Um, Chief Jones, can I just uh, circle back to you for a moment? Um, do you have a view on the repositioning of COSC from AFAC to ANZ EMC? I appreciate you're only new in the position and new in the country, but do you have a, an opinion on that proposed repositioning? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I might just then ask Mr Beatty about an item that was discussed and we saw on the video played earlier today about resource uh, prioritisation. Uh, so that was a, a, um, an agenda item at the COSC meeting on the 31st of October. Um, what is COSC's position on resource prioritisation? The, uh, the paper we considered on the 31st stemmed from a body of work that uh, had been undertaken by Home Affairs um, over uh, a couple of years. Um, this work was done in line with a national capability development framework that had been established uh, several years ago. Um, the prioritisation uh, framework that came forward um, as a guidance note um, really set, around, set out to articulate some um, high-level principles that uh, will be utilised for complex decision-making uh, during catastrophic disasters. The, um, the paper as tabled at, um, at COSC uh, was in, endorsed in principle on the understanding that it would be um, progressed through the ANZ EMC um, forum to ministers at McPem. Uh, and so has that um, process been undertaken so far? So as I understand it, the, uh, following the, um, the, the COSC's endorsement, um, there was uh, some further consultations with jurisdictions undertaken by Home Affairs and that the uh, prioritisation guide went to ANZ EMC out of session earlier this year and was endorsed through that process. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you um, how that prioritisation framework would apply. Um, I'm sorry, gentlemen, our screen is frozen. I just wanted to make sure we could, you could still hear me. Yes, we can still hear you. Oh, thank you. It's just the screen. Um, uh, please do let me know if uh, when I'm speaking I drop out. Um, I just wanted to ask you about how that uh, prioritisation framework would apply uh, in a situation where two states requested resources, um, there were inefficient, uh, insufficient, apologies, uh, resources available to meet that both deployment requests. So, for example, two jurisdictions request 50 firefighters. Uh, South Australia has 50 firefighters it can provide. Uh, how does COSC 
make the decision about where to send the resources. And Mr. Beattie, I might just start with you, um, but perhaps from an SES perspective, consider that they're SES personnel. How do you think um, COSC would make that decision? Um, well, Mr. Glover, I'd probably just start by saying I haven't ever sat through a COSC teleconference or, or meeting where um, that type of decision making has been required. But it's fair to say that the resource prioritisation guide does contemplate um, catastrophic circumstances where there are uh, more demands than there are uh, resources. Um, the prioritisation uh, approach contemplates a number of principles uh, which commence with the primacy of life and the um, protection of people and the vulnerable, um, the protection and restoration of critical infrastructure and so on. And it provides a framework where these can be considered across a number of domains, you know, including the economy, people, environment, infrastructure, uh, public administration domains and so on. Um, I suspect that uh, the decision making would be highly contingent uh, on the context and the uh, circumstances and you know, would be largely driven by um, you know, risk and considerations across those principles and, and those um, domains that uh, you know, we would consider the, um, you know, the overall challenging. Uh, thank you. So, Chief Jones, uh, appreciating this is a hypothetical situation, um, if a decision was made by COSC to send South Australia's 50 CFS firefighters to one jurisdiction and not the other that had sought it, um, does South Australia or the CFS retain the ultimate decision-making about where to send those resources? Uh, in, in, given the nature of the hypothetical question, it's difficult to give a, a firm answer. Technically, yes, of course, we remain, you know, having authority over our own personnel and their deployment. But the consensual nature of the working between the senior officers in, in the COSC is such that I couldn't foresee such a situation occurring realistically. Uh, thank you. Chief Morgan, do you have anything to add, appreciating you're from MFS? Um, I'm nothing further to add, but to support the comments made by my colleagues. Um, so, Chief Jones, I might just ask you, does that mean that it's, it is COSC that is the decision maker who determines where resources are to be sent? <coughs> Effectively, decisions could be made through the COSC that doesn't necessitate that COSC as a body is a decision-making body. So, so who then makes the decision to deploy the resources? Ultimately, the members of COSC in collaboration. Um, so if COSC made a decision to send South Australian firefighters to a particular jurisdiction, would you as Chief Officer of CFS consider yourself bound by that decision? Again, that's a hypothetical question. Uh, I would consider myself as informed by the decision, having participated in the debate which had led to the decision. Yes, thank you. Yes, and, and, and apologies, gentlemen. I appreciate we're talking about hypotheticals and indeed a situation that hasn't come to pass. Uh, there is one more topic I need to quickly ask you about, uh, and that is the Australian warning system. Um, what is the role of South Australia in relation to the warning system? Uh, one of the officers from CFS leads the, the National Working Group uh, on behalf of AFAC. And so my understanding is South Australia is described as the sponsor of the work that AFAC is doing in relation to the um, uh, Australian warning system. That would be a fair assessment. Mm, thank you. Um, I just want to ask Chief Jones if you're able to update the Commission on what work is currently being done on the warning system. My understanding is that some further research is being undertaken 
uh, following a decision at a cost meeting to, def to define the middle level of watch and act as to whether there should be some change to act now with further definition. There's some contention that watch and act is too nondescript. So further research is taking place, uh, which I anticipate will report, I think it's October. Uh, thank you. I, and I should just ask you, you were quite um, careful in your answer. You said uh, there's some contention that Watch and Act is too nondescript. Do you have a view on um, the, that term, Watch and Act? I probably haven't been around long enough in Australia to have an informed view. However, my personal observation was that in South Australia last summer, Watch and Act worked just fine. Thank you. Um, Chief Morgan, do you have a view on Watch and Act? Um, I, I would support um, Mr Jones's comment that from a South Australian perspective, uh, when the MFS has utilised those warnings, uh, we, we uh, have... Um, I haven't seen, uh, as a result of that, um, a, a misunderstanding of what the warnings say. However, the research clearly indicates that uh, there is a challenge around uh, the warnings and the way they've written currently. Mm. And is that, and do I understand your answer to mean there's a challenge around the warnings? By that you mean a challenge with the public understanding what the warnings mean? That's correct. As a result of the information that's been provided to us following the uh, comprehensive um, review of the uh, of the warnings. Well, thank you. Um, I, I could obviously continue with this topic for some time, but I note the time and I expect the commissioners might have some questions. So I, I might um, say those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Glover. And we could go on for a while with warnings. We won't. I actually just want to go... Commissioner Bennett White in a second? No, no, I won't. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I would like to go back. I just need to get a better... The Commission is trying to get a better understanding of COSC. And so... Mr Beatty, you seem to be one of the long-serving members of COSC at the moment. Would that be right? When did you first sit on COSC? Uh, it would have been um, 2013, 2014, Commissioner. Perfect. I would like to just ask you some generic cost questions because the Commission is trying to understand the evolution uh, of this. And so if I can go to please AFC 505.001.0151, please. And can we just go responsibilities of cost there, which the key, key functions are? So look at the, and, and I understand cost evolved because there was a there was a need to bring commissioners together and uh, and uh, appropriate representatives. And I just look at that. It says the key functions are to consider issues presented to ANZ, EMC, and uh, LCCS Council, provide high level considerations on strategic issues related to federal government and uh, federal departments. So strategic issues, develop national fire and emergency services capability and national initiatives. And it seems that it's a policy uh, committee. It's, uh, it's looking at those coordination issues, the policy and the like. Would that be the, from the time you were first there, your interpretation of it, Mr Beatty? I think that's a, a fair summation, Commissioner, although I, I would say that the focus has always um, attempted to be on the you know, operational uh, policy considerations. Yeah, no, I understand um, that. Yeah, and I think we've got uh, there is other evidence to talk about the operational aspects of policy development and the the like. Would that be the the, the way to summarise that? Uh, yeah, I think that's correct. Okay, if we can go then to let me just I'll jump a few steps and save you on this to HAF. 0005.0007.0213. So that first one I had was a meeting, I think, in, uh, in uh, 2014. This is a minutes of 24 July 2019. And if you just do the key issues for a starter, please, which is just slightly down that page. Do the key issues of a paper that was presented at that. And it talks about the terms of reference of COSC were reviewed, 
It says cost was developed to reduce representation from AFAC or developed to reduce representation from AFAC Council to jurisdictional representation or to facilitate effective operational considerations with the federal government. So I think we're moving a bit further right into operations. If we can go to the next page, please, which is 0215. And so the functions have grown here. And it's consider and influence operational issues to be presented, um, provide consideration operational issues. So to me now, if I understand that, and then a dot point further down, coordinate national operational matters during significant events. Cost changed from 2014 to 2019 through that, that time. Can you give a bit of background on the discussion that took COSC from a policy organisation to a policy and an operational uh, committee, please? I think, Commissioner, your observation that it has evolved over that period is um, correct. And um, in parallel with that, there was a number of uh, other bodies of work that uh, were undertaken. Uh, probably one of the most significant bodies of work related to uh, what's known as the Arrangements for Interstate Assistance, or the AIA, um, which uh, were developed uh, around 2013-14 um, with a view to harmonising the, um, those uh, protocols between the SES agencies, the fire services and the uh, land management agencies. Um, the AIA has had uh, successive evolution over that period as well, um, which has seen an you know, increased you know, focused on um, you know, a coordinated approach to the um, resource sharing uh, between jurisdictions. Um, it's also fair to say that the AIA is elevated to um, uh, COAG ministerial council levels with endorsement through ANZ EMC and um, I think it might have been the Law, Crime and Community Safety mm -hmm. Council at the time, but McPem now. Um, and so uh, perhaps in parallel with that evolution of the AI, we have seen an evolution in COSC. Um, and I think also the, uh, the introduction of new infrastructure in AFAC around uh, the NRSC, the National Resource Sharing Centre, and at its transition from being a, a centre for the coordination of international resources to one that takes a more holistic approach that deals with domestic deployments uh, as well as those uh, with New Zealand. Um, there's been a number of parallel uh, pieces of work that have perhaps uh, influenced this shift in um, roles and responsibilities for COSC. Okay, and so the quick and, and it's not available to me, it may be in the, the evidence, but as COSC evolved, was that signed off at ANZ EMC level or, did it, or was it signed off at AFAC board level? Uh, Commissioner, as I understand it, it was signed off uh, by the COSC with an uh, agreement to its um, change of terms of reference. Okay, so it's signed off at COSC level. Okay, if we can go to RCN, and this is a bit rehash of where Mr Glover was at. I just want to clarify something. Go to RCN.900.082.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.0.1.
um, Emergency Management Council, um, are generally not involved in operational uh, decision making. Okay. We have a, a forum through the, um, which is facilitated by uh, South Australia Police um, under our emergency management arrangements where um, cross coordination um, uh, of disasters and emergency events can occur within the state emergency centre. Um, but in terms of decisions to request resources um, and or deploy them, uh, those responsibilities are vested uh, by statute with the chief officers. Okay, and I appreciate that, and 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 I understand your your, your position and uh, and that authority that's been given to you. But I still can't understand who considers the overall risk to the state in an emergency in a broader sense. I understand your authorities and and with your particular force, which is an important force. But I I can't see how that gets factored into a state decision of about overall risk, and then who accepts that that overall risk. Well, again, I think it comes back to the uh, chief officer or the state controller that's uh, accountable for the emergency at hand. Um, if it was a wildfire or bushfire, then Mr Jones uh, would be uh, ultimately responsible for the resourcing within South Australia and the relative merits of personnel being deployed um, interstate. OK, so if I went to... And I'll just look at the different services. So the State Emergency Management Committee, uh, as Premier and Cabinet, Police, Health, Human Services, Planning, Environment, Education, Primary Industries, Local Government, Country Fire Service, SES, uh, or your team, Ambulance, Treasury and Finance, Security Emergency Management, uh, Intergovernmental. So all that's in the, in the committee. So Mr Jones has the authority to bring that together, all those aspects together, or all those aspects brought together at that committee? Um, during an emergency, Mr Jones, or, or any of the chiefs, depending on um, who's taking the lead, has the authority to bring together the resources uh, across government. Uh, those resources are provided as support agencies to the control agency, as functional support groups that will coalesce to provide different functional support to the uh, the control agency, or indeed if there's broader resource requirements, then we have arrangements that are in place where we can draw on resources across government, uh, as, we, as we've seen just recently with a public sector mobilisation policy that's brought together resources in support of the response to COVID-19. Um, but ultimately the state controller uh, for a particular event or emergency has that authority to bring together the resources uh, from across government. The South Australian Police and the Police Commissioner, in uh, his role as State Coordinator, uh, provides a very important support role to make sure that that, uh, that, that coordination um, occurs. So the acceptance of the overall risk to the state sits at your, your level or the various coordination level of bringing all those resources together? Yes. OK. If, if there's a decision then that you need international support or you need Commonwealth support, that decision making is vested in at your level. It doesn't have to go anywhere else. You, you can just request it uh, in accordance with the, the protocols. Um, I don't think it's quite as simplistic as that. So no, no, we do I have a range it never is, but yeah. No, 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 under a uh, com dis plan where if we're... Um, uh, looking to obtain resources from the Commonwealth, then our requests are serviced uh, to the Commonwealth through the Commissioner of Police mm -hmm. uh, in his or her role as State Coordinator. Okay. And uh, there's a set of criteria that we would apply um, in terms of testing the merits of that request. And largely they appeal to whether or not uh, jurisdictional resources have been exhausted and, and so on. Um, in terms of um, international resources, um, in my mind, it would be inconceivable that we would be requesting international resources without a conversation at the SEC, at the State Emergency Centre, mm -hmm. uh, with colleagues and with the Commissioner of Police in the role of State Coordinator. OK. Thank, thank you. I appreciate, appreciate that. Thank you for helping clarify the, the, the process. And I appreciate the background on COSC, having you, know, you being uh, one of the, the, the longer-term members. So thank you. Commissioner Bennett. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to go back to a couple of the um, first, just to a couple of matters that arose out of the hypothetical questions that were put by Mr Glover on the prioritisation issue. Um, the first thing, um, Ms Beattie, you, you referred to uh, guiding principles for resource prioritisation. Do I take it that um, you were referring, you might remember your answer and I haven't got it in front of me, but to the EMA's proposed principles? Because before that there weren't any principles in place, were there? I mean, formal principles in place. Yep, that, no, that's correct, Commissioner. Thank you. And then you are, in the, in the hypothetical, um, you were asked about how you would come about if there really were, if there really was this tension in a time of national disaster. And you said that you'd have to take into account the economy, the environment, critical infrastructure, and other matters that you um, you gave an example of. If the decision is made at the level of cost, how, with great respect to to the skill sets that you each have, um, as cost or the cost members have, how do the individual cost members? How do they? How are they able Able to make those decisions to take into account such big picture things as the state's economy um, and you know in critical infrastructure and environment and matters such as that in making that priority decision on the allocation of resources to another state. So the, the prioritisation guideline does provide a, a set of uh, principles around uh, priorities, but it also provides those various domains with which through which. Um, Different circumstances may be considered. But I mean, how you, I mean, um, if you if you're making the decision, um, and you've got to take into account, you know, it's a really big decision about, you know, you've got competing jurisdictions, these priorities coming in, national catastrophe, and the decision is being made at the level of of cost. And I mean, how how is it that a person who is the member of cost can properly make a decision taking into account? state economy issues and, and broader risk questions and overarching critical infrastructure? So, Commissioner, as I um, understand it, the guide is not intended purely as a um, tool for the COSC. It's contemplated that the framework would be utilised within existing uh, decision-making structures, including through the uh, NCC. Um, clearly, the COSC and members of the COSC could only make uh, decisions with respect to, you know, the uh, the resources and the um, and the perspectives that are held uh, by those agencies and the representatives within that forum. So, in that prioritisation um, hypothetical, what would you do if, if if you had to make that decision? In what terms you... of, it would be it would be highly highly contextual as to what the what the um, the choices were. Um, but the guideline has not been used in anger, so no. it's, um, it's difficult to speculate. Yes, no, I, I understand that. Okay, well, I'll leave that for the moment. I must say, I said I wasn't going to ask anything about the... Um, no, but I'm going to. Um, about the uh, warning systems. Can I just uh, bring up, please, RFS.5003.0001.05 to 9? And also, if you would, I must say only because I, ha I can't resist it, um, 5003.0001.0537. I shall take that one first. No, it's not the right page. Oh, that's the first one. Yes, all right, I'll, I'll do that one first. If you go to the bottom right-hand corner to the last paragraph on the page, my understanding in reading this, and I think you referred um, to the uh, amount of research that has been done, and I think, I think actually, um, Mr Jones, you said there's going to be more research done. Now, as I read the, this, this wonderful research presentation that was uh, from Metrics on July, in July 2019, the results of the survey was really that um, when you looked at uh, lots of going out to do surveys with lots and lots of people, and in the end it seemed to me as I read the results that... Um, it was fairly balanced. Some people liked one, some people liked the other. So I must say I'm not sure where further research will go because at some stage, you know, all this is going to do it again. And I'll come back to one of the questions. But it does say here that really, um, if you read that, it says to yield greater clarity and preference will require further quanti quantification using a condensed list, um, that e.g. providing only the top three preferences. Without definitive preference, we cannot guarantee that naming conventions will promote intuitive behavioural outcomes. Well, in the end, how much more research... If you've done thousands of people and they're fairly finely balanced, some like Watch and Act, some don't like Watch and Act, 
I mean, is further research? Do you really th is, do you really see the further research is actually going to to help? I I think it will have to be definitive this time. I'm not sure that it will. It seems to have been pretty well distilled down to the essence of the problem by this time. I can't see that we're going to come up with a list which will suit everyone. Well, exactly. So, so why so why engage in further in, in yet another survey? Uh, to ensure that all cost members uh, have their views fully consulted upon. But that's cost members, not not broader surveys. Because if I can go to the other page that I referred to which was um, 0537. I mean, the one that I must say intrigued me, if you're going to do a huge amount of research to get, for example, um, the ones on the right-hand side, that it, would be, it, it, it took a great deal of research and survey work to work out that for bushfires, perception of risk increases the closer distance to open bushland or grassland areas. I mean, you know, was, did that seriously, I mean, was that seriously commissioned and the one to distance to water that people's perception increases the closer they are to open water areas? I mean, is this the further sort of, I mean, is, is further research going down that path? I, find, I, I appreciate that surveys cover a lot of questions, but I mean, this, is, this has been many years in the researching and if it comes up to say that people's perception of risk increases as they get closer to bushland, um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, can you tell me why further research needs to be done to elaborate something like that? I, I was not the proponent of further research. <laughs> uh, I, I, however, I'm happy to take the question on notice as to what research was commissioned. Okay. And I know your prison. No, we will. Uh, we won't put you on the spot. I'm sorry. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to have to respond to that question. I suppose it was more just to point. I mean, I, it it was just that uh, to point that that one out. But what I'm really, I mean, the one I was really, um, I must say, uh, really wondering whether or not where research has happened that has clarified that the population at large is split. And if the purpose of the research is to understand what, what's going to be the most effective for, for people, I'm just, just wondering if you have a view as to whether or not it's worth engaging in further survey research or whether or not one makes a decision and then focuses one's time, energy and expense on education of the public as to the meaning of those terms. I absolutely concur with your last point. Eventually, we have to make a decision on what our terms will be and then fully educate those who will use those terms, the consumers of the, the warnings. Thank you very much. That's all I have. We appreciate that, Commissioner Jones. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. I know we're running late, so I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, I asked uh, Mr Waters from DFES this question. I'd like to ask Mr Jones the same question about resource prioritisation decisions, about resource sharing. Um, if you were, were to participate in a, in a cost decision about resource sharing, um, would you approach it as you apply the prioritisation hierarchy within your state, within South Australia first, and then uh, allocate the surplus? Or would you go to COSC and apply that resource prioritisation lens at a national level, as, I as if you were blind to the needs of, of South Australia? That's a hypothetical situation, Commissioner, but I, I would like to think uh, that contextually, whether we, we were to be recipients of support or donors of support would have some impact upon the, the process, the, the, the mindset I would adopt. Uh, I would like to consider altruistically that through the cost process, any assistance we were giving to other states could be an agreed outcome, notwithstanding that there'd have to be some discussions first. Yeah, I'm talking about those circumstances where, where South Australia is, is resource constrained and is then being asked to allocate resources. Because if you, if you take the resource prioritisation criteria on its face that's been put up by EMA, you could come to the situation where South Australia, for example, this would need to, if it was to act in accordance with that criteria, would need to allocate resources to, say, Victoria to protect critical infrastructure over protecting houses in South Australia. I just wondered whether that's really how you would approach the decision or you'd start with let's protect the interests of South Australia first and then um, and then allocate the surplus to help other jurisdictions. I'm, I'm bound uh, by, by my contractual employment to protect South Australia first. Yep. Of course the, the, the dilemma you pose 
is more or less solved for me within the country fire service. All of our firefighters are volunteers. I don't think it would be feasible to take volunteers when South Australia was already in a place of some crisis and request that we go to another state which was enduring a similar crisis. Yeah, thank you very much. And nice to see you again, Mr Jones. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Chief Executive Beatty, Chief Officer Morgan, Chief Officer Jones, and we appreciate your, your time. And, and we were talking about some hypotheticals, uh, but actually we're talking about some reality uh, as well. And uh, what we've had before is, you know, this is an unprecedented season, but it's not anymore. It's happened. And, uh, and so we're trying to understand how state decision making and cost decision making would fold up in a national sense so that we, uh, we can have coordinated decision making for national natural disasters. So I appreciate the time. Uh, Mr Beatty, thank you again because of your background on cost going back to 2013. You helped uh, solve a couple of uh, points for, for the commissioners and we appreciate that as well. Yeah. Mr Glover. I thank you. May the witnesses be released from their summonses. The witnesses may be released from their summons and thank you again for taking the time with us. We appreciate it. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. So, Commissioners, the next panel is a panel of emergency services leaders from Tasmania. Uh, first, um, we will hear again from Chief Officer Chris Arnold of the Tasmanian Fire Service, but we'll also hear for the first time from Mr Andrew Lee, the Director of the State Emergency Service. I call uh, Christopher Arnold and Andrew Lee. Chief Officer Arnold, good to see you again. And uh, Director Lee, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Good to be with you. Thank you, Commissioner. Both witnesses will take an affirmation. Mr Arnold, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I swear it. Thank you. Mr Lee, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your time today. Uh, Mr Lee, I might just start with you uh, first. Uh, because it's your first time giving evidence at the Royal Commission, um, I might just ask um, what role the SES plays in uh, COSC meetings? Um, Tasmania SES is not represented on COSC uh, as a full member. Uh, I have been to uh, cost meetings as an observer, such as the one on 31st of October last year, but uh, yeah, not a full member. Thank you. Uh, Chief Arnold, you are a member of COSC and uh, you attend meetings in the capacity of a member, is that right? As a jurisdictional member, yes, Mr Glover, that's correct. So most states have a jurisdictional member, states and territories, a few still have uh, service memberships, so SES by uh, a separate. Thank you. Does that mean you, um, in the circumstances where COSC would have to have a vote on something, uh, you would um, be the voting member from Tasmania? Uh, well, again, I'm not sure that we have ever done anything like have a vote on things. Uh, that wouldn't be uh, an equivalency from a jurisdictional approach, uh, if you like. It's, that's not how we do business. It's generally done more by consensus or agreement. And I cannot, frankly, recall ever having to vote in any critical circumstance over any critical jurisdictional matter. Thank you. Um, so we've heard some evidence already today that there are two types of COSC meetings. Um, the, the, there are the formal or usual meetings which happen three times a year 
and there are also the emergency COSC meetings, which are usually called at first at short notice to discuss resource requests. Is that right? Yeah, that's uh, that's correct. And and it's and my understanding is, Chief Arnold, you've participated in both of those types of meetings. Yes, that's, that's true. And if we have uh, an issue that may be related to Cyclone, uh, in that those telephone conferences, I'd invite Mr Lee to come with me. Thank you. So, so just, depending on what the emergency is. Yes, thank you. Um, just in terms of those um, emergency meetings that describe or discuss resource requests and resource sharing, does the COSC as a body make a decision about resource requests? Uh, I think the short answer to that is no. Uh, the resort, essentially how this operates is that a resource, um, so let me go back over. A cost meeting will give a summary of the overall situation around the nation, probably given by each jurisdictional representative. And then there'll be, there may, that will have been called, let us give for example, say it was called by Tasmania because we were looking for resources then we would, Tasmania would outline generally at that point what sort of resourcing it was interested in and other states would have commentary about their availability and then following that meeting, resource requests would flow to the respective states through a lower level working arrangements that we have within each jurisdiction. What are those lower working... Um, uh uh, working. What are those lower level working arrangements? Does is that a reference to NRSC as well? Uh, we could. We yes. Of late, we can use the NRSC. That's been the instrument we have used. Uh, otherwise, well, I've got people that work in state operations that uh, connect with other states, and we we send resource formal resource requests to fill them. But it gives you a sense of where which state may be able to provide the uh, resources that are being requested. Is that that? So the ultimate decision, and the, to be clear, so the ultimate decision is not a collective. The ultimate decision for resource <laughs> availability is the releasing or sending date. So when we get down to a fine point about the decision where I think you may be uh, interested, Council, is that uh, when it comes to the crunch about a resource, it is the holding state that needs to release it, and that's where this decision resides with uh, the Chief or Commissioner of that particular state. Thank you. I just want to ask you now some questions about how um, a risk assessment within Tasmania's emergency management framework is undertaken and how that is fed into the situational awareness briefs that are provided to COSC. So if it assists, uh, we have been using this table uh, this morning, RCN.900.094.0001. Um, and can you please enlarge when it comes up Tasmania's column and the COSC column. Uh, now, Chief... Uh, Arnold, I hope you can see that sufficiently. Um, and I should also make the caveat that obviously last fire season was not a particularly uh, bad one for Tasmania. Um, but obviously on the last occasion when you gave evidence, you told us it was the season before, in fact, that Tasmania required significant uh, assistance. Um, Yes, that, that's correct, Mr. Glover. So, what we see on the left-hand so side. The oh no! Please continue. I, I think uh, we, we we really are talking in the operational arena now. I think you can correct me if if I'm wrong. But uh, so, what happens is we work under an AIM system that aggregates up the resourcing needs to the state operations centre. I have an uh, intelligence cell that works in the state operations centre that develops a a state bushfire strategy that's signed off by the, 
that 3 8 is in, in the bushfire context, uh, Council, uh, that is signed off by the three uh, agencies, land management agencies and the fire services. So Parks, Sustainable Timber Tasmania and TFS. And that in that we have prioritised our fires and we have forecast our resourcing. We know through our AIMS system where we have incident management teams, they forecast their resourcing approximately two weeks ahead, uh, aggregate up through the regions, and then we have an availability table as well in our state operations centre that, that monitors just the routine calls. So we have a sense of what uh, is needed. The in, Intel group, group then look at the number of fires that we have across the state, the resources required to deal with those, and they'll forecast to me the need for, or pre predicted need for additional resources that we don't have within the state's capability. That is the time I'll be initiating uh, a request for a COSC meeting, uh, at usually a teleconference, uh, either through the AFAC CEO or uh, the Director General of VMA. Then the conversation goes, as I explained earlier, yeah. about what's the circumstance around the country and, and what's the resourcing that's required. Thank you. So when COSC will form a view about the resource sharing request, who does COSC answer to or who is COSC accountable to? Uh, COSC has, in my understanding, COSC doesn't have an accountability that we're, we're, we're accountable to our respective ministers where I'm charged with a responsibility for my state, not for the nation. Not, And that's not to say that over the last 15 years we have had a growing awareness of our national um, posture and what we need to do. And a lot of work's been done in that respect with lots of projects uh, and initiatives to uh, improve how that is done. But uh, COSC was formed as part of AFAC, uh, and its function was to look at these cross-jurisdictional arrangements. Primarily, that was its function. Mm -hmm. And now, um... and it's done under it's done under that. Uh, we have a, a, a pre-set agreement on how that will operate, which I'm sure you're aware of, as I've me we mentioned it before. Yeah. Um, so um, you're also on the board of AFAC. Um, at least until recently, the 17th of July, when a proposal to reposition COSC under ANZEMC was discussed. Um, in terms of reporting lines, COSC sat under AFAC, and so you're on the AFAC board. Was there any reporting done by COSC through to the AFAC board? Uh, in relation to operational decision making, no. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Uh, what, a, what about in relation to the other uh, types of decisions that COSC has regarding policy more generally? Um, usually, I, I can't recall one week where, where, again, it's an operational matter. The APEC board's focused on it, on you know, its company directors focusing on the business, not so much the operations and uh, I, I cannot recall an item other than the one you mentioned about where it might be positioned. I, I don't think there was particular resistance to uh, re repositioning uh, cars. And I could perhaps, uh, if, if you could indulge me for a moment, it, it reminds me a lot of my experiences in America, where in Boise, Idaho, uh, they have NIFSI, the National Interagency Fire Centre. And that reminds me a lot of cars, although it's uh, national. Uh, parks, uh, you know, Bureau of Land Management or or whatever, uh, national uh, groups. But the same sort of this uh, approach could be taken uh, along those lines where there is a, a collective of representatives that, are, uh, that do make these decisions and similarly go away and have people working in Boise that make the decisions about resource movements and the like. Um, so that is, that's done. Uh, I haven't been party to uh, some of the uh, private meetings, but their general meetings, I've seen them operate, and it's very, very much akin to what we do in COS. Um, in terms of um, COSC, then, and the recent proposal to reposition COSC under 
ANZEMC. I understand you were at the meeting of COSC that discussed this proposal. What's your understanding of what repositioning COSC under ANZEMC would achieve? I think that what would that would do would forge better linkages with the Commonwealth. Uh, COSC has got, uh, of course, as a co-chair, the, the Director General of EMA, and I think that if if uh, if in, and I don't know what the future will look like, of course, uh, and it might be guided a lot by the Royal Commission. But if there are resources available through the Commonwealth, and and we need those closer relationships uh, going forward, then that could be of great benefit. And. Uh, in, in making those collective decisions like we've spoken about already today. Mm, thank you. My understanding is that, at least presently, ANZEMC is more like a, uh, a policy type committee. It doesn't have any operational responsibility, but COSC has this operational responsibility with respect to requests for interstate assistance. Uh, do you have a view on how that would operate with the repositioning of COSC under ANZEMC? Uh, my view is that it might be better aligned with the Triple C. The, the, uh, the business associated with those three major meetings with COSC could fit well with ANZEMC, I think, and because it's yeah. you know, more working as one. But the actual operational element differs, and it's. I think uh, we need a strong uh, alliance with the Commonwealth, but nevertheless, not to confuse the operational setting with what we might call the more, more bureaucratic uh, or business setting. Uh, yes, thank you. It seems like, and um, you will have seen in the table before, the COSC meetings we've outlined are both the the regular three times a year meeting like the one on the 31st of October with those emergency COSC meetings that are called at short notice in through November and December. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, COSC is quite agile and uh, the, the group that's on there is well versed in making critical decisions um, that, that are expected, um, although their allegiance is to their state jurisdiction, uh, but they, they are very capable of uh, making decisions and have some a lot of empathy for other states. It's, it's, uh, I, I think where we're driving to is who, where, where is that overall um, control or direction? That is not that doesn't exist in in the sense that I think you may be seeking. Uh, yes, thank you. And I just might um, pick you up on that point about the essentially allegiance to the states. Um, is it the case that the, do I take from your reference to that in your answer that there's no overarching national interest type consideration? that's had regard to when these resourcing decisions are made? Uh, with COSP, we have, of course, uh, the Director General of EMA on that, and, and that, uh, I think you'd perhaps be better to speak with him about that, but there is a flavour of that that comes into discussions uh, that is often led by uh, Mr. Rob Cameron as the DG and co-chair, uh, but the, the essence of it is, is all the states or the jurisdictions are charged with the jurisdiction responsibility by legislation. So I, I will, will not release people or resources from, from this state uh, if I feel that I am exposing my own jurisdiction. I don't think anyone would do that. There are, of course, it is not quite that simple that, you know, we have to make a, a Solomon's decision about cutting the baby in half and we've got... We have a, a range of things that are occurring with the, the weather as it moves across the state. If we have adequate resources positioned around the country and we are monitoring, which we are, we monitor through NAFSI reports, through National Resource Sharing Centre reports, what the current situation is. Uh, we know that we might be able to move aircraft, which aircraft are most readily movable, uh, say from South Australia to Tasmania or something like that. 
for that we, we know where uh, our incident management team specialists could come from um, in, in sort of the deployment requests that we make. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm glad you mentioned NAFSI in that answer because I have a discreet question on NAFSI uh, to ask you uh, because um, you are the chair of the NAFSI Strategic Committee. The Royal Commission has been given a draft copy of the aerial uh, firefighting strategy that's been developed by NAFSI. I was just wondering, because the strategy was considered at a recent NAFSI meeting on the 21st of July, what's the current status of the strategy and are you able to assist the Commission with a timeline uh, for its further development? I think I might be able to, Mr Glover. Yes, the, it is in draft still. The document is in draft um, it is something that we've been that, that NAFSI has been working on for a short while. Uh, the strategy is really developed in two phases, like, and, and phase one is the basically it it explains the current arrangements, you, and you would see that from the document you have. It, that's that's really reflecting current arrangements, and uh, we'll use that as a springboard for uh, phase two, a future focused uh, document. It's been circulated at the moment uh, again for f uh, further consultation within the respective jurisdictions. Um, and uh, phase one's expected to be completed by September this year. Uh, phase two will be informed by current inquiries, uh, examinations of preparedness and response to, uh, to bushfires at state and federal level. So we'll do a little bit more work there, as well as a series of seminars which have already commenced. Um, and, and some stakeholder workshops that we'll do in July through to September. So we're looking to have a subsequent um, strategy document. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure exactly the date on when that'll, but that one would be finalised. Uh, but I could, I'm not certain that'll be before the bushfire season, which is now commencing in some states. No, I was, I was just going to ask. Uh, you we'll, have, we'll have a, we'll have a phase one. And we're engaging a consultant, a, a previous uh, Chief Officer of two fire services, Mr Ewan Ferguson, um, to help us through that uh, pro system. And I think we'll get a very good result, but it won't be uh, immediate. So I'll be looking at six months, but uh, potentially I can't give you a finer point than that. Um, to no, thank you very much um, for your comprehensive answer. Uh, gentlemen, I could obviously talk to you for considerably more time about these issues, uh, but I'm conscious of the time, so I might hand over to commissioners if they have any questions. Uh, no, we've, we've gone down a different path here, which is good. We've uh, got uh, a broader set of answers, and, and uh, Mr Arnold, uh, great... You're always good at cutting through the cutting through the chase and just giving the answer, so we appreciate uh, that. But I'll go to Commissioner Bennett if she's got a question. Probably on warnings, I'm thinking. No. No, no, no. no I well, I don't know. I think seeing. Um, well, actually, I suppose that's right. Um, bearing in mind that you, you know, you you do have a, a terrific insight, I have to say, and and. and you know, it's, it's wonderful to, to hear what your answers are. So I can't resist. What do, you, what do you think should be done about the national warning system and the timing of it? Ah, uh, the... Uh, and I'm, I'm, Mr Lee's got some involvement with this as well. We're all oh, that's together. called the, passing the buck. Uh, Good job. The, uh, not, not yet, Commissioner. So the, the national warning system has got a, a snag for us. Uh, we, it's, it's all... The research that's been done has been excellent as far as the, the behaviours and uh, how people see warnings, whether it be the symbology or the colours. What we've got, though, is, this, and we've broken it down and we want a national warning system to be consistent, so there's national harmonisation, uh, and that's good. Uh, but we've got a, a pinch point with the terminology, one of the terminology which we've used in bushfire, which is watch and act, which is confusing. When it, when it came to uh, cost last, uh, that there was a level of dissatisfaction in amongst cost members, myself included, uh, about that watch and act terminology. So there's advice, watch and act, and emergency warning are the three levels. The, the, the two on either side are okay, but we, but the research is telling us that it's unclear about uh, watch and act and what action 
people need to take or don't take that. So the research, which has been comprehensive, uh, uh, one of the most comprehensive um, uh, surveys done of, of the population. And, and as I uh, saw that survey, if I may interrupt, as I saw that survey, the population itself is split. Um, over, you know, what it prefers and what, and what it sees. So, seriously, I mean, I know everything in COSC, gen or generally speaking, everything is done by consensus. Um, is this one of those cases where there is not going to, there has not yes. been and there's not easily going to be consensus on this um, nationally so that someone's just going to have to make a decision? No, this will be, it's now being sent, ask the researchers to come back to us. I'm not sure the time frame, Commissioner, probably six, six months, do that research that we want where we saw the gap and that was the agreed uh, position at the end of the briefing, which uh, I, th I think that may have been in last at last December's uh, briefing. And we want we would like to see uh, that watch and act uh, terminology sorted out, so it's much clearer for the general public to intuitively know what they need to do. But isn't the way to sort it out for the general public is to pick something and then educate the public? Um, comprehensively exactly to what it means, whether it's Watch and Act um, or any anything else. I mean, you know, people, different parts of the country are used to different terminology. Why not just, I mean, is, there, is further research just kicking it down the road a little bit further? It's already been years. Um, it, you know, is, is, the answer, um, is the answer going to be just seriously, just take the view that, that, that there are people who are used to different things and, um, and to have a national system at some stage, you've simply got to make a decision of one and then educate the, edu just put out a really good campaign to explain to people exactly what it means. Yes, and, and there are alternatives to watch an act, which might be act now. Uh, so they're, they're the sorts of things that need to be considered as to, as to whether we want a different term that means something more intuitive because the confusion around watch, do we just stay and watch or do we act? Is, well, that's the problem. Again, let's, I mean, I understand. Well, then you'll have to educate people, won't you, as to who are used to watch and act, what act now means in contrast to watch and act what they're used to, or you adopt watch and act and you, and you educate everybody as to exactly that it means don't just stand around and look at it, but, you know, realise you've got to be um, actively watching and acting. I mean, it's an, it's an education thing, isn't it, really, rather than... Um, well, the members of COS sitting around and taking a, a, a survey that seems, as I've seen the results of the survey to date, equivocal. So uh, what we've looked at uh, is the survey has revealed that Watch and Act, despite our best efforts for education, is unclear still. So that is that is the problem with... So why do uh, more surveys? The, ...the education work. So why do more surveys? Uh, how they... I haven't, we haven't prescribed how the research will go ahead, Commissioner, as far as determining what the alternative to that middle warning would be. OK. OK. I think we've taken it as far as we can, but thank you very much. That was my fault. No, I I'm sorry, I don't think I can. So, yeah. um, uh, Chief Officer Arnold and, uh, and Director Lee, thank you for taking the time with us this morning. I note the ribbon bars on your left breast, so also take the chance to thank you for your service as well. I know one's Navy. I'm assuming, Mr Arnold, Army Reserve? Army Reserve, Commissioner, yes. Yeah. Almost 10 years. Yeah. Thank you. And thank, thank you good. both for your service and your ongoing service in the emergency uh, areas as well. Appreciate it. Mr Glover. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, made the... Um, witnesses be released from their summonses. The witnesses may be released from their summons. Thank you again, gentlemen. We appreciate it. Uh, if that's a convenient time, uh, it's uh, the lunch adjournment. It's a convenient time. We will take an adjournment until 1400 Canberra time. Thank you very much. All rise. Royal Commission has agenda till 2 p.m.
The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr Glover, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, this afternoon our first panel is from the Australian Capital Territory. I call Ms Georgina Whelan and Mr Rowan Scott. Commissioner Whelan and Chief Officer Scott, thank you for joining us again. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you both for your time this afternoon. Uh, Commissioner Whelan, I might start with you. As a fairly recent appointee as a head of an emergency... Oh, clear uh, oh, apologies, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> or the associate does. Uh, Commissioner Whelan will take an oath and uh, uh, Chief Scott will take an affirmation. Commissioner Whelan, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Chief of Officer Scott, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I think I was a little too eager to uh, start Very this eager evidence. after lunch. Uh, Commissioner Whelan, I might start with you. Um, as a uh, fairly recent appointee uh, to lead an emergency management agency, can you just share with us your views on COSC and how it operates, specifically having regard to its operational function in relation to dealing with requests for interstate assistance? Uh, thank you, Mr Glover. In thinking about that question, um, I suppose I'd like to break it down to three areas. Uh, as the Commissioner of the Emergency Services Agency here in the ACT and as a member of COSC, and I look at my authority to give direction and make decisions, my accountability for giving direction and making decisions, and then the responsibilities to implement those. Um, it is my view that uh, whilst COSC is an invaluable forum for us to come together, uh, provide each other with advice, situational awareness, mentoring and recommendations, um, it is my view that... Uh, COSC um, could be challenged in terms of authorities and accountabilities when it comes to prioritising and making decisions um, as we move forward in the new normal with regards to prioritisation of resources and allocation of assets. Um, just uh, picking you up on that expression, new normal, what do you have in mind when you use that phrase? If we listen to uh, the commentary that's come through from uh, the last bushfire season and the use of the word unprecedented, uh, the last season uh, in terms of the, um, the breadth, the complexity and the rate in which we were all responding to bushfires uh, may have been unprecedented. But, of course, the narrative around what uh, the community our scientists, research is telling us is we need to start being prepared for that kind of unprecedented event to potentially increase and be more likely into the future. In the past, I think we've been very, um, very fortunate that as our seasons start very early in the north and then work their way almost in a clockwise direction around our country, we've been able to almost leapfrog our resources from one state to another. And this is where COSC and the NRSC have been invaluable in when the states are sharing information as to resources they are willing to make available as we leapfrog around the country or we may be dealing with one or two jurisdictions that have concurrent events, uh, we've been able to balance out the resourcing. Um, but if we are to even consider that 20% of what we're being told may be what the future we can expect and should be prepared for is, 
uh, which is far more concurrent activity and complexity to what we're dealing with, it may come a time when we are not able to flex those resources as successfully as we have and we may need to make decisions around both firefighting assets and aerial firefighting assets into the future. And when you talk about decision making, um, about those assets into the future. We've heard evidence this morning that COSC operates on a consensus basis, so there are never any votes in COSC. What's your view about how that consensus decision-making model will function when there is a need to allocate scarce resources in future natural disasters? Well, I think that is the that is the wicked problem that um, I'm hoping this Royal Commission may point us in the right direction in terms of consideration as to what we will do. Um, I don't have a criticism of COSC in the way it has operated um, in the past, but I'm not sure based on its consensus approach, which is very good when it comes to networking and sharing professional ideas and interests. But when it comes to, as I mentioned earlier, having authority and accountability, um, I'm not sure it has the, the, the setup that is required to support that kind of critical decision making. What it is, however, is an excellent, excellent forum to be providing information to those individuals or organisations that are authorised to be making those critical decisions. Uh, thank you. It seems that, and we heard evidence to this effect um, earlier today, that obviously when COSC was first established and created, it was really to be that forum for the exchange of ideas as a way to liaise with the Commonwealth Government by having the Director General of Emergency Management Australia as the permanent co-chair. Um, but but over time, it also gained this operational function, which it discharges through these emergency uh, meetings. Um, so I just wanted to ask uh, uh, Chief Scott, can you just give us a quick run through from your experience of attending those COSC emergency meetings, how that happens? Um, which cost meetings are you relating to? I've only been in position since April. Oh, I might need to talk. Yes, but I understand you attended COSC meetings on the 19th of November and the 6th of December. Uh, that would have been as a proxy for Chief Officer uh, Jay Murphy at the time. Yeah. So that was um, from um, recollection of some of those meetings. Uh, that would have been where we're discussing our capability to deploy interstate um, and our likelihood of uh, needing assistance and also our um, our current status as to our uh, resource um, stretching within the ACT and also as we deploy interstate. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Whelan, can I come back to you and just ask, in terms of those emergency COSC meetings, when operational type decisions are made about the sharing of resources. Um, who is COSC respons or responsible or accountable to when those decisions are made? Uh, that is the challenge. I'm, I'm not sure who they are accountable to. Um, it is my view that uh, as COSC has transitioned from an organisation that uh, is a collaborative framework for learning and sharing and has now moved in to fill the gaps, there was obviously a void uh, across um, our, the emergency services to be able to come together and get situational awareness of what the national resource picture was um, so that we could take, if required, either a jurisdictional approach or a national approach, um, it served very well. But in a time of crisis where a decision may have to be made to prioritise, that's why I come back to terms of accountabilities and responsibilities. I, I'm not sure cost actually is authorised. I represent 
the Emergency Services Agency of the ACT and I represent my jurisdiction and I'm going to fight to the death for the resources that my jurisdiction requires and bid very hard uh, to win those resources. Um, and as a, as a good uh, citizen and colleague, where I have resources that are available, I'm going to make cost aware of what resources I'm willing to make available to deploy interstate. But ultimately, I'm not authorised to make decisions on whether one jurisdiction is more worthy of a resource than another. And in that respect, um I wanted to sort of ask you, what's been your experience of whether COSC is making decisions on a jurisdictional basis? And that has probably been the way it's historically unfolded. But in a future where we see a competition for resources among jurisdiction, there seems to be no... Uh, uh, requirement, indeed it could be contrary to state requirements to consider the national interest. What's your view on that? Uh, look, and I think that's where uh, what we have to start thinking about is what is the new normal versus what we have experienced in the past. I think we are moving into uh, an environment um, and a future where we have to actually think about the fact that COSC is, was not designed, nor is it set up to be able to look at what is in the interest, of, what is in the national interest, um, and certainly wouldn't have the transparency or, I think, the legal framework under which it could be operating under such circumstances. It may be that COSC is an ideal um, um, organisation to provide situational awareness, make professional recommendation and advice, but certainly not making decisions about the national interest versus a jurisdiction, I would imagine. Uh, thank you. Um, we've heard some evidence already today about um, COSC making those decisions, but then the decision, the ultimate decision residing with the particular jurisdiction to share the, or not share the resources. But it doesn't seem that there's ever been that ultimate decision, uh, in fact, ever exercised. Uh, it, what's your view on where the decision should rest in relation to interstate assistance? My view is, and this is not a criticism of COSC, it's just uh, in a, a way of uh, looking into the future as to how we may best operate to optimise an outcome for both, an optimised outcome for both jurisdictions and in the national interest. Um, in my view, that would be through EMA, through ANZ EMC, uh, potentially as a conduit for us to be able to do that. Noting that ANZ EMC in the past has really focused on policy, it doesn't mean we couldn't look at how ANZ EMC may be able to operate more um, productively into the future. I mean, I just look at the reference material that both COSC or the NRSC and EMA provided over summer. In fact, for me as a commissioner to get a good picture of what was happening nationally, um, for want of a better term, in terms of planning and preparing for what our needs may be, where our shortfalls may be and what may be available nationally to support the ACT, I actually looked at a combination of both NRSC data, which was very um, instructive, but also the Triple C daily reports. It was a combination of the two documents that gave me the visibility I needed to be briefing my minister. And so what did the Triple C documents give you that you weren't getting from COSC meetings? Um, so when, when I look and I compare them, uh, what the Triple C was giving us was a state narrative. So it, it was about not only availability or, or what resources that they were willing to make available, um, which is the very collegiate and collaborative approach that we've always taken through COSC, but it also gave us a narrative so we could actually see what the operational environment was that they were operating under. It gave us a seasonal view, sorry, not a seasonal view, it gave us an up-to-date view of all of those critical inputs into that kind of decision-making, what the weather patterns were like, what the operational activity was like, where the resources were, where ADF assets were currently deployed. It gave us, um, in a military parlance, a really good sense of force disposition nationally. Um, and so in my mind... Uh, that document in and of itself was no guarantee of resources. It was informing our decision-making. 
And as you are aware here in the ACT, whilst we do work through the NRSC, we also have very, very good uh, memorandum of understanding with New South Wales and the four local government areas. So it was giving my team, particularly uh, my incident controllers and my planning staff, um, a more comprehensive view using both documents as to what we had, what and what may be available in terms of resources to support us if our worst-case scenario was realised as a consequence of the bushfires. Mm, thank you. And um, certainly uh, uh, none of the questions um, I am asking should be intended to be taken as a, uh, any criticism of COSC. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you, in the ACT context, you have very good uh, bilateral arrangements with New South Wales and my understanding is that bilateral arrangement is actually carved out of COSC's um, resource sharing arrangements because that's a cross-border arrangement because, of course, the ACT is an island. Uh, so typically when we use the MAA for deploying either cross-border or getting resources into the ACT, that doesn't go through the National Resource Sharing Centre or through COSC arrangements. That's done at the, the very low level between um, the local fire management zones and the ACT. I think one of the benefits for us with COSC has been, uh, and I could say this as a new, as a new commissioner, um, is that the, the mentoring and the advice you can receive from your colleagues across COSC is absolutely um, invaluable. But, of course, in addition to COSC and the NRSC, we do have our bilateral relationships with New South Wales. Yes, thank you. And I should just pick up on the, the current structure of COSC has, of course, as its permanent co-chair, the Director-General of EMA. Um, does that um, position not really provide any Commonwealth situational awareness um, regarding sort of forced disposition or availability of Commonwealth resources or assistance? Uh, well, the Crisis Coordination Centre and the reports we get do come out of EMA. So, in that sense, yes, it does. And obviously, DG EMA um, gives us uh, situational awareness, like a verbal update, um, but then produces, um, you know, Crisis Coordination Centre documentation that gives us the detail behind the verbal briefing that we may get through COSC. I mean, it really wouldn't matter whether it was a cost briefing or an EMA briefing. Ultimately, what we need to be doing is bringing together representation from all of the jurisdictions to provide situational awareness and updates on what's happening so that an organisation, it would be my preference that it would be EMA over cost, can actually provide the national picture um, and allow risk assessments to be undertaken in a transparent way if, in the end, at the end of the day, we come to having to make a critical decision around where resources may have to be allocated. Uh, yes, and just in relation to that last point you mentioned, um, I take it from the way you're answering the questions, you have not had any personal experience from the ACT perspective of being outbid, and I don't think anyone has ever been out bid for resources, is that right? Look, I've only had one season, so I actually will provide my response in context. Um, we have not been outbid. However, we have had some um, robust conversations uh, around availability of resources, not so much in the firefighting space. Um, we have had um, some discussion with representatives from the NRSC that sit as liaison officers, where um, it was the view of a liaison officer that my request for resources was excessive. Um, and we had to have some conversations around what that meant for me as the commissioner versus an NRSC liaison, uh, providing their advice or recommendation to my re to my request. Um, so that was a one-off. However, where it does become tricky is in the aerial firefighting capability. Um, and you've seen from the email traffic from what has been subpoenaed into the Royal Commission over Christmas where there was significant correspondence um, in relation to where the additional aircraft should be located over summer. Um, and at one case, we put a very strong bid forward for an aircraft here in the ACT and we had invested heavily in an airbase. Uh, but it was the view of others that that aircraft would be better served in another state. 
Now, ultimately, uh, we were allocated that aircraft, but I think it would have been a very interesting conversation um, if uh, another decision um, had have been made at the time. So we've never got to that point, but certainly there was the potential for that to occur. And so then, looking forward, if there's a circumstance where there is that bidding war, how would the current cost structure resolve that bidding war just based on your experience? I don't think it would be able to um, in, a, in, a, in a manner that would be um, transparent. Oh, no, transparent is a poor choice of words because COSC is, is very transparent. Um, it's almost a blunt instrument. Everybody's very honest and open with each other. Um, I don't think we have the governance arrangements in place that could assure that um, a risk assessment uh, was undertaken to an extent that our political leaders would be comfortable with. And so do you think there's a role for, in that context of risk assessment, um, elements of the national interest to be involved? Because, as I think you said before, um, sent made comments to the effect that there aren't really those national interest considerations involved at present? Uh, there is but certainly the potential for that. And the reason why I say that is not because of actions of the past or experiences of the past, but where we may be going into the future and the fact that um, we do not have untapped resources. There are limitations to what is available from both uh, an aircraft sense, uh, the rate of effort that is required to respond to competing priorities and concurrent um, events. And I think we need a more structured and transparent approach when that critical decision has to be made. And I don't think that should be made by um, an organisation such as COSC. <coughs> Thank you. So I just want to talk to you now about the current proposal, which is to reposition COSC out of AFAC and under ANZEMC. What's your view about that proposal? Um, my view is that um, as the most junior member of COSC, and I will highlight that, um, I think one of the, the key issues for us is that there is... Um, over a century worth of experience that makes up the cost membership. And it's not something uh, that should be um, underestimated or devalued. And so it is my view that we come to an organisation or a, uh, a forum such as COSC bringing, representing both our jurisdictions and bringing with us um, the level of experience and maturity that we've got across our industry. And that is invaluable for ANZ EMC. And I believe that there is a way in which cost could both inform and be an asset to ANZ EMC, but should not be the decision-making forum. So, so what should be the decision-making forum, in your opinion? <laughs> should have um, more experience in, in law, but I don't. Um, my, my view is that um, something like ANZ, EMC, and then up through McPem would be the way in which we could be making decisions. And of course, um, and I talk about an authorising environment, so being authorised to make decisions, it may be that those critical decisions should be uh, made in an, in an authorised ANZ, EMC environment. And just on ANZ, EMC, my understanding has been that, that it is more in the nature of a policy committee and it's not operationalised at the moment. Do you think there will be any or there would be any challenges if COSC provided advice to AM, ANZ EMC and then up through MECPEM for those operational decisions? Uh, no, I don't because there's quite a triplication of conferencing at the moment. And so um, in order to address the triplication of conferencing over summer, we ended up either running a COSC or a triple C. And so in my mind, I think the mechanisms are already there for us to streamline that flow of information and that passage of advice. 
um, I don't think there would be too much of an impediment to being able to uh, restructure or expand the role of ANZ EMC to facilitate that advice for operational decision making. We already come together for cost. Why would we not come together for ANZ EMC? Uh, and I might ask you there, um, because of the triplication, but... Um, from the table I have been showing uh, other emergency management leaders, um, we know that there was an NCC Triple C meeting on the 11th of November, and there was also a COSC meeting on 11 November, and you attended both. Were they were they one after the other sequentially, or because my, on my understanding, you could basically have had the two meetings at the same time? I'd have to check my diary entry. I don't recall whether they were back-to-back, -to, -back, to be honest with you. Um, but, yeah, the bottom line is I think I, I've actually made a comment in the past. We're actually talking about the same thing at the various meetings. And when you have a pre-brief, particularly in our planned meetings rather than our operational ones, it, in, in, in a sense, we are covering almost the same material. Yes. Now, don't get me wrong. What COSC is fantastic for is the devil in the details. That deep dive professionalisation, you know, some, some of that technical policy development, uh, the professionalisation schemes that we're running, the sharing of ideas, the focus on industry representation is absolutely invaluable. Uh, but there, the, I do not think it would be that difficult to be restructuring what the, the separate organisations should be leading on. Thank you. Just in relation to that policy of COSC's operations. We've heard a bit about the warnings and in particular the, the meaning and what people's views are of what should act. Do you have any views you'd like to share with the Commission about um, uh, fire danger ratings and warnings? It is a... Um, when you are a consensus sort of led organisation, uh, it's always going to be difficult to get, you know, all of the jurisdictions in the room to absolutely agree to the nth degree um, on, on, on issues such as warnings, which is why we still don't have an outcome and I think we're still some months away. What we have focused on in the ACT is that we are broadly comfortable with the direction. And so we've been focusing on some research we um, commissioned through the Queensland University of Technology because our view is that what we should be focused on is how we educate the community to be better understand and optimise whatever warnings we do all eventually agree upon. Because I don't think we're going to get to a point where every jurisdiction is happy with absolutely everything. So our focus has been on how we can effectively communicate and educate our community so that those call to action when required based on the warnings are as effective as they can be. And if I understand your answer just then, what the intention with your community education uh, work is designed to do is whatever COSC comes up with, you want to be in a position where the community is best educated about that. Absolutely. And, and it's not that we... I mean, we've, we've obviously shared our views through the various working groups um, on the warnings. And so you get to a point where when you're not violently opposed to it, you focus more on the education rather than wordsmithing. Now, it's a, it's a very big issue. I'm not making light of the warnings and how much work has gone into it. But I think you do get to a point where you've got to make a decision um, and then act on that. Yes, thank you. And I don't wish to steal Commissioner Bennett's thunder, but Chief Scott, I might just ask you, what is your own view on those, that devilish phrase, watch and act? Uh, we just have spoken with our media people earlier on today that they actually took a different approach this year. There was a high and a low watch and act. Um, so one was more an advice for us internally and the high level watch and act was where we would call the community to uh, take action. Um, personally, it can be seen as different way. That it, it could be a, a conundrum. Do you watch? Do you act? Um, so it, it comes down to that very strong um, messaging, which we do very well here in the ACT, and get it out to the community. We've got a very good following within our social media, and the messaging that goes out is quite comprehensive. And we actually trial different templates for this season uh, to get a better message out to the community. 
Uh, this is where the QUT research was very helpful for us because I, I think we did have a very effective communication uh, platform this season. Thank you. Um, thank you both for your evidence. I, I'm conscious I could speak to you for several hours more, but I'm, I'm conscious of the time and that the commissioners may have some questions for you. Uh, so, the commissioners, those are my questions. No, I think uh, after this morning and to, to now, very, very concise. We appreciate the answers. Uh, Commissioner Bennett, you have a, a question? I have one, and it's not about the Watch and Act or the, the, um, the warning system. I think thank you very much for your, your responses to that, which I found extremely helpful. And um, logical. Um, I have another question for you, though, Commissioner I might. I mean, uh, it goes like this: you, you were asked a lot about your opinions about the cost and how it worked and how it might work in the future. We've also heard a lot of evidence about how successful the cost has been in the past in providing interjurisdictional resources. You've also spoken, and, and obviously this is part of what this commission is about, looking at what the prospects might be in a new national or an existing and going forward national disaster scenario. Do you think, now that we've asked for your opinion on, on a lot of things, do you think that there is a... Um, that one, one possibility would be um, that the existing system of, you know, uh, jurisdictional uh, service-oriented collaboration would work in um, certain stages. Because what we've identified is a real issue that can arise, as you've spoken about, where you actually get competing priorities. But prior to that stage, prior to, let's say, the state of emergency, either a state-based state of emergency or a national state of emergency, whatever was relevant, that the existing system could continue and that it got elevated into a different um, uh, decision-making... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the word framework... Uh, decision-making... Architecture. Arch <laughs> there are all these wonderful words that I'm, you know, more and more Canberra-based words. Um, uh, you know, but you, you do it differently where um, the sort of uh, priority considerations come in where you're really making decisions that go beyond the actual... Um, what's the word? Uh, providing the resources. You know, that, that sort of... What, there's a, uh, I'm thinking about an army thing, putting the troops on the ground, um, you know, where it's not just a question of I've got this resource, I can send it to that jurisdiction, there's no other considerations, I've got it, I'm fine, there's only one jurisdiction that needs my help, we talk to each other, if we haven't got an MOU, if we have, that's fine, if we haven't, we just talk, and we, we share those resources collaboratively as it's happened in the COSC in the past. Do you see it possible, practically speaking, there could be that two-stage sort of <coughs> program? I, I think... It is possible if we learn from the past but, but focus on the future. And by that I mean um, the collaborative nature under which we have operated in the past has been very effective because we have never gotten to a point where uh, a decision had to be made about prioritising one jurisdiction over another. But if we are to learn from what we have um, experienced in the past and apply that in what I call the new normal, uh, what we called last season unprecedented, I think uh, it demands us to think about a, a two-stage approach and how we um, can feed into that system and inform that system. Because ultimately, um, what, I, what I advise the NRSC of is availability. Um, I'm not sitting back going, oh, I'm deciding to give you 50 for South Australia and 50 for Queensland. I'm just telling the NRSC that I have 100 firefighters that are available. So it's and so at some point, however, someone may have to decide where they go over the over another jurisdiction. Yeah, I understand that, but I think I think I was looking at two stage approach in a different a different context. I understand that completely, and that makes sense. Oh, okay. What I was Sorry. thinking about was the existing system of offer and acceptance of resources between um, commissioners, that that can work um, as long as there's no other competition for those resources. Yeah. But, but that... But that then, when competition does kick in and you, get, you enter what, what I think has been referred to as a bidding war or something like that, that's when the decision is taken um, by someone with a different perspective, perhaps. A more, a more global perspective. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yeah, thank absolutely. No, thank you very, very much indeed. I, I, I've appreciated your evidence very much. Thank you, Commissioner McIntosh. Yeah, I might just quickly. Uh, Commissioner Whelan, just to clarify, the way I've interpreted what you said about resource prioritisation decisions is that 
Um, you apply the life property environment criteria in the ACT first. If there's a surplus, then you offer those resources up to the national level to be shared. Yep, I take your yes. Oh, absolutely. And then beyond that, obviously, we look at our critical infrastructure uh, and resourcing that may be required over and above for that as well. Yep. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, part of that um, resource allocation, we, we have to look at a uh, week to two weeks out as well at potential weather impacts on the ACT. Um, if you refer to the uh, strategic planning report that was done in December, the ACT actually withdrew commitment to other jurisdictions for a couple of weeks. Uh, we were reaching that critical mass and we then pot had potential threats to uh, the Territory with elevated fire dangers as well. Yeah, understood. It's, so you, it's not only the current uh, pressure on the resources, it's the prospective pressure that you're seeing coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So it's not so much that we would be comfortable being directed to offer up resources. It would be about the resources we offer up that, uh, you know, a, a second tier may, have, may make the decision on them where they are directed to. Yep. Thank you both. Thanks, Chair. No, that's good. I've got no further questions either. Uh, thank you. Oh. May the witnesses be uh, released from their summonses. <coughs> Commissioner Will and Chief Officer Scott, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate, as always, the clarity uh, of your information and uh, you are released from your summons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioners, the next panel we will hear from this afternoon comprises representatives from Queensland. Uh, I call uh, Greg Leach, Commissioner of Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, and Mike Wassing, Deputy Commissioner of Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Commissioner Leach, Deputy Commissioner Wassing, thank you. Appreciate you joining us. Commissioner Leach. Commissioner. Commissioner Leach will take an oath and Deputy Commissioner Wassing will take an affirmation. Commissioner Leach, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Wassing, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, welcome back, Commissioner Leach. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Wassing, I might start with you. Uh, in particular, um, uh, I understand that you um, called for the um, uh, a meeting of COSC in your role as acting commissioner of QFIS um, on the 9th of September 2019. Can you just describe for the assistance of the commission how you go about calling an emergency COSC meeting? Uh, yes, certainly. So in my role at the time as Acting Commissioner, uh, we, and it's probably for context if I very briefly outlined the fact that in later August into early September we had the uh, start of some of the more significant fire events, uh, which uh, at that time we already had cross-border uh, operations with New South Wales. So preceding any formalisation of a request for cost to meet and establish the National Resource Sharing Centre arrangements. There was ongoing conversation between myself and Commissioner, then Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons for the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, um, as well as uh, conversations with uh, the CEO, uh, Stuart Ellis, and uh, Home Affairs, Rob Cameron, just from a situational awareness perspective, uh, which is something that we would uh, commonly do in terms of uh, common operating picture or sharing information. It's very clear. Uh, in early September, the situation, both in terms of fire and fire risk, uh, the situation more broadly was escalating. Um, and it was that time I spoke to Stuart Ellis in terms of uh, requesting the cost to meet 
with the intention of establishing a more formal arrangement for resource sharing, being the National Resource Sharing Centre. Thank you. Um, Deputy Commissioner Wassing, I might just bring up the table um, of jurisdictional meetings and COSC meetings that I've been showing to other witnesses today because that will give, hopefully, the commissioners um, some idea of the uh, fire situation that was affecting Queensland at the time. Uh, so, Operator, if you enlarge the left-hand side of the page so we can see Queensland and COSC... Um, so I hope you can see that, gentlemen. Uh, not just yet. <laughs> uh, yes, we can now, yes. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I, I shouldn't say this, but I will, that uh, it must be that barristers' chambers in uh, Brisbane are bigger than those in Sydney. Um, uh, if we look there at Queensland, um, we see uh, the red is meant to identify uh, uh, fires that were burning throughout Queensland in that time. And Deputy Commissioner Wassing, this is the time when you were Acting Commissioner of QFAS? Yes, that's correct. Um, I just want to ask you, um, because I've asked other uh, witnesses this, but we see um, on the top in the green uh, the reference QDMC. Now, that's the Queensland Disaster Management Committee. That committee is chaired by the Premier, is that right? Yes, that is correct. Uh, chaired by the Premier and has... Uh, the ministers, uh, so effectively a whole of government approach with the ministers at the table, yes. And so we see there that the QDMC met throughout the period of 7 to 15 September and then again on 24 September. Does that indicate to us that QDMC was involved in uh, Queensland's response to the bushfire crisis that it was experiencing at the time? Yes, that's correct. So during that time, because of the tempo, the escalation of the events and our uh, formal activation of the disaster management arrangements, um, that uh, the Queensland Disaster Management Committee, um, either face-to-face uh, -face or on occasion, um, often meets uh, by phone or by teleconference, uh, met on a regular basis during that, uh, that during that period in terms of supporting the uh, the broader whole of government approach to the response arrangements across Queensland. Thank you. And so uh, you gave evidence before that on the 9th of September a COSC meeting was called. We have the minutes of that meeting and it shows that you were an apology for that meeting, but I understand that thereafter Queensland made a formal request for assistance through COSC, is that right? Uh, sorry, could I just clarify the question here? A formal request through COSC in terms of resources? Yes. Clarify that. Yes. Uh, yes, so uh, during that period of time, uh, as you can see from the, the, uh, the events and the nature of the bushfires, certainly there was an escalation of our uh, fire intent, the number of fires and certainly the size of those fires, requiring further escalation of resource requirements. And uh, so through the um, National Resource Sharing Centre arrangements, um, we sought specific capabilities to support our uh, Queensland response to those fires. Thank you. And uh, commissioners, just for completeness, those letters I showed the South Australian witnesses before relate to this request from Queensland. So, Deputy Commissioner Wassing, I understand that how that request for assistance was actioned was that South Australia provided uh, some assistance to Queensland and deployed personnel to Queensland to assist with the bushfires. Is that right? Sorry, Mr Glover, your audio dropped out there just at the start. Could you please repeat the question? Uh, yes. Um, so, um, the request for assistance was actioned um, in a way that saw South Australia providing some assistance to Queensland and deployed personnel to Queensland to assist with the bushfires. Is that right? 
Uh, yes, that would be consistent with my recollection. Thank you. Um, just in terms of your experience, Deputy Commissioner Wassing, um, can you just um, tell us what your view of to whom COSC is accountable to or responsible to? Uh, certainly. So my experience with COSC in my acting commissioner role or on occasion representing the commissioner for Queensland Environmental Services has been one of what I would describe as a uh, collaborative environment um, as a, uh, a subset of um, AFAC. And uh, the, uh, I suppose whilst beyond just the terms of reference in terms of its meeting and cost arrangements is uh, my experience has been one of uh, more of a, an operational setting in terms of the um, uh, arrangements in terms of whether it be in this case the escalation to a national resource sharing centre arrangement for resource deployments across the state, um, but also going into other areas that are predominantly operational and, and uh, in tempo. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Leach, I might turn to you now um, because I previously asked you some questions on your earlier appearance about the COSC arrangements, but I just wanted to get um, your point of view, um, noting that you commenced as CUFA's commissioner in early December, but prior to that time you had been part of um, COSC from time to time in your roles at MFB. Um, in your view and experience, to whom is COSC accountable or responsible for? Um, so, as Mr Wozing said, COSC uh, is a subcommittee of AFAC. Um, and so, in a governance sense, it sits under the AFAC umbrella. But it has relationships, for example, to EMA uh, through the Director General of EMA, who sits as a member of COSC. So, whilst its um, governance sits within AFAC, it's a it's a broader collaborative forum across the strategic emergency management network, if you like. So, um, in terms of it sitting under cost, uh, sorry, sitting under AFAC. Does that mean it was accountable to AFAC prior to this recent pre -pos repositioning we've heard about? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, AFAC as a uh, not-for-profit organisation, if you like, um, as a sector body representing the fire and emergency services across Australasia, um, over time has seen a need to play a role in the more strategic operational space, which was how COSC was formed, so the leaders of the various services coming together for issues such as the sharing of resources across jurisdictions for significant operations. And so in terms of AFAC itself, AFAC's a company limited by guarantee, a not-for-profit. Um, who, who is AFAC accountable to in that broader sense? Um, well, I'd say AFAC is responsible to the various agencies uh, that are members of the emergency, foreign emergency services sector um, that have created AFAC, if you like. Yes, thank so it's you. It's a collaborative, yeah. Oh, no, please continue. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's fine. I was just going to say it's a, it's a collaborative forum. So it, its original genesis was around sharing best practice um, uh, specifications and the like across the sector to, to achieve best practice and efficiencies and over time it has moved into playing this uh, strategic operational role as the need has grown. And just in your experience, um, is it likely that that role or perhaps that that need for interstate assistance will only get bigger or more looking into the future? I think that's a reasonable assumption. If you look at what's happened in recent years, as, as our ch climate changes and evolves across Australasia and the, the nature of the 
hazards and events that we deal with become more prolonged, so the duration, the intensity, the frequency of them, uh, we're seeing events that more often exceed the capacity of a single jurisdiction to deal with. So the sharing of resources across jurisdictions has increased over the last couple of years. And if the climate projections are accurate, you'd suggest that that will continue to increase in the future. Uh, thank you. Um, you are um, undoubtedly aware of the proposal to move COSC from AFAC to ANZEMC. Uh, now, I know, uh, Commissioner Leach, you didn't attend that COSC meeting, but Deputy Commissioner Wassing did. Uh, so I wonder if I'll ask Deputy Commissioner Wassing first what his view about that is. And uh, Commissioner Leach, feel free to add anything uh, when Deputy Commissioner Wassing has finished. So Deputy Commissioner Wassing, because you were at that meeting where the repositioning of COSC uh, was discussed by the COSC. Um, what is your view about the intention behind that move? I think uh, it's very important to understand the context of both forums as they currently exist. So AMZ, ANZ and EMC uh, is fundamentally more of a policy um, setting uh, environment, uh, obviously with a different membership in, in many respects as well. Um, that requires a certain decision-making process in, in one of consensus and has a broader representation than what you would see in COSC. Uh, COSC, uh, having said that, COSC is one of more of an operational uh, environment in terms of the dealings that uh, COSC currently deals with, would be my experience. Uh, very effective in that sense, but they are very different things. So um, the timings required of a policy decision uh, to come to a policy decision on certain matters versus an operational decision um, probably would uh, importantly remain somewhat separate um, just given the requirements in terms of timing around certain decision making. That's not to say the cost couldn't be a subset of ANZ and EMC, um, but uh, in their current arrangements, the, I would suggest that uh, the current role of cost would need to be reviewed with that in mind. Thank you. I was going to ask you about the policy nature of ANZEMC, and do you think that that proposed repositioning of COSC under ANZEMC would actually result in opera operationalising um, ANZEMC, or would it still be the case that the decisions about resource sharing, those ones that take place at the emergency short notice meetings, would be done by COSC itself? Uh, the, the, the current sort of resourcing or inter-jurisdictional inter resourcing arrangements uh, initiated by COSC, but through the National Resource Sharing Centre, in my experience, has been effective. Um, uh, in saying that in terms of to the start of your question, if I've understood it correctly, around the operationalising of uh, ANZ, ANZ EMC, um, I think it's important to keep those settings separate because they can become mixed, uh, would be my uh, experience. And I think that is uh, also my recollection of some of the conversations that currently is occurring in COSC, recognising it's uh, the COSC membership in some respects um, doesn't cover all um, uh, chiefs or commissioners of uh, all um, fire emergency service organisations across the jurisdiction because there's many of them, e.g. land managers, um, don't have that sort of linkage into that at those uh, ANZ and EMC arrangements in the same way the fire emergency services do. Thank you. And so, Commissioner Leach, if I can turn to you then, um, what do you think, or in your opinion, what do you think a proposed repositioning of COSC to sitting sort of under ANZ EMC is likely to achieve? Um, I think it, I, I echo uh, Deputy Commissioner Wazing's comments about uh, the relationship at the moment. Um, I think ANZ EMC is certainly a more strategic uh, long-term uh, policy forum across 
all spectrums of prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. Uh, and, and the representatives there are made up of, uh, of operational personnel. So in the case of Queensland, the Commissioner of QFIS, myself, and a senior policy position from Premier and Cabinet. So it's very much a strategic policy forum. Um, COSC, on the other hand, is, is more of a strategic operational forum. So I, I guess what it would bring is some closer links between uh, policy and strategic operations. Thank you. Um, we, we haven't had that view um, expressed before. Do you think, or uh, sorry, I'll start that again. Um, is the intention that COSC will still make the decisions about resource sharing, but that the other functions that COSC performs, which we've heard it performs quite well in relation to policy, would be ones that would be taken to ANZ EMC? Yes, I think I think it's uh, you could describe it as a matrix relationship. So there's a number of strategic forums that operate at that level. COSC uh, is about um, best practice um, effectiveness. It's it's sharing of um, best practice arrangements across jurisdictions and agencies. And ANZ EMC is that strategic emergency management policy forum for whole of government. So it's not only the response agencies, it's it's whole of government. Uh, and then you have uh, EMA and the Department of Home Affairs who, who play a role um, in the emergency management at the Commonwealth level. So it's how those uh, different forums work together, if you like. So there'll always be a need for that uh, quick turnaround operational decisions amongst the chief officers and the commissioners uh, to respond to some of these short-term jurisdictional requests for, for assistance, if you like. Thank you. Um, just to tease out the issue of prioritisation and the whole of government considerations you mentioned in that answer, um, how would you, as a COSC member, or would you, as a COSC member, have regard to whole of government considerations in assessing a request for resource um, sharing or assistance? Mm. Um, so the beauty of COSC is it provides a forum, uh, particularly during. Uh, operations that any jurisdiction might have for the senior leaders from the jurisdictions to come together to get situational awareness about what's happening right across Australia um, and then to be able to be in a position to make decisions around uh, resource sharing or resource requests. Um, and so I think that's a, a really important uh, role that COSC forms is the situational awareness component, as well as that prioritisation of, of resourcing. Having said that, we've been in the fortunate position of not generally having to make priority decisions because the, the hazards we've been dealing with have tended to be consecutive. So you have Queensland with a significant bushfire situation able to request resources and, and then the, the bushfire situation moved into New South Wales and then moved into Victoria and South Australia and, and Tasmania. And so it's about consecutive decision making uh, over a period of time, as opposed to multiple jurisdictions uh, having requests uh, at the same time requiring priority decisions to be made. Just on the um, situational awareness um, perspective that COSC gives. Um, does COSC give a national situational awareness picture to you as a COSC member? Uh, in my experience, when, when you do a briefing, uh, they usually go around jurisdiction by jurisdiction to get a, each commissioner or chief officer to give an update on their current situation. So you get that situational awareness based on the latest intelligence that someone can bring to, to the table on that day. Um, and that helps to uh, put some context around the discussions that go on to resource requests and resource sharing. And... I assume that, but correct me if I'm wrong, because the Director General of EMA 
is the co-chair of COSC. Uh, that is also a way in which to provide situational awareness to the Commonwealth. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, thank you. I want to um, take up another aspect of your answer from two questions ago about the consecutive nature of natural disasters historically. And I want to ask you to assume in a hypothetical future uh, there is a case of cascading or compounding disasters such that resources available for sharing are scarce. And, for example, Queensland... Um, has 50 firefighters as at its disposal, but two jurisdictions are fighting over, or, or bidding for, <laughs> is perhaps a more neutral term to use, those resources. Um, I assume that decision will go to COSC and it will be discussed at COSC. Can you tell us how you think that scenario would play out? <laughs> Um, so, uh, again, the, the teleconference or however the forum was being conducted uh, would go through situational awareness, so the commissioners or chiefs would give an overview of their current situation. That would also include uh, assets at risk, so communities, people, infrastructure, um, and uh, that would give some context to COSC members about the nature and severity of the emergencies in each of the jurisdictions um, and then that would provide some background to the prioritisation of resources and I think in my previous evidence I talked about the hierarchy of life, property and environment and most of the emergency management uh, acts across jurisdictions generally prioritise in, in that order um, and there'd be uh, discussion at that level about where the greatest need was. And would COSC make a decision about to which jurisdiction to send your 50 Queensland firefighters? Um, my experience is that it's, it's more of a... It's a consensus forum, so you generally discuss... The, the aspects and the elements of any requests. And uh, in my experience, the, the forum has arrived at a consensus decision around where resources would go. And so the so I assume, so a cost makes a decision that says send the 50 Queensland firefighters to uh, jurisdiction A. Um, is that the end of the matter or does the ultimate decision rest with you as the CUFA's commissioner? Well, certainly if I was sending personnel into another jurisdiction, uh, my responsibilities and accountabilities for those people and resources are still there. Mm -hmm. So I still have obligations around occupational health and safety um, and a whole range of you know, other issues that I that I can't step away from. So obviously we would keep a very uh, close interest in our resources. We would work through the National Resource Sharing Centre. We would deploy liaison officers. Uh, we would ensure that all of those logistics and all of the things that we would need to do to support our people and our resources are looked after uh, from a Queensland perspective. Um, thank you. So just to um, expand on that, because that uh, consideration has not, so far at least, come up in evidence today. When you are thinking about your uh, workplace health and safety obligations to your employees or volunteers, um, is it the case that when you send them into state, you still retain responsibility for those um, aspects of the performance of their duties? Uh, there's certainly uh, elements that are still our responsibility under our Queensland legislation, but the requesting jurisdiction also has obligations under whatever their state's jurisdictions are as well. Um, but we would certainly liaise with the responding jurisdiction um, one of the things we can have confidence in because of the 
uh, move towards standardisation of systems. So, for example, the acceptance many years ago of the Australasian Inter-Service Incident Management System right across Australia, we can have confidence in the, the operational system of work that's going to be in place in another jurisdiction. Uh, likewise, we have understandings about their levels of training and their operational procedures, um, and so that gives us some confidence that our people can operate safely in another jurisdiction. Thank you. So, assuming you are satisfied with those requirements and COSC makes a decision to deploy to jurisdiction A, you then, well, that's a decision you don't agree with. Do you have essentially a right of veto over that decision or do you consider yourself bound by the COSC decision? Uh, oh, no, I, I think I haven't been in that position, but if I, if I was, if I had concerns that were significant enough, um, at the end of the day, they're, they're Queensland resources and I have an obligation to those resources and uh, uh, if I needed to bring them back to Queensland or not deploy them in the first place, then uh, that's what I would do. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I want to ask you a question on a fairly discreet topic, which is... Um, uh, Commissioner Leach, your attendance at the ANZ EMC meeting on the 23rd of April this year, where you discussed a uh, natural hazards app, and I think it was described in the outcomes as a public-facing natural hazard solution. Um, are you just able to assist the commissioners by explaining what, what that is a reference to? Mm. Uh, Queensland currently doesn't have uh, an app uh, in the same way that New South Wales has fires near me or Victoria has Vic Emergency. Um, Queensland, uh, QFIS and the Queensland Government is of the view that an app like that would be beneficial, um, but not just limited to a jurisdiction or to a hazard. Um, we have a vision that if there was a multi-hazard app uh, that covered all of Australia, so that if someone should leave Victoria and travel to Queensland for holidays, for example, whenever they travel from one jurisdiction to another, there's no need to download another app and get familiar with another system. We think there's a place for uh, an all-hazards um, Australia-wide app um, where people could be made aware of any hazards in their geographic area. Oh, yes, thank you. I was about to ask you exactly that all hazards uh, question because, obviously, if you travel on holidays to North Queensland over the monsoon period, you're likely to be hit or faced with the potential of a tropical cyclone. Um, so thank you for uh, anticipating that uh, in your answer. Um, commissioners, I note the time, and I expect there might be some questions from commissioners. So, uh, gentlemen, while I could talk to you for... A uh, number of hours on these topics. I will um, pause there and um, defer to the commissioners. No, and we will look to finish at about quarter past. So I just want to... Uh, I've got a couple of questions and I'll go to the other, other commissioners. In a process sense, who calls the QDMC in an emergency? Is there a set process? Is there a trigger for, for that? Uh, generally, the, the Premier um, or the De uh, Director General of the Department of Premier and Cabinet will liaise with the Queensland Police Service Commissioner or the QFIS Commissioner uh, to make a decision about calling a QDMC. OK. Um, into COSC now, uh, because it doesn't appear that COSC meetings, emergency meetings, except for that first one, sort of link back to the, to the strategic level in the, the state, but in the costs, in your experience, so the discussions when you're looking at resource allocations, and this will be more important as you got to that extreme where they're starting at end of the season, resources are tight. Does the cost take into account all the, the risks that the states are facing? And, it's, and I'm not just talking about the combat arm here, I'm talking about you know, the health, uh, education, agriculture, um, infrastructure. You go through all the, the uh, I guess, all the representatives that be on the QDMC that they would be interested in in, uh, in covering from a whole of government, and one of you mentioned that before, in a whole of government risk perspective. How is that 
sort of conversation translated into a cost where you've got a, a, a combat focus, but actually you should be aware of all the risks and have those balanced when you're making the, the decisions. Is that factored into the discussions uh, at all? And if so, how? Mm. Um, not, uh, in my experience, not to a large degree because the, the cost discussions are um, incident specific, if you like. So an event's occurred in a jurisdiction and it might be a, a bushfire event and so that the jurisdiction that's hosting that event puts out a request for assistance or support and costs will come together and discuss the re resource request or the logistical request uh, specific to that event. It, in my experience, it doesn't go beyond that. That's usually a matter for the jurisdiction within their own, own emergency management arrangements to work through those whole of government considerations. Okay, and I appreciate that. And it might be better, we, we will probably take that up with Victoria and New South Wales as we get them, because they had multi-jurisdictional events that were, uh, that were acquiring, so that level of, of discussion, but I appreciate uh, that, that answer. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett. Thanks, Chair. I just have one question that goes to the, uh, to the concept of, of the actual decision making. I understand that um, in COSC everything works by consensus and I understand that that is a very, has proved to be a very successful model. But we've also been looking at the scenario where there could be, as you've heard, you know, with some of the questioning of competing priorities. Now, I appreciate that um, that this is a hypothetical and hasn't occurred yet in this sort of bidding war, but Let's assume that, that it, it has happened because we, and so when, when you're really having to make that choice between two, two different competing jurisdictions, both of whom want, and you've got, you've got availability, you've got capacity and you, you can put that, those resources out there. Because I'm looking to see exactly who makes the decision if, if, if um, when push comes to shove. And, and I'm thinking of another example where it seems to me that uh, the consensus model may have not yet broken down, but it hasn't um, shown itself to be speedily applicable, which is my favourite one about the warning system. So we've got, you know, this decision-making process about the uh, national warning, warning system, you know, the same across the country to choose the three expressions and run with them everywhere. That has not yet um, been decided, despite um, what one would have thought was sufficient time. So. In the end, if there is no consensus in the warning system, if the, if the jurisdictions can't agree, or if there is no consensus in COSC about where those resources are going to be applied, where there, is, where there are competing uh, priorities, who makes the decision? Well, we haven't, as you rightly point out, Commissioner, we haven't been in that position yet. We've been, even though we've been tested in a number of jurisdictions, uh, fortunately we've had a number of other jurisdictions who haven't been under the same duress who've been able to offer up resourcing. Um, but speaking from my position as Commissioner in Queensland, if I was in a position of requesting resources, um, I would put that into cost. There'd be a discussion and uh, one way or the other, I just need to know whether resources are coming or they're not coming, in which case I'm left to deal with the emergency with the resources I have. Yes, but you're the giving jurisdiction. I'm assuming you're the giving jurisdiction. And, it, okay, in the event and, and it's not yes. agreed within the COSC. Or let's just say at the next meeting of the COSC, somebody says we have to make a decision about these warning systems. That has to happen. And there is no agreement between the jurisdictions, as apparently there hasn't been. So... Let's assume that now we're at that. I mean, that to me is almost an example of what might happen if there is no, if the consensus fails. So your Queensland's representative on the COSC. In the end, do you then make your decision? Uh, you, do you make the decision for Queensland in effect on who gets the resources and using as the exemplar which system you vote for? Or apply. Well, my experience so far is um, is that. Um, collaboration has generally resulted in an outcome. And so if there's competing requests for resources and there's a finite pool of resources available, um, decisions are being made about X jurisdiction gets this part of the resource and Y jurisdiction gets another part. So- By uh, whom? By, sorry to interrupt you, by whom? Hmm. The decision by, by, by whom? By the members of COSC, by the collective uh, of COSC. Okay, and if and if the collective can't decide, like in the warning system, it just keeps getting deferred. Mm. Uh, 
I haven't been in a cost where we haven't been able to reach a consensus. I think if we had... <laughs> uh, Look, it, potentially it, it could happen, I suppose, um, but I, I think we're all sufficiently uh, tuned to trying to get outcomes. Uh, if we've got jurisdictions in need, we would, we would make decisions about carving up whatever available resources we have to give to the jurisdictions based on that priority, life, property, environment. Thank you. That's I appreciate, my sense anyway. Thank you. I appreciate the difficulty in asking you to make hypothetical, you know, deal with a hypothetical situation. But to some degree, that's what we're facing in looking forward, you know, as we now have the experience of the 2019-2020 situation and the prospect of this sort of thing happening. Um, we, you, you're the ones who can help us um, try and work out what, what might happen in those situations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner McIntosh. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Quick question. Um, Operator, can you pull up AFC 506001529? This is an extract from the AFAC NRSC Bushfire Strategic Planning Report. And can you highlight the Initiative 9, the section under Initiative 9 there? I don't know whether either of you are familiar with this document. Um, it sets out a capability assessment done on or around the report stated the 3rd of December of uh, a capability assessment of, of bushfire resources at that time. And that recommendation, as you can read up there, suggests that a similar um, capability assessment is undertaken across all emergency service agencies. And I was just wondering whether it, it, that, that sort of um, capability assessment would be useful if it was done on an ongoing basis. So they, so you'd have, um, and people who are in COSC or an equivalent of COSC have that sort of information a as a matter of routine as opposed to a one-off. Uh, the, um, the document hasn't come up on the screen uh, particularly well, but... That's always uh, a disappointment. If I, take the, if I take the question on notice, I guess within our jurisdiction, we do capability assessments uh, on a daily, weekly and monthly basis um, and it feeds up from, from the lowest levels of the organisation, so uh, local, uh, regional and state. Um, so we do uh, incidents, we'll make determinations around their capability and capacity on a 24-hour cycle. Um, our regions do seven-day plans and do assessments of their capability and at state level we do assessments of our capability over a 28-day period and that's about trying to assess our, our resourcing situation and the uh, impending weather conditions, for example, so that we can go to COSC and other jurisdictions in a timely manner with resource requests if we need to do that. And to share that, is there a collective sharing of that information amongst the cost members? Uh, we, we do provide um, our plans through to the National Co uh, Coordination Centre, I think, to the Crisis Coordination Centre. I think so the Commonwealth get those. Um, we would provide them uh, on bilateral arrangements, so we provide them into our neighbouring jurisdictions. Uh, we could share them more broadly. We tend to talk to them at COSC when we, when we get together on the teleconferences as part of that situational awareness. Thank you both. Thanks, Chair. All right, Deputy uh, Commissioner Wassing and, and Commander Leach, thank you very much. We appreciate your, uh, your time. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Leach. Uh, Mr Glover. Uh, thank you, Chair. May uh, witnesses, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, may the witnesses be released from their summonses. Uh, we appreciate the time that we've uh, we've had with you, not just in this session. Uh, and so, thank you very much for that. And uh, you most may may both be released from your uh, your summonses. Thank you very much. Thanks, Commissioners. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Commissioners, the next witnesses are from the State of Victoria. They are scheduled to commence at. 3.30, uh, so I wonder whether that would be an appropriate time to have a short adjournment. Yeah, we'll take a short adjournment. Actually, we'll take 15 minutes. So we'll take uh, till 15.35 uh, Canberra time. Thank you. Thank you. All rise.
The Royal Commission has adjourned until 15.35.
Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms. Hogan Doran. Uh, yes, Chair, just a short update. Uh, this morning I uh, advised you in relation to the notices to the State of Queen, uh, New South Wales and the State of Victoria. Um, the notices that, we issued, that were foreshadowed to you this morning were issued, uh, were made returnable at 1pm. Uh, as, as at this present time, those um, reports have not yet been provided to the Royal Commission. There is ongoing correspondence between uh, the respective solicitors in relation to the terms on which uh, those reports may be provided. Um, in the circumstances, uh, it is likely that we would seek... Uh, to reserve the position that it may be necessary to recall uh, certain witnesses if there are matters of relevance to your terms of reference. Uh, it's making it hard to have a collaborative approach, but uh, yes, well, we're, the way we will go is uh, we won't release the witnesses from their summons. We'll need to keep them until this is resolved. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, the next panel is a panel from Victoria. I call Commissioner Andrew Crisp and Chief Officer Tim Weebush. Commissioner Crisp, Chief Officer Warbush, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Commissioner Crisp will affirm and Chief Weebush will take an oath. Commissioner Crisp. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Chief Officer Weebush, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Commissioner Crisp in particular, we appreciate your scarce uh, availability having regard to the situation in Victoria. I will uh, try to keep my questions as brief as possible. Um, but I note that um, you may be able to inform the Commission about any uh, lessons that can be learned in relation to a national response to the current uh, pandemic as it relates to natural disasters. Can I first um, turn to uh, Chief Weebush? Um, just because we haven't heard a lot from state emergency services personnel uh, until really today. Um, Chief Weebush, can you just um, describe what your role is within the COSC structure? Yes, certainly. So in Victoria, there are, uh, is only one representative member on COSC, and that is Commissioner Crisp. Um, and then each of the chiefs of the response agencies, including SES, like myself, are there as observer slash guests uh, in that forum. Uh, thank you. And so we see um, from the uh, minutes of COSC that you attended um, uh, last year on the 31st of October, the meeting that the videos were played from this morning, and then this year uh, on the 14th and 30th of April and on the 24th of July as a guest, are we right to assume that your role as a guest means you're there as a non-voting member of COSC in the event a vote was needed to be taken? So I guess in the COSC environment, the um, way I've seen it operate is not so much on a, a voting mechanism, it's more a collaborative forum that works on consensus. And so in that case, um, the Commissioner Crisp as the Victorian representative and member of COSC is the person that uh, will, I guess, put the Victorian uh, position and uh, may invite one of the other chiefs to speak to a topic where it might be our subject matter expertise or uh, something that uh, we have uh, spoken about that we would need to bring to the table. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Crisp, can I ask you some questions about how Victoria's emergency management 
decision-making agencies um, assess their respective issues and risks. I might do that by reference to the table of meetings. So, operator, can you please bring up RCN.900.094.0001, please, and enlarge, uh, if it is possible, the Victorian column and the COSC column. Uh, so, gentlemen, I hope you can see that. Um, yes, again. And just so we understand... Yeah. Apologies, Commissioner Crisp. I'm sorry, all I was going to say, uh, Mr Glover, is uh, I, I can't read the text in the red boxes, but I can certainly see the dates. Oh, thank you. I wasn't going to ask you any questions about the red boxes. Uh, essentially, what they are designed to represent are uh, uh, periods of fire activity in the state. And obviously, uh, what we see is only down to just after the 4th of December. Um, I was just going to ask you a question about SEMCC, which is the, the acronym in the top... Uh, green box. Uh, my understanding is that's a um, committee of cabinet, the Security and Emergency Management Committee of Cabinet, and that's chaired by the Premier. Is that right? That's correct, Mr Glover. And then under that, the text in yellow is the SCRC, and that's the State Crisis and Resilience Council, um, and then we see that it met on various occasions during the fire season and that SEMCC met on the 14th of October. Can you just describe to us whether those bodies provide input into or conduct an assessment of the issues and risks that Victoria faces um, such that those risks and issues are then fed into COSC? So to, to some further description around the, those two particular committees, as you mentioned, one is, one is a Cabinet subcommittee chaired by the Premier. Uh, the SCRC is chaired by the Secretary of DPC, so it, it's, it's, it's more akin to a, you know, a senior policy um, group. Uh, that's not to say it, it won't focus on, on operational matters. Um, the, the information in, with regards to, to cost, it's more about um, how I will brief into those committees in relation to outcomes of cost as opposed to those committees um, through me going to cost. Thank you. And so I should say then, turning to the COSC column, we see there meetings that are both the, um, what I call the formal or usual meetings. So, for example, the meeting on the 31st of October 2019 that I think you were present at, and also the emergency short notice meetings that are operational in the sense that they consider requests for interstate assistance. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct, Mr Glover. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask you then, Commissioner Crisp, a, a bit about those emergency short notice meetings. Um, is the process that what happens at those meetings one that the COSC makes a decision about requests for interstate assistance? Not a decision as such. The COSC um, in those emergency situations comes together uh, to enable um, national jurisdictional situational awareness with regards to the emergency and then to have a discussion about um, whether a jurisdiction is looking for resources or a jurisdiction can provide resources. Uh, thank you. And so when is that decision about any request or provision of assistance made? From a Victorian perspective, we took a different approach um, this, this last um, fire season where, where we, as, as uh, Tim has already mentioned, uh, uh, working with the fire chiefs and emergency services chiefs, 
uh, we were prepared for these particular meetings and, and have an understanding about um, our resource um, capacity and capability. So we would take a service offer to the cost meeting uh, where we could outline uh, how many firefighters or incident management teams uh, we believe we, we could um, commit to another jurisdiction. And so then when is the decision to commit resources in the case where you are um, providing the assistance when is that decision taken and if and and when it is who makes that decision from a victorian perspective so i i'm the the representative in victoria that um that um will provide and request resources for the state. But again, um, I'll make the point that um, it's very much a collaborative effort in relation to working with the fire and other emergencies. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask you then about the role that the National Resource Sharing Centre provides in that sort of decision-making framework. From Victoria's perspective, what does the NRSC do in relation to interstate assistance? So, from the way I see it, and practically speaking, that the, the cost will come together to have that discussion about resourcing, about, you know, what, what a jurisdiction might be able to provide. And then, then, um, then the NRC will, will liaise with various people in those jurisdictions and, and just pull all that, all that together. So they, they will, they will um, operationalise or implement, uh, the, I guess, the, the direction of cost. Uh, thank you. And um, I might turn back to Chief Weebush. Um, have you been involved in resource sharing for SES personnel um, that has uh, been facilitated through NRSC? Yes, we certainly have. Uh, I guess in Victoria, um, as Andrew has just mentioned, uh, the Chiefs will come together and determine a service offering and quite often uh, SES will be part of the makeup of a multi-agency response from Victoria. Very rare these days that we will deploy interstate as a single agency. It will quite often be a multi-agency approach, um, depending on the type of skill sets and um, capabilities that are being requested. Uh, thank you. Um, Commissioner Chris, I'll turn back to you. Um, just wanted to ask, to whom is COSC accountable to or responsible to? So for me, COSC sits within the, the AFAC um, framework. Um, and whilst it sits within that particular framework, um, e each of the, the representatives of COSC are actually responsible to their own uh, jurisdiction and the organisation that they're representing. So to what extent does COSC have regard to considerations of the national interest when it is considering uh, requests for assistance or even when it's receiving uh, updates in relation to situational awareness? So with regards to the, the national um, interest, it's, it's very much part of, you know, whether it's state priorities or national priorities, and I'm, I'm sure all the jurisdictions would say the same thing. That's to do with, you know, protection of life and property, um, looking at environmental uh, issues, um, traditional, other traditional owner uh, issues in relation to what we need to protect. But it is... It is um, so, Invariably, though, it comes back to protecting life and life and property. So they're almost um, very sharp turnaround operational decisions that are being made. But so not the broader national interest, but the national interest in relation to protecting life and property. Uh, thank you. Now, I understand um, from Victoria's point of view that... Um, there is an opportunity to re revisit and streamline current national governance arrangements to reduce duplication, clarify accountabilities and drive information sharing and investment. Can you just explain um, what um, areas for improvements in govern governance uh, the State of Victoria considers are able to be achieved in this space? 
So you're talking about what we think in terms of nationally, where we could go? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, look, it, it's, I, I know it's been on the, the COSC agenda uh, about, well, it's the AFAC agenda, where does COSC actually sit? Uh, you know, I've been in my role for nearly coming on to two years now, and I must admit that um, I, at times I've been somewhat confused with regards to the AFAC Council, uh, what it will consider in its meetings, and then what the COSC will consider. So, obviously, talking about COSC outside of those emergency meetings, so when it's looking to capability and capacity more broadly uh, across our, our emergency services. So for me, that, that's not exactly clear. Um, with regards to um, NZMC, uh, you know, I, I sit on uh, NZMC as, as one of the, the Victorian representatives. So again, you know, for me, that's almost akin to the State Crisis and Resilience Council of Victoria, it's sort of that, that senior policy-making decision, uh, decision-making group that's informed by operations. Uh, again, I think that there's just an opportunity, rather than thinking about, well, COSC, um, there's an option, opportunity for it to sit as part of NZMC. I guess it's, for me, it's that form follows function. And if we were to, and you touched on it before, Mr. Glover, if we were to maybe learn some lessons also from, from what's happening in relation to COVID, you know, if we were to set up our, our infrastructure, our architecture um, from scratch, would it be set up the way it is at the moment? And I'd suggest that there are opportunities for improvement. Uh, thank you. I just want to ask you a bit more about that proposal to reposition COSC from under AFAC to under ANZ EMC. And I know that you weren't able to attend that COSC meeting, but what are, what are your views about that repositioning? I guess it goes to my last point, um, Mr Glover. It's about where do we ultimately want to get um, in relation to information sharing, decision making? Um, so that it is that piece about you know form following function. What we what do we want, and then what what is the structure that sits under that to actually support it? I, I'm certainly open to um, to cost sitting under Amzensi. It tightens um, for me that um, uh, that the connection in, into government, and and I'm certainly not opposed to that. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of um, EMA and the Director General and the, and the work that they actually do. But again, you know, I, I've got an open mind. I, I'd like to see some further work done, work done in relation to what that overall architecture actually looks like. So the immediate um, uh, um, issue with ANZ EMC, at least from my point of view, is that has traditionally been a policy um, body and that's a little like... COSC was when it was established before it has um, filled the void, uh, if you will, in relation to this operational role. So um, I've asked a few of the earlier witnesses this question. Is um, moving COSC under ANZEMC um, effectively operationalising ANZEMC? I, I don't really believe so. You know, if you want to talk about operationalising NZMC, you've already got, you know, a number of commissioners um, that, that sit on NZMC. So, um, you know, you've got operational input and I think there, there's a, there is a distinct role for NZMC and there's a distinct role for the cost, the emergency meetings that, that we currently hold. Uh, thank you. Um, want to ask you a little bit... Um, more about NRSC now um, and in relation to um, the status of it and its future funding going forward. So the Commission has the minutes of the COSC meeting you attended on the 30th of April. Uh, I won't bring them up uh, just to save time, but uh, take it from me, they say this. Andrew Crisp raised a question regarding funding the AFAC NRSC and the potential duplication of effort. Vic is not in a position to endorse NRSC continuing within AFAC. Would you just like to explain what you had in mind by making those comments? Yeah, my thinking behind that was, uh, and, and I'm a strong supporter of a, a national resource sharing centre. Yeah. You know, a, a body that can move resources not just nationally but internationally. 
again, I, I was being very um, uh, focused on, on this, this Royal Commission and what some of the outcomes might be um, in relation to some of the del deliberations and, and the recommendations of the commissioners. So whether they again, you know, what does that overall architecture look like and, and would there not be an opportunity to possibly, you know, locate an NRSC as a function with, within EMA? Uh, again, for me, my, my thinking has been about, you know, particularly when I think internationally, I think government to government and uh, I'm, I would be more comfortable with that, that arrangement sitting within EMA rather than AFAC as a not-for-profit organisation. And, and please... Um, I'm not being critical of AFAC. It, it's a great organisation, does a great job um, pulling together all our, all our different organisations, great in terms of um, developing capability of doctrine and all of that. But I think there are some areas for me that, that might best sit elsewhere. Uh, thank you for that explanation. Um, something that uh, I have sought to do in my questions, and hopefully this is coming across, um, sought to distinguish even at the cost level between its formal meetings, like the one on 31 October last year, versus the short-term emergency operational meetings. Um, just in that respect, in talking about those emergency meetings, um, I've asked this of other witnesses, so I will ask this of you. And Chief Weebush, please feel free to add your perspective from an SES point of view. Um, if Victoria um, had 50 firefighters available to um, be deployed to another jurisdiction for assistance, um, but imagine there were no other firefighters available and assume also that two jurisdictions had a need for those 50 firefighters, how would the decision about the deployment of those firefighters be made under the current cost arrangements? Yeah, I'm happy to sort of lead on that and, and Tim can, can jump in. So there would be that discussion. So, uh, you know, we would go around the jurisdictionals, juris, jurisdictions, um, situational awareness, what, what are the risks, uh, looking at um, the, the threat to, to life and property, and then I guess moving forward to the probably where you're going to take me and have taken me with this particular uh, question or scenario, that if there are any of those 50 resources, I guess practically speaking, we, we, we've never seen that. And um, I would expect if we got to that point, um, one jurisdiction would probably realise that there, another jurisdiction had a greater need and would back out of that, that particular discussion. But if you want to push further in relation to this, um, Ultimately, it's a decision for, in, in my mind, uh, it's a decision for the jurisdiction, but more it's a, it's a decision for the organisation that owns those particular resources. Yes, thank you. So the ultimate decision rests with you as the jurisdiction who's providing the firefighters. Yeah, as, at a jurisdictional level, but, but then... In my opinion, it would then actually sit with the chief officer, whether that's SES or one of our chief fire officers, if it was their resource. Uh, thank you. Chief Weebush, did you have anything to add to that um, line of questioning from an SES-specific point of view? Look, I think uh, the only one comment I'd make in addition to what Andrew has said, and I support what Andrew has uh, already mentioned, is I think if we got to that scenario where we're down to a particular type of capability being left, um, the benefit of COSC having both EMA and the responder agencies around the table is that it would probably then engender a conversation about now do we need to go abroad? Do we need to go overseas for further resources? Do we need to go to another capability that might exist um, within the Commonwealth um, in that setting? Uh, thank you. And I appreciate that's a scenario that hasn't happened in practice uh, or, or um, uh, to date. Um, I just wanted to ask you one further question about COSC, and it is once these emergency meetings are held and you receive a briefing from the various jurisdictions 
providing you a picture of situational awareness. Do you then, um, Commissioner Crisp, as the representative on COSC, feed that information you receive from COSC back through Victoria's emergency management framework? Practically speaking, if I'm participating in, as you'd imagine, the general teleconferences, that, that I will have, um, I will ensure that the other chiefs are actually dialed into that. So they, they immediately get that information and then we'll take that away. Um, if the discussion leads to a resource request or we're likely to deploy resources from Victoria, invariably um, I would brief the minister, my minister, the Minister for Police and Emergency Services. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to turn um, briefly now to a different topic, uh, which is the seemingly vexed one of warnings. Um, I just want to ask you whether, um, and I might start with you, Commissioner Crisp, um, whether um, you think implementation of the Australian warning system um, can be in any way accelerated? Uh, well, I, I think it, I think it should be accelerated. I think we should reach a decision um, before we lead into into next summer. And my understanding is we we're on track for that. Uh, this additional piece of research should be finished uh, within the next ten days, and I would suggest it should be relatively easy to make a decision after that. Again, I know we're talking about that sort of middle layer in relation to the warnings, the watch and act piece, but in terms of the, the icons and the colours and all that, there was there was definitely agreement around what that looked like. But I'm happy to take further advice from Tim on this. Uh, yes, yeah, so Chief uh, Weebush, do you have anything to add in that regard? Yes, look, I think as Andrew's just indicated, there's strong support from Victoria for the having a national framework for warnings and the three tiers and uh, colours and icons. Victoria is actually in parallel to the research that's going on around um, the, uh, the naming convention for the middle tier, uh, either Watch and Act or Act Now. Uh, Victoria is leading the piece on the icons, which is again due by early September. And I understand that that other research piece about the, the naming convention um, is due to be reported back by the end of August. And just sticking with you for the moment, Chief Weebush, is um, what is your sort of personal view based on your experience of that middle tier term, um, Watch and Act? Look, I think for the SESs, and this would be similar for a number of my counterparts around the country from having spoken with them, the, the title of Watch and Act was particularly problematic for some of our hazard types. So uh, SES in Victoria is responsible for flood, storm, landslide, tsunami and earthquake. And that middle tier as Watch and Act does um, have a conflict when you look at particularly events like tsunami, which has a, uh, a watch level, floods, which also has a watch level. And so those watch levels are actually the entry point, which we currently call advice. Um, so to then have a watch and act level is particularly problematic uh, in terms of community understanding. And so, and I think the research has borne that out as well. And it talks about people also understanding watch and act as potentially being wait and see. So certainly from our perspective, um, the watch and act needs to change and there's a, a, a need to move to something that the community recognises as being that next level of warning. Oh, thank you very much for that answer. Um, Commissioner Crisp, I'll just turn to you now and just ask you in your own opinion, based on your experience, what's your view of that middle tier watch and act? Mm. Yeah, uh, look, I, I shared um, Tim's thoughts in, in relation to it. Uh, you know, I do get feedback from people on the street about watch and act that it, it creates some confusion. I know the research has indicated that. Um, personally, uh, you know, I'm, I would be very comfortable going to an act now or take action, something that's um, a lot clearer. Mm. So it, it just from a personal level for me, it seems that something like that, the words you've just described, the expressions you've just used, would uh, much more convey a sense of a call to action for members of the community who were receiving that warning? Is that what you have in mind? That, that's exactly right. Again, you know, and 
uh, you know, I don't know how many times, you know, I stood up in, in front of the media, you know, over the last summer, and it's it's always about, you know, wanting them to do something. So we have to support them by being clear in relation to, to what our warnings are actually saying. Uh, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, I'm conscious of the time and the, um, the calls on your expertise from other places, uh, so I will um, defer to the commissioners for their questions. Thank you, Mr Glover. A, a couple of questions uh, to start off with. And I'm looking at the higher level decision making uh, here and how it would then relate to, uh, to a national coordination uh, model. If I look at your emergency management system up there in the meetings, if we can put those meetings back, uh, back up, please, uh, which you've got on that top screen now. That one? So if I was to look, in, look at that, and, and I hope you can see it, the SEMCC, what's the trigger for that meeting? Or is it a pre-planned meeting at the start of a, uh, an emergency season, or is it through advice? Both commissioners, so there there is always um, a pre-summer briefing to CENSI and then, then other meetings as required um, during the summer or when there's other emergencies occurring. Okay, and the SCRC? There, there are set meetings because it's a, it's a policy body, uh, but it can also be called, um, you know, at short notice um, to support, because as you would imagine, SCRC will, will inform, because its secretaries will inform CMC. Yeah, and I, and I, and I appreciate that. You, you said before, Commissioner Chris, that you, uh, as a member or, I think you're a member of that, uh, of the SCRC, um, take the, the conversation, the discussion out of that and take it to COSC and then would take that discussion back to that, that committee, if I understand it. Is that right? It, Commissioner, it's more the, more the latter, that um, with, if you talk about during the, with, with the fires that we had, it was more of a, because it was so dynamic, it would be the cost discussion, then I, then I would feed that both um, to the SCRC and then, and then to my minister. Okay, and so the, and the reason I ask that is I'm trying to find an alignment of those meetings, and I can't. And so I'm after what I'm after is an understanding at the higher level how how the state level risks are considered uh, through whole of government, and how that would inform you in going to to COSC, uh, noting that uh, you, you're not representing your jurisdiction at COSC, you're representing your uh, your organisation. But I'll I'll take that there's actually a, a bit of both uh, in in that. So how is that whole of government risk brought together when when uh, I look at those meetings, for example, the SCRC, and I look at what was happening in Gippsland towards the end of December and I don't see any meetings? So what's the process then for that higher level understanding of the, of the risk? Yeah, Commissioner, um, my advice is that um, CMC actually also met on the, on, the, on the 25th of November, the 31st of December and the 6th of, of January. Well, we asked so, we asked you when they sat, and they are the dates that we got given. So it's not helpful when we ask trying to get an understanding, and we're not getting the information. No, I appreciate, it. Commissioner. I'm just uh, looking. I appreciate. At it. Some, can you give me those dates again, please, so we can fill in the the blanks? So the yeah, 14th, the 25th of November, November yep. the 31st of December, and the 6th of January. Thank you. You've actually just filled in the, the missing bit that was, uh, that was concerning me on how we would, would uh, do this. Okay, so noting that those additional dates are in there, then COSC has a certain function and you're talking about uh, requiring uh, or looking at resources and make decisions on, on resourcing. Who, how is the process then done for who makes a decision whether you're going to go and request state resources or you're looking to go into state, sorry, not into state, uh, international, or you're looking for Commonwealth support? Is that purely you out of cost, or is there a broader framework within the state to consider that before the de decision to make that request is done? Yeah, yes, Commissioner. There's, there's another body. So there's the state control team. 
So the state control team is chaired by the state response controller, and we, we have a state response controller on roster um, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The state control team, um, we, so over, over the summer, with the, excuse me, I just need to take a drink. No, that's okay. I appreciate it. I know you're a busy man too. <clears throat> Um, we'll meet daily, sometimes twice daily um, over, over the summer, or when we've got, you know, it could be a flood situation when we've got an emergency running. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's discussion as part of resourcing, at, as should be, um, at that level, and state control team, when when we are ramping up, it, it will invariably have the chiefs around the table as well. So mm -hmm. that's where we will have that discussion about um, how we're tracking in relation to our risks, what, what, is our, what are our resources looking like, and planning for whether we need to go um, inter interstate or overseas. Once we have that discussion, then that's the opportunity to feed that in, into the into the cost of emergency meetings. Okay, so so it is a it is the decisions are made at the higher level before you get to those cost meetings. Yeah, by, by the state control team again, a collaborative piece um, with with the emergency services and fire chiefs. Okay. Again, though, that seems to be only your response. Uh, personnel make in that decision making process acknowledging that you know, there are other impacts across the state from a whole of government point of view that would need to be understood to make the, the, an appropriate risk decision how are they brought into that so the, the, the state control team also has a state consequence manager, a state relief and recovery manager, so, so state communications manager. So we're picking up on other functions and other parts of whether you know, want to go back to that from you know, preparation, you know, response, relief and, and recovery. So um, we've, we are very focused on, on all you know, the, the full spectrum in relation to an emergency. Uh, but are they decision makers or are they more coordinators in those meetings? No, that, that, that's the state control team. So um, whoever is the control agency and the state response controller is the person that's responsible for running that, that emergency. I, in, in effect, I only have a dotted line to that particular person. I appoint them, I can withdraw them, mm. but um, they don't directly report to me. Okay. So they, they actually assume the powers of the chiefs of the organisations um, when they are in that SC, RC role. Okay. Thank you. And one, one other... Topic. I know you're, you're a busy man. If I go to the topic du jour, which is the uh, the warning system, and so I understand, and it was a good summary from uh, Mr. Wybush uh, on Victoria's position and where where you're trying to, to push. And I appreciate that how candid you were there in giving us that. But Cosk works on a collaborative and consensus approach. What happens when a collaborative and consensus approach doesn't get to a decision and you need a timely de de decision? So you can't agree on something. And, uh, and I've read the Victorian brief that went prior to the, the I think it's the April uh, COSC. Uh, and I also read the AFAC brief. And I have to tell you, it reads like something out of the Holloman, which is a bit of a concern which is let's just keep kicking this down the road. So so when you get to a point where you've got to make a decision and cons uh, um, the collaborative approach and uh, that is not working, what's the way ahead to get a decision? Where not everyone's agreeing, but you've got to get to a decision. Now, I use this as an example. There could be other hypotheticals coming down, down track, um, but how do you get that decision? Look, um, Commissioner, and I've not seen it in you know in my nearly two years that I've been attending these meetings. But uh, you know, if we can't get to that consensus uh, position, then then it would have to it would have to go to a vote. So is it a and and we've not ev everyone today. No one's been in a, a vote of COSC. I think I'm just looking to <coughs> Mr. Glover. So it would have to go to a to a vote. Then then the question is. Is there a veto power uh, by anyone? Or if it goes to the vote and it's a majority, then everyone, based on the fact that you're representing your organisation, not your jurisdiction, um, if that's not the jurisdiction's position, is that binding in that vote in COSC? Well, I, that's a good question. Uh, I'll take some of that on notice. But looking in my mind, if if I and the other um, chiefs 
and, and probably my minister, um, because it would be a, a jurisdictional or a state issue for Victoria, um, felt that you know it was so important that, that um, we wanted to go against a vote, then I, I'd suggest that we would be within our rights to do that. Um, we certainly don't want to get there, but you know, just taking you a hypothetical to the nth degree. Yeah, no, I don't want to get there either. I was just wondering what the process would, would, would be. Listen, I appreciate that, and thank you very, very much. Commissioner Bennett? Thank you. I must say the chair asked the question, but less directly than I was going to ask it, although I think the answer might be the same, because I was, the question I had was, um, it, goes, it goes to a vote. Um, the majority go for Watch and Act over your personal views as to the, um, the applicability of Watch and Act for all hazards in Victoria, but that's the vote of COSC, um, or the majority of the jurisdictions at COSC. Does Victoria, go, does Victoria apply it? That was my question. What, I mean, you are, uh, and if you are the decision maker in COSC, if, if you are the decision maker, would you be bound by it? I'd suggest not. I'd suggest that um, ultimately, you know, it's it's a position for Victoria. We would, we, you know, we would always advocate to do things nationally. Um, however, I, I think Victoria would, would would reserve its right if it if it felt so strongly about a particular issue that, that it would take a different path. And I'm just being very frank now. No, that thank you. That, I appreciate the frankness. I mean, because of course you have to take into account all the cross border issues and the tourist issues and all of the other matters that exactly. go with it. But thank you yeah. for that frank answer. I only have one other the question. Um, in terms of decision making, and I, I'm just trying to understand, you know, and I think I may know the answer, Commissioner Chris, but I, and I think it may be um, peculiar to Victoria, I don't mean peculiar, you know, you, it may be that Victoria has the thing that, um, the organisation that answers this. Rather than thinking only in terms of hypotheticals of what happens when um, maybe two jurisdictions need the same Victorian resource of what, would you, what you would do, take a situation within Victoria where you've got um, fires at two ends of the state, um, and you simply do not have the resources to combat both of those fires. You just simply can't. And you know that if you throw, um, you know, all your resources, if you divide the resources, it's not going to work. So you've got to make a decision. I'm assuming you, you know, this is first and foremost your decision. So you've got these two fires, you've got to choose between them, basically. And they both have risk, you know, a risk to people and property and all the, you know, the sequential issues that you take into account. Um, who makes the... A, who makes the decision for the allocation of those resources is my first question. So it would be the state response controller, Commissioner. I see. And so that would mean that that, that decision would take account not just of uh, what I will call the immediate firefighting consequences, but also take into account the other matters that you referred to, like the potentials for recovery um, and um, uh, ec economic questions and matters such as that. There might be statewide issues. That, that's exactly right, but invariably with the scenario that you've discussed um, or you've mentioned, it would, my mind, it would come down to protecting life. Yes, well, my, my, my scenario had equal numbers of people in both places. So, you know, so, I mean, that, that's unlikely to be the case. But no, I think I, but, but I think the fact that you've got the, um, the uh, state control controller coming in, in effect, as you say, not, not reporting to you or you're not reporting to that, but, but working together, I assume, to make a decision in that consequence. Yes, it is, you know, it's, it's a group that works very, very well together and is a structure that, that works well. And I assume that would have worked across, that, that's the same system that would apply across all hazards, is that right, Mr Weebush? Yeah, that, that, that sorry. Sorry, <laughs> both of you. Okay, thank you. No, that, that's, that, 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 that was my question, thank you. No, and that's the question, Commissioner McIntosh. Nothing from me, Chair, thank you both for your evidence. Yes, yeah, thank you. Mr Glover. Um, Commissioner. Yes. Commissioner, could I pick up on Mr Glover's point about the SES and not hearing much about the SES. Can I just use this as an opportunity to, to say what an incredible job the SES actually, SES actually do, not just in Victoria but across the country? And I have the, have the pleasure and the privilege of attending many SES um, units and functions, and I refer to them as the Swiss Army knife of the emergency services because they're a quality product and they do so many things in such a good way. So I just wanted to add that to my support for the SES across the country. No, here, here, and and the commission uh, agrees with that. Uh, often when we're trying, this is why we're trying to get what's the whole of government and what's the the broader. Uh, decision making about who's doing what and what's happening and the, and the risks because all too often in this we've only heard from the, the combat fire side of it not the broader uh, response but I appreciate you taking the time to, to point that out because we agree with you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Now, Mr. Glover, anything from parties? No, no? Uh, no there's nothing from the parties with leave to appear, Chair. Um, no. So, uh, may these witnesses be excused but not released from their Yeah, summons. and un unfortunately, gentlemen, uh, trying to get information uh, at the moment means that uh, we can only excuse you. You're not released from the, the summons. We will be uh, working a time to get you back again at some stage uh, in the, the future. But on behalf of the Commission, uh, Commissioner Chris, can I wish you the best of luck uh, with the battle against COVID at the moment? I know it's a critical time for Victoria and we appreciate that. Uh, and uh, we watch on with interest uh, as the response develops and lessons are learnt from that. So uh, if you could please pass on our best regards to everyone in Victoria that it's associated with you that are fighting that, we'd appreciate it. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioners, the final panel of the day is not a panel at all. It's a single witness, um, Mr Steve Warrington, who until recently was the Chief Officer of Victoria's Country Fire Authority. Uh, so I call Mr Steve Warrington. Mr. Warrington, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you, my pleasure. Uh, Associate, Mr. Warrington will take an affirmation. Okay. Uh, Mr. Warrington, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Warrington, thank you for your time today. Um, obviously, until recently, you were the um, Chief Officer of Country Fire Authority of Victoria, and you attended COSC on uh, numerous occasions uh, throughout um, the fire season last year, along with other emergency services uh, meetings. I just wanted to ask first about your attendance at COSC. You're marked on the minutes as attending as a guest. Why is that? Uh, so Victoria is represented by Commissioner Crisp. Um, uh, the chief, chief officers of the respective agencies in Victoria are not represented on COSC. We can attend as a guest. Uh, thank you. Um, given your attendance at um, numerous COSC meetings, both the, uh, uh, what I call the formal or usual meetings that take place three times a year, as well as the emergency short notice meetings that are called in relation to requests for interstate assistance. I was just wondering if you could share with the commissioners what your view of COSC as a forum or arrangement to make decisions about interstate resource sharing is. Um, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, look, I, I think you need to go back to 2009 when COSC in a sense first started after Black Saturday when it re recognised the need for chief officers, commissioners to support each other both personally, um, so to lean on if you, you need a friendly ear, but also professionally in the fires because it was understood that the chiefs um, understood the capabilities that they had in their respective organisations. In many ways, to be fair to COSS, it's done some really good things, particularly in the, um, the the normal main, as you call the mainstream meetings. But you know, and I talk about the fire danger ratings, the, the emergency warnings, but. Even in them, there's even in the couple of examples I've provided, fire danger ratings, it's not full consensus. Emergency warnings, there's not full consensus across the country. But nonetheless, um, it's, it's been an excellent step forward. Where I think there's room for improvement with cost is in the emergency um, uh, meetings that we had, and I think um, a room for improvement. It, it seems bizarre to me that the people that are, are accountable for fire 
So it, I, I think there's a need for the, the broad um, interagency, interdisciplined approach to sit down and have, have the uh, particular meetings. But when you get into a specific um, uh, event, such as a, a, a flood, or in this case, a bushfire, I would think that the people who are accountable for bushfire should be sitting at the table. And I say that because um, it is those people that understand fire. It's those people that understand their capability. It's those people that understand aims and the management uh, structure that we use, and therefore able to, I think, contribute strategically. So I think a room for improvement um, for COSC is by actually having the people accountable for fire at a particular time sitting at the table. If I can, um, council assisting, I'd also like to say that in my view, the, the, the groups themselves, um, as in COS, is, is very much a situational awareness type environment. So it gives us a good understanding, if you like, of what's happening across the country. Um, but it is very, very big. Um, there's no clear governance and there's no clear um, decision or prior, prioritising or decision making process within that group, in my view. So um, it's doing some good things, but I think there's significant room for improvement. Uh, thank you. Just in relation to those areas for improvement, you've mentioned some already, like having the right people, I assume, at the table. Um, but um, are there other uh, aspects or improvements you consider could be made to, to the COSC process? Um, certainly, if you go back to um, 2000, and look, some examples, perhaps I, I draw some examples that occurred uh, this summer, whereby um, we were dealing, I was getting direct phone contacts from Queensland asking for resources. It, 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 it suggested to me, if I step back a bit, because uh, I was an observer, it became very evident that the demand for resources were far outstripping our ability to supply nationally. We had fire just about in, in every state and territory across the country, um, and that's just bushfire without any other emergency event. And so our ability to provide those resources um, were quite limiting. And, and indeed, I was uh, fielding calls from Queensland desperate to get uh, resources, trucks specific out of CFA, um, that we weren't able to uh, to deploy. So I think there is an opportunity for us to then have a, a more stringent or robust ability to um, share uh, res or make sure the resources are being allocated according to the absolute risk that is required. Um, but I also think there's an opportunity for, you know, at the moment in this country, um, we, we don't have consistency in our warnings. We don't have consistency in, on our, our danger rating system. Um, we, we don't have a standard emergency management system. I've used the example numerous times before after September 11 and Hurricane Katrina, the US mandated the NIMS system right across their, their country for all municipalities, government departments, etc. We still, um, fire and emergency services have aims. I think the, the police commissioners across the country have a different model, etc. Um, and then you throw, this year we threw the military into that as well. So we don't have even a, a common operating um, emergency management platform from which we, we can operate. So I think um, um, there is an opportunity within cost to really tighten some of up our, our areas of decision making um, and uh, not just consensus, but actually getting a, agreement so we can move on. It becomes very parochial. It's very uh, big and unwieldy in, in my view. And when you're, um, just to take you up on that last point, uh, you said it's it's very big and un, un wieldy uh, in your view is that a, that is a reference to COSC and not to the bigger or even bigger AFAC council is that right yeah that's just is COSC I mean I think that um, particularly in the response arrangements um, when we do the emergency meetings that's where there is real room for improvement we, we actually don't I mean fire not all fire sits at the table I mean CFA alone I have the accountability for fire in the country area of Victoria we have 58,000 volunteers, um, you know, thousands of trucks to draw on. Uh, we were able to provide, you know, 2,500 people into Queensland and New South Wales to, to support them. Um, the National Resourcing Centre is a good example. I think I took a phone call, I, I provide the example, I took a phone call from Shane Fitzsimmons on a Sunday morning about 8 o'clock and said, my recollection of the conversation was something like, 
hey, um, you know, the bureaucracy's killing me. Steve, can you just give me some CFA resources? We've got a bad day on Tuesday. Um, you know, to which I've said, look, mate, um, what do you want? And I can give you strike teams. But if we come with strike teams, I want mechanics. I want peer support because we look after psychological welfare. He said, no dramas. Um, by six o'clock that night, we had 11 strike teams sitting on the, the South Australian, uh, sorry, the New South Wales border, um, because I knew Shane. I had his number in my phone, uh, or Rob Rogers. I picked, we could have that conversation. Um, I was able to explain my capability. We, he understood what our needs were, uh, and, and interesting enough, it was some time later before the formal requests came through for those resources. So a really good example. Conversely, if I look across the other border, South Australia had a new chief. Um, I didn't know who he was. I, I didn't have his number in my phone. Um, I was not able to provide him either the personal level support or say to, um, I think it's it's Mel, um, Mel, what, what do you need? What, how can I help you? Because we have a lot of resources sitting on your South Australian border as well. So I think that in that operational side, there's some real room for improvement. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask you about that um uh, part of your answer where you said so you were able to essentially activate or deploy your strike teams to the New South Wales border absent a sort of request from uh, a decision of COSC or uh, uh, any uh, actioning through NRSC and then it was only some time later that that happened why was it necessary to, to after the fact you had essentially committed the resources necessary to go through that formal process through, I assume, COSC and NRSC? Um, it, the, the National Resourcing Sharing Centre was quite cumbersome and uh, it... And when we're deploying literally, you know, initially hundreds and eventually thousands into uh, New South Wales, the system required every individual, I think they're like the photo, their their history, their details, and, and, and it required that to be preloaded. So the actual system itself couldn't accommodate um, the high volume of movement of people across our border. Um, and so the bureaucracy in many ways was killing us. So, uh, and consequently, I think this was very early days. And look, I, I would say we deployed very quickly into New South Wales on an agreement that'd be there for two or three days and then back home again. Um, we were there for two or three months. <laughs> um, and so um, it, it worked well. Um, but this is what you do when you have a personal relationship with your peers across the country. And as I've said, I, I equally spoke to Mark Roach or Mike Wassing, the commission is in Queensland. I would speak to uh, New South Wales, um, all of which were saying, hey, can we get resources out of Victoria? Because um, Queensland's fire started first and New South Wales. And, and by September, October, Victoria still had most of our trucks and our resources in the shed. So we had capability we could draw on and we were more than happy to provide that support. The quickest, way, the quickest and most effective, efficient way to do that was simply for Shane to pick up the phone and say, hey, help. And we did that pretty quickly to the tune of 11 strike teams within literally within hours before the formal request um, could come. And then it took some days before the National Resource Centre was able to um, um, accommodate the, the sheer volume of numbers we had um, um, flying across the border into New South Wales. Uh, thank you for that. Um, comprehensive explanation. Just talking about NRSC for a moment, um, you provided some comments on NRSC's bushfire strategic planning report that was prepared um, sort of in December uh, 2019. Um, so, I, and I just want to bring up your comments so the commissioners can see them. Operator, can you please uh, bring up EMV? dot zero zero one three dot zero 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 one dot zero zero two eight please Uh, so, Mr. Warrington, this is an email from you uh, sent to Mr. Considine of uh, uh, AFAC uh, and the NRSC. Uh, operator, could you just scroll down to the text of the email? and highlight the, f the first paragraph. Uh, thank you. Hopefully you can see that, Mr. Warrington. Are you able to? I can. Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. I just I wanted to ask you about the fourth 
sentence, the one um, at the end of the fourth line commencing, while I accept this is the preferred, tried and trusted approach, I do question how sustainable this is now that we have moved into national campaign mode. Um, an alternative worth some consideration is a dynamic risk-based approach based on forecasted national need. Now, can I just ask you firstly about what you meant by the uh, expression, um, now that we have moved into national campaign mode? Um, well, it's pretty simple. The reality is we had uh, fires right across the country. Um, as I said before, um, the demand uh, that I saw from the outside was exceeding supply across the country. Um, everybody was requesting resources to attend fires. I thought um, uh, it wasn't sustainable at a national level and we needed to, cons and moving, need to consider an alternative way of allocating resources, which was beyond, the, as I've said here, the preferred, tried and trusted approach, which... I felt, um, given where we'd been after the last 100 years, has probably held us in good stead. Um, but this year, um, I, I felt it was uh, it, it really tested us, and I, I don't believe it is sustainable. Uh, thank you. So you propose an alternative, which is a dynamic risk-based approach based on forecasted national need. Could you just explain for the assistance of the commissioners what you had in mind by that alternative? Yeah. Yes, um, thank you. So uh, what, what we did here in Victoria was took quite a different approach than we'd have done in previous the previous years. And uh, what we did was we identified where the fire was about to um, hit from a, a, a public safety, public life point of view. And these are called, we built township protection plans, admittedly a little bit on the run. But essentially, once you accept the fact that you can't fight or control these fires, um, it, it changes your whole operating model. And so instead of putting your fire trucks in to fight a fire or to complete a back burn to control the fire, and look, we didn't do this, but for the sake of um, really amplifying my example, you turn your back on the fire and you walk into your community. So if I took you to Buchan, if I took you to um, uh, Malakuta, um, into Koryong, um, the reality is we went in there early and we said to the communities, hey, um, come with us. And everybody that followed those instructions survived. Um, and we were in there before the fires arrived, during the fires and after the fires left as well. And examples, and I've used this countless times and times again, that, that in 1983, and I've been around for a while, we, we lost 2,000 homes. We only had 450 trucks and 70 people tragically lost their lives. In 2009, 173 people lost their lives tragically on the day and probably a lot more since. Um, 2,000 homes, 650 trucks. If I take you to a small example, Malakuta, where we had three strike teams or 15 trucks into Malakuta with literally hundreds of homes. So the, the response, um, we could not do it, um, but we actually engaged with our communities, not to protect your homes, but to gather with us as a group, embedded in the community. We are community, we work with community, we embedded in community. We didn't lose a, a great deal of life or towns or we, we're actually using that approach. It was a, a very different approach. And as a firefighter, it's quite a challenging one because many of us, you know, I've been around for a, a long, long time and our job is to fight fires. It's implicit in our names. We are firefighters. To not do that and to turn your back on it is a whole different approach. I didn't think uh, during the summer we were able, the system allowed us to stop take stock of what, what the circumstances were quite different and quite demanding and perhaps take a whole different strategic approach. I raised this with Commissioner Crisp. I raised this with the CEO of AFAC who requested I write to Mr Considine, which I, I've done and that's what you're seeing here, to say, hey, there's a, th that the current model is not sustainable moving forward. Um, working uh, more collaboratively with communities is probably going to give you more, if I can be a bit crassy, a bang for your buck, um, as in allocating resources. So, um, yep. Uh, thank you. Is, is that sort of um, uh, answer you just given what you mean by the words alternative response models in the last sentence of that paragraph? Yes, exactly right. So uh, our experience and what, was I, what I was listening to around the country um, was the fact that uh, everybody was deploying in an effort to manage or control the fire. 
um, in in my view, um, that here in Victoria, and I, you know, I won't speak on behalf of the other states, but the fires were at such significance, such ferocity, and were travelling at such speeds they could not be controlled or contained. And so our next approach in a in our operating model and understanding this is a whole new operating model was to then embed ourselves in communities and work with communities to protect them. We, we're protecting everything from. Um, you know, water supplies, power supplies, uh, health facilities, you know, retirement villages. Um, and in some cases, you know, we, we said to the Malakuta community, when you hear the sirens activate people, come out of your homes and come to the hall. When you hear it happen again, there's a second fallback zone. And um, we had to instruct our people not to fight for house, um, houses on the outskirts because we made a deliberate attempt to fight the, the fires within the main parts of the town, etc. Um, so there's quite a, a different operating model that we put in place here. Um, and again, I was just looking for the opportunity to at least have that discussion at a national level um, when you uh, realise that, hey, we were just pouring more and more resources into a country that was on fire, if I can be as bold to say the country was um, on fire here, um, we were pouring more and more resources into um, an area that I'm not sure we were getting as best value as we could. Now, I'm happy to be, ch happy to be challenged on that point, but at least the opportunity to have that discussion, I think, was important. Uh, thank you. And, and was the uh, forum through which to have that discussion COSC? Um, I, I, I felt it, it, it was, um, but... Uh, unfortunately, it, it, it probably wasn't. I think there was some attempts to come up with a model to, um, uh, you know, what, what's the tool we can use, a decision-making tool to prioritise the allocation of resources. I, I'm not sure that was landed. Um, and if it was, it was probably landed on the tried and traditional approach to the way we do business. And, and again, maybe I'm being unfair there. Um, and I say that in the context, understand that I'm not a member of COS, so I wasn't privy to all the discussions, uh, but I could not see any other forum by which this, this discussion would had. In hindsight, it would have been great to just somehow have the fire chiefs come together in a bit of a think tank to say, let's take a bit of time out here and rethink our approach and how best we can support each other. Um, unfortunately, um, we didn't do that. Does that reflect a a need for the fire chiefs to have a national situational awareness perspective? Well, I, I think we need to be careful because, you know, these emergency events aren't just fire. They have impact on all the other emergency service, government departments, municipalities, even private sector, et cetera, et cetera. But there are times when if it's a flood event, I would expect that the specialist in flood or a tsunami, the specialist in tsunami, and in this case, bushfire, the specialists in bushfire would come together and say, hey, here's an opportunity on the run to rethink this because the, 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 the situation is so dy dynamic and explosive and maybe the current practices um, could be done a little better. So, yeah, I do think there was an opportunity to do that, but not at the expense of the... Because I do recognise, you know, one of the strengths are this interoperability, this real collegiate approach. You know, one of the learnings for us out of Black Saturday is we cannot do it on our own. We need the other emergency services. We need the other government departments. We need... Um, strong support and we need to pull together as one. Uh, that was a big learning and we don't want to get away from that. But a learning for this year was there are times when we've actually gone too far. There's opportunities for us as fire just to come together as fire. And, and the cost means that essentially I don't sit at the table and I certainly do not feel comfortable in that forum um, speaking as candidly as if I was a, um, a fully fledged member. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to just ask you one final uh, uh, topic about one final topic um, and um, it arises from your attendance at the COSC meetings on the uh, 31st of October last year and again on the 20th of, uh, 30th of April, apologies, this year, obviously as a guest, but these were COSC meetings at which the Australian warning system uh, were discussed and earlier in your evidence you mentioned a lack of consistency and a lack of a, a clear way forward on the warning system. Um, can I just get from you your 
sort of view based on your experience of the Australian warning system and what the difficulties and challenges have been in getting it implemented? Yeah, that's pretty... um, In many ways, um, the fire danger rating system is probably a better example, and it comes down to... Um, again, um, the, the authorising environment, seeing in cost, it, it, it's 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 what would you call it? Collaboratively, if you collaborative, if you like, and uh, a degree of consensus decision making. I think in that, um, and so at the end of the day, if as Victorians we chose not to adopt it, um, that we have the and a good example with that is in the fire danger rating system. Um, I think at this to this day that we in Victoria use code red, and in New South Wales, they still use catastrophic. And one of the reasons we didn't move, uh, or our decision was based on the outcomes of the Royal Commission. So, you know, it's a very brave politician or, or you know, chief officer or commissioner that goes against a recommendation uh, of, of a Royal Commission, but the other states and territories weren't necessarily bound by that particular recommendation. And so, as a consequence, we've said, well, we're going to stick with Code Red, where others in the country went to catastrophic. The unfortunate reality of that sort of example is that there is not one national consistency and approach. But I've said before, you know, the warning systems, there's not... You know, it, it's very easy to look at these through, through real negative glasses. The reality is before Black Saturday, there, was, there wasn't any consistency on warnings. There wasn't any consistency on fire danger ratings. I mean, we still don't have a common... Um, you know, the, the police operate a different emergency management model to fire and the other emergency services. And as I've said, it was even more confusing this year when we had the ADF put in. So there's no mandated emergency management system. Um, so there are areas by which there's opportunities for us to really come together to have some consistency at, at, at a national level. But the reality is it stands at the moment. It's still, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, as an agency chief, when my crews go to another state, there's still my accountability. I have to say whether they go or they don't. Um, whether it's a warning system in Victoria, if we don't want to adopt it or Queensland don't want it, that's still their statutory responsibility because we are state statutory agencies. And can I just say, while I've got the flaws, so to speak, I just make this observation that I'm saying this whether I, if I was still employed by CFA, I would be still making these observations. I'm not making them because I'm now no longer employed. I just thought I'd make that point. Hopefully it doesn't need to be saying. These are just from the heart uh, because I think there's some real opportunities to be um, learnt um, so we can make sure that our communities are better prepared um, moving forward in, in, and there will be future disasters. Mm. Thank you very much, Mr Warrington, for your answer. It seems to me from the evidence we've heard today, it's very much uh, COSC and the arrangements that have been set up and operate are very much uh, national uh, unless you disagree with them, in which case you go your own way um, and do it having regard to the best interests of the state rather than perhaps the national interest. Is that a comment you'd agree with? I would temper that in my agreement by saying it is always our view. We don't come to the table, uh, you know, well, obviously Commissioner Crisp is probably a better place to answer that, but I would suggest to you that we would not come to the table with a completely parochial view. We would come to the table with a view to try and to reach a national uh, framework, a national, national agreement. Um, it, you know, we don't try and bring a parochial view to the table. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, having had the debate and the discussion, and I think the good example is recommendations out of the 2009 Royal Commission, um, we, we, we've got fairly close, but we just couldn't get that extra bit around Code Red and Catastrophic. Or I think the current debate about uh, Watch and Act, and uh, there's, there's another terminology there, um, we're just not quite there. What is important, and I think we should not lose sight of the fact is, um, and I think it is exciting, is that forum has facilitated an outcome where, you know, it, if it wasn't there, we wouldn't have even had 80% agreement. Um, we'd be having no agreement, which is where we were before 2009. So I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that, you know, there has been substantial gains through cost. Um, and but, but I think with the gains, people's expectations have also uh, risen. And now people are saying, well, why haven't you got a total agreement on fire danger ratings, warnings, aviation, w- w- whatever? So, um, but, but it, you know, I think all states would come together in good spirits. They're all good people and they're all looking for the good outcome um, and different backgrounds. And I think that's another contributing factor. 
Uh, thank you very much. A commissioner's noting the time. Uh, those are the questions I had for Mr. Warrington. No, actually, we've uh, we benefited from Mr. Warrington's uh, insight and uh, and candid approach. And I appreciate what you said. Whether you're in uniform or out of uniform, you would have uh, had the same approach to it. But I don't have any questions out of it. You've actually answered the ones I had as we went went through it, Commissioner Bennett. I just had a very small question, if I may. Um, you gave examples. I mean, we've heard a lot of evidence about the collaborative, you know, collaboration within the members of COSC and the ability to deal with. Um, cross-jurisdictional provision of, of resources and assistance. But it seems to me you gave um, you gave two examples. I mean, it, my, my question is about the extent to which that relies upon the development of a personal relationship between, between the members of COSC or the heads of the different agencies that meet through COSC. And you've highlighted how well it can work, and it can work once you develop the relationship, but you also, it seems to me, highlighted um, the difficulties, for example, where somebody who comes on to the organisation is new, or maybe there might be someone who that you don't like. I'm not saying you didn't use that example, but rather someone that was. New. In your observation of your times at COSC, um, does the way does the uh, is the success of it dependent in part upon the development of those personal relationships? And it can, and it, in your view, can it be can it work not as well? where those personal relationships don't or have not yet developed? Yeah, can I, can I give you another example? So late in the season, there was fires in the ACT. Um, we heard through the, the I'll, I'll be derogatory in saying the bureaucratic chain, but perhaps I don't say that, just the chain of command that the ACT uh, were looking for um, specific resources out of CFA, and we started to mobilise. Um, unfortunately, I didn't know um, or have the phone number of my peer in um, the ACT, so I had to go through the land management fellow up there, um, uh, Neil Cooper, who I was able to pick up the phone and say, who, who's the chief, who do I speak to, what do you want? Um, and so we, we were able to get it around that way. Um, but look, at a really personal level, um, it's good to know that because it's not just, you know, we're, we're looking at everything through the lens of this um, um, operational lens. You know, I, you know, Shane was the first to pick up the phone um, after the Black Saturday fires and offer quite personal support and offer people. And, you know, some of his people came down to um, CFA to, to help out as, as senior officers. Or, or you know, um, Greg Nettleton in South Australia would ring up or I'd ring up um, Rob Rogers and say, "How you going, mate? Can I give you a hand at a, you know, at a personal, you know, I don't say personal, obviously not mowing the lawns at home, but certainly um, how we how we are able to help and support each other." And I think it was just we, we get it. I mean, you you you've got an accountability for thousands and thousands of on, uh, people, um, and it's important that you have that personal light. Unless you have an accountability, um, you know, Oc Health and Safety. You know, I, I've often used the example. Every time my people went away, I felt like I was a dad giving up my kids to go to Queensland or go to New South Wales. Everybody came home mentally and physically as well as they were before they left. And there's a real degree of anxiety when you, when you do that. And so having the confidence in your peer over the border, I think is really, really important. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, the personal relationships that we had, and I think AFAC, uh, the cost got away from that. Um, and we had that in 2009. And I was, uh, you know, I did a stint as chief after Black Saturday for about 12 months. Went back uh, in 2016 as, as a guest, and I found it, it had got so big. The, 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 the group um, dynamic was quite different. Uh, even as a guest, I didn't know half the people. I didn't know their personality, their strength. You don't want to upset people. You didn't. Um, you couldn't have that strong, robust debate. So I think, um, yeah, it, it had changed markedly from where the intent of it was when it was first set up, if I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Thank you. Commissioner McIntosh. Nothing from me. Thanks for your evidence. Mr. Warrington, we appreciate it, and and uh, I do also appreciate the comment right at the end there. You, you need good structures and good decision making processes, but you can't beat good relationships uh, either. So, thank you for for that insight to, to that, Mr. Glover. Uh, thank you, Chair. May Mr. Warrington be uh, released from his summons. Mr. Warrington, you may be released from your summons. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate it.
Uh, Thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity to have this vote. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, that completes what has been the longest hearing day so far in the Commission's public hearings. Ah, but there's more days to come. Uh, tomorrow we will commence at the uh, more courtly time of 10am. Okay, 10am tomorrow. So we'll adjourn now until 10am tomorrow at Canberra time. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission has adjourned until 10am tomorrow.